Chapter 1, Part 1 of Zone Policeman 88 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Zone Policeman 88 A Close-Range Study of the Panama Canal and Its Workers By Harry F. Frank Chapter 1, Part 1 Strip by strip there opened out before me, as I climbed the thousand stairs to the red-roofed administration building, the broad panorama of Panama and her bay. Below, the city of closely packed roofs and three-topped plazas compressed in a scallop of the sun-gleaming Pacific, with its peaked and wooded islands to far Taboga tilting motionless away to the curve of the earth. Behind, the low, irregular jungled hills stretching hazily off into South America. On the third-story landing I paused to wipe the light sweat from forehead and hatband, then pushed open the screen door of the passageway that leads to police headquarters. Hmm, what military service have you had? asked the captain, looking up from the letter I had presented, and swinging half round in his swivel chair to fix his clear eyes upon me. None. No, he said slowly in a wondering voice, and so long grew the silence and so plainly did there spread across the captain's face the unspoken question, well, then what the devil are you applying here for, that I felt all at once the stern necessity of putting in a word for myself, or lose the day entirely. But I speak Spanish, and... Ah! cried the captain, with a rising inflection of awakened interest. That puts another face on the matter. Slowly his eyes wandered, with the faraway look of inner reflection, to the vacant chair of the chief on the opposite side of the broad flat desk, then out the wide open window, and across the shimmering roofs of Alcon to the far green ridges of the youthful republic, ablaze with the unbroken tropical sunshine. The whir of a telephone bell broke in upon his meditation. In sharp, clear-cut phrases he answered the questions that came to him over the wire, hung up the receiver, and pushed the apparatus away from him with a forceful gesture. Inspector, he called suddenly, but a moment having passed without response, he went on in his sharp-cut tones. How do you think you will like police work? I believe I should. The captain shuffled for a moment one of his several stacks of unfolded letters on his desk. Well, it's the most thankless damned job in creation, he went on, almost dreamily, but it certainly gives a man much touch with human nature from all angles, and, well, I suppose we do some good. Somebody's got to do it, anyway. Of course, I suppose it would depend on what class of police work I got, I put in, recalling the warning of the writer of my letter of introduction that you may get assigned to some dinky little station and never see anything of the zone. I'm better at moving around than sitting still. I notice you have policemen on your trains, or perhaps in special duty languages would be... Yes, I was thinking along that line, too, said the captain. He rose suddenly from his chair, and led the way into an adjoining room, busy with several young Americans over desks and typewriters. Inspector, he said, as a tall and slender yet muscular man of Indian erectness and noticeably careful grooming rose to his feet. Here's one of those rare people, an American who speaks some foreign languages. Have a talk with him. Perhaps we can arrange to fix him up both for his good and our own. Ever done police duty? began the inspector when the captain had returned to the corner office. No. Military, sir? Not that either. Well, we usually require it, mused the inspector slowly, flashing his diamond ring. But with your special qualifications, perhaps, you'd probably be of most use to us in plain clothes, he continued after a dozen questions as to my former activities. We could put you in uniform for the first month or six weeks until you know the isthmus, and then... Our greatest trouble is burglary, he broke off abruptly, rising to reach a copy of the Canal Zone Laws. If you have nothing else on hand, you might run these over, and the police rules and regulations, he added, handing me a small flat volume bound in light brown imitation leather. I sat down in an armchair against the wall and fell to reading amid the clickety-click of typewriters telephone calls even from far-off Cologne on the Atlantic, and the constant going and coming of a Negro orderly in shining iron khaki uniform. By and by, the inspector drifted into the main office, 
where his voice blended for some time with that of the captain. At length he came back bearing a copy of the Day Star and Herald, turned back to the Australia la Panama pages, so rarely opened in the zone. "'Just run us off a translation of that, if you don't mind,' he said, pointing to a short paragraph in Spanish. Some two minutes later, I handed him the English version of the account of a near duel between two Panamanians, and took once more to reading. It was more than an hour later that I was again interrupted. "'You'll want to catch the 525 back to Corazel?' inquired the inspector. "'Mr. Blank, give him transportation to Culebra and back, and an order for physical examination.' You might fill out this application blank, he added, handing me a long legal sheet. Then, in case you are appointed, that much will be done. The document began with the usual name, birthplace, and so on. There followed the information that the appointee must be at least five foot eight, weigh one hundred and forty, chest at least thirty-four inches. Then suddenly near the bottom of the back of the sheet my eyes caught the startling words. Unless you are sure you are a man of physical appearance far above the average, do not fill out this application. I was suddenly aware of a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach. The blank all but slipped from my nerveless fingers. Then all at once there came back to me the words of some chance acquaintance of some far-off time and place, words which were the only memory that remained to me of the speaker, except that he had lived long and gathered much experience. Bluff, my boy, is what carries a man through the world. Act as if you're sure you are and can, and you'll generally make the other fellow think so. I sat down at a desk and filled out the application in my most self-confident flourish. Go to Calabria tomorrow, said the inspector, as I bade the room good day and stepped forth with my most military stride and bearing, and report back here Friday morning. I ascended to the world below, not by the long perspective of stairs that leads down and across the gully to the heart of Akon, but by a shortcut that took me quickly into a foreign land. The graveled highway at the foot of the hill I might not have guessed was an international boundary had I not chanced to notice the instant change from the trim, screened zone buildings, each in its green lawn, to the featureless architecture of a city where grass is all but unknown. For the formalities of crossing this border are the same as those of crossing any village street. It was my first entrance into the land of the Panamanos, technically known on the zone as Spigotis and familiarly, with a tinge of despite, as Spix, because the first Americans to arrive in the land found a few natives and cabmen who claimed to speak it to English. To Americans direct from the States, Panama City ranks still as rather a miserable, dawdling village, but that is due chiefly to lack of perspective. Against the background of Central America, it seemed almost a great, certainly a flourishing, city. Even today there are many who complain of its unpleasant odors, to those who have lived in other tropical cities, its scent is like the perfumes of Araby, and none but those can in any degree realize what Tio Sam has done for the place. Towards sunset I passed through a gateway with scores of fellow countrymen, all as composedly at home as in the heart of their native land. Across the platform stood a train distinctively American in every feature, a bilious yellow train divided by the baggage car into two sections, of which the five second-class coaches behind the engine, with their wooden benches, were densely packed in every available space with workmen and laborers' wives, from Spaniards to ebony negroes, with the average color decidedly dark. In the first-class cars, at the Panama end, were Americans, all but exclusively white Americans, with only here and there a spaghetti, with his long greased hair, his finger rings, and his effeminate gestures, and even a negro or two. For though Uncle Sam may permit individual states to do so, he may not himself openly abjure before the world, his assertion as to the equality of all men by enacting Jim Crow laws. We were soon off, settled back in the ample seat of the first real train I had boarded in months, with the roar of its length over the smooth and solid roadbed, the deep-voiced masculine whistle, instead of the painful, puerile screech that had recently assailed my ear. I all but forgot I was in a foreign land. The fact was recalled by the passing of the train guard, an erect and self-possessed young American in Texas hat, khaki uniform, and leather leggings, striding along the aisle with a jerking, half-arrogant swing of the shoulders. So, perhaps, might I, too, soon be parading across the isthmus. It was not, to be sure, exactly the role I had planned to play on the zone. I had come, rather with the hope of shouldering a shovel, and descending into the canal with other workmen, that I might, some day, solemnly raise my right hand and boast, I helped dig it. 
but that was in the callow days before I had arrived and learned the awful gulf that separates the sacred white American from the rest of the canal zone world. Besides, had I not always wanted to be a policeman and twirl a club and stalk with heavy, law-compelling tread ever since I had first stared speechless upon one of those noble beings on my first trip out into the world twenty-one years before? It was not without effort that I rose in time next morning to continue on the 737 from Corozal across another bit of the zone. Exactly thus should one first see the great work, piecemeal, slowly, unless he will go home with it all in an undigested lump. The train rolled across a stretch of almost uninhabited country, with a vast plain of broken rock on the right, plunged unexpectedly through a short tunnel, and stopped at a station perched on the edge of a ridge above a small zone town backed by some vast structure, above which here and there a huge crane loomed against the sky of dawn. Another mile, and the collectors were announcing, as brazenly as if they challenged a few spicks on board to correct them, Peter McGill! Peter McGill! We were already moving on again, before I guessed that by this noise they designated none other than the famous Pedro Miguel. The sun rose suddenly as we swung sharply to the left and rumbled across a girderless bridge. Barely had I time to discover that we were crossing the Great Canal itself, and to catch a brief glimpse of the jagged gulf in either direction, before the train had left it behind, as if the sight of the world-famous channel were not worth a pause, and was roaring on through a hilly country of perpetual summer. A peculiarly shaped reservoir sped past on the left. Twice or thrice more the green horizon rose and fell, and at 7.30 we drew up at the base of Culebra, the zone capital. On the screen veranda of a somewhat sooty and dismal building high up near the summit of the town, another and I were pacing anxiously back and forth when, well on in the morning, an abrupt and rather gloomy-faced American dashed into the building in one of the rooms thereof. Snapping over his shoulder as he disappeared, one of you! The other had precedence. Then soon, from behind the wooden shutters, came a growl of, Next! And two moments later I was standing in the reputed costume of Adam upon the scales within. At about ten-second intervals, a monosyllable fell from the lips of the morose American as he delved into my personal makeup from crown to toe, with all the instrumental circumspection known to his secret-discovering profession. Then, with a gruff, Dress! He sat down at a table to scratch a few fantastic marks on the blank I had brought, and hand it to me as I caught up my last garment and turned to the door. But, alas, tight sealed. And all the day, though carrying the information in my pocket, I must live in complete ignorance of whether I had been found lacking an eye or a lung. For sooner would one have asked his future of the scowling parquets than venture to invoke a hint thereof from that furrow-browed being from the land of brusqueness. Meanwhile, as if it had been thus planned to give me such opportunity, I stood at the very vortex of canal interest and fame, with nearly an entire day before the evening train should carry me back to Corzal. I descended to the observation platform. Here, at last, at my very feet, was the famous cut known to the world by the name of Calabra, a mighty channel a furlong wide, plunging sheer through Snake Mountain, that rocky range of scrub-wooded hills severing the continental divide. At first view, the scene was bewildering. Only gradually did the eye gather details out of the mass. Before and beyond were pounding rock drills, belching locomotives. There arose the rattle and bump of long trains of flat cars on many tracks, the crash of falling boulders, the snort of the straining steam shovels heaping the cars high with earth and rock. Everywhere were groups of little men, some working leisurely, some scrambling down into a rocky bed of the canal or dodging the clanging trains all far below and stretching endless in either direction, while over all the scene hovered a veritable Pittsburgh of smoke. All long-heralded sights, such as the nature of the world and man, are at first glimpse disappointing. To this rule, the great Calabra Cut was no exception. After all, this was merely a hill, a moderate ridge, this backbone of the isthmus, the sundering of which had sent its echoes to all corners of the earth. The long-fed imagination had led one to picture a towering mountain, a very Andes. But as I looked longer, noting how little by comparison were the trains I knew to be of regulation U.S. size, how literally tiny were the scores upon scores of men far down below who were doing this thing, its significance regained bit by bit its proper proportions. Train after train load of the spoil of the cut ground away towards the Pacific, and here men had been digging steadily, if not always earnestly, since a year before I was born. The gigantic scene recalled to the mind 
the industrial army of which Carlyle was prone to preach, with the same discipline and organization as an army in the field. And every now and then, to bear out the figure, there burst forth the mighty cannonade, not of war, but of peace and progress, in the form of earth-upheaving and house-rocking blasts of dynamite, tearing away the solid rock below at the very feet of the town. I took to the railroad and struck on further into the unknown country. Almost before I was well started I found myself in another town, yet larger than Culebra, and with the name Empire in the station building, and nearly every rod of the way between had been lined with villages of negroes and all breeds and colors of canal workers. So on again along a broad macadamized highway that bent and rose through low bushy ridges, past an army encamped in wood and tin barracks on a hillside, with khaki uniformed soldiers a horse and a foot enlivening all the roadway in the neighboring fields. Never a mile without its town. How different will all this be when the canal is finished and all its community has gone to Alaska, or has scattered itself over the face of the earth, and dense tropical solitude has settled down once more over the scene. Panama, they had said, is insupportably hot. Comparing it with other lands, I knew, I could not but smile at the notion. Again, it was the lack of perspective. Sweat ran easily, yet so fresh the air and so refreshing the breeze sweeping incessantly across from the Atlantic that even the sweating was almost enjoyable. Hot? Yes, like June on the Canadian border, though not like July. It is hot in St. Louis on an August Sunday, with all the refreshment doors tight closed, to strangers. Hot in the cotton fields of Texas. But with these plutonic corners, the heat of the zone shows little rivalry. The way led round a cone-shaped hill crowned by another military camp with the stars and stripes flapping far above, until I came at last in sight of the renowned Chagres, seven miles above Culebra, to all appearances a meek and harmless little stream, spanned by a huge new iron bridge, and forbidden to come and play in the unfinished canal by a little dam of earth that a steam shovel will some day eat up in a few hours. Here, where it ends and the flat country begins, I descended into the cut, dry and waterless, with a stone quarry bottom. A sharp climb out on the opposite side, and I plunged into rampant jungle, half expecting snake bites on my exposed ankles, another preconceived notion, and at length falling into a narrow jungle trail that pitched down through a dense grown gully, came upon a fenced compound with several zoned buildings on the banks of the Chagres, down to which sloped a broad green lawn. Here dwells hale and ruddy old Fritz, for long years keeper of the philovograph, that measures and gives warning of the rampages of the Chagres. Fritz will talk to you in almost any tongue you may choose, as he can tell you an adventure in almost any land, all with a captivating accent, and in the vocabulary of a man who has lived long among men and nature. Nor are Fritz's opinions those gleaned from other men or the printed page. So we fell to fanning ourselves this January afternoon on the screened and shaded veranda above the Chagres, and old Fritz, lighting his pipe, raised his slippered feet to the screen railing, and tossing away the charred remnant of a match, began, Without war, there is no progress. When all the world is at peace, all the world goes to sleep. End of Chapter 1, Part 1 Recording by Todd Chapter 1, Part 2 of Zone Policeman 88. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Zone Policeman 88. A Close-Range Study of the Panama Canal and Its Workers. By Harry A. Frank. Chapter 1, Part 2. Police headquarters looked all but deserted on Friday morning. There had been something doing in zone criminal annals the night before, and not only the captain, but both the chief and the inspector, were somewhere out along the line. I sat down in the armchair against the wall. A half hour, perhaps, had I read, when Eddie, I am not entitled, perhaps, to such familiarity, but the solemn title of Chief Clark is far too stiff and formal for that soul of good-heartedness striving in vain to hide behind a bluff exterior, Eddie, I say, blew a last cloud of smoke from his lungs to the ceiling, tossed aside the butt of his cigarette, and motioned to me to take the chair beside his desk. It's all off, said a voice within me, for the expression on Eddie's face was that of a man with an unpleasant duty to perform, 
and his opening words were in exactly that tone of voice in which a man begins, I am sorry, but... Had I not often used it myself? The captain, is how he really did begin, called me up from Cologne last night, and... Here's where I get my case no procede, I found myself whispering. In all probability that sealed document I had sent in the day before announced me as a physical wreck. And told me continued Eddy in his sad, regretful tone, to tell you we will take you on the force as a first-class policeman. It happens, however, that the Department of Civil Administration is about to begin a census of the zone, and they are looking for any men that can speak Spanish. If we take you on, therefore, the captain would assign you to the Census Department until that work is done. It will probably take something over a month and then you would be returned to regular police duty. The chief says he'd rather have you learn the isthmus on census than on police pay. Or, went on Eddie, just as I was about to break in with, all right, that suits me, or, if you prefer, the census department will enroll you as a regular enumerator, and will take you on the force as soon as that job is over. The, uh, pay, added Eddie, reaching for a cigarette, but changing his mind, uh, the numerators will be five dollars a day, and uh, five a day beats eighty a month by more than a nose. We descended a story, and I was soon in conference with a slender, sharp-faced young man of mobile features and penetrating eyes, behind which a smile seemed always to be lurking. On the canal zone, as in British colonies, one is frequently struck by the usefulness of men in positions of importance. I'll probably assign you to Empire District, the slender young man was saying. There's everything up there, and almost any language will sure be some help to us. This time we are taking a thorough, complete census of all the zone clear back to the zone line. Here's a sample card and a list of instructions. In other words, kind Uncle Sam was about to give me authority to enter every dwelling in the most cosmopolitan and thickly populated district of his canal zone, and to put questions to every dweller therein, notebook and pencil in hand, authority to ramble around a month or more in sunshine and jungle, and paying me for the privilege. There are really two methods of seeing the canal zone, as an employee or as a guest of the Travoli, both of them at about five dollars a day, but at opposite ends of the thermometer. There remained a weekend between that Friday morning and the last day of January, set for the beginning of the census. Certainly I should not regret the arrival of the day when I should become an employee, with all the privileges and coupon books thereunto appertained. For the zone is no easy dwelling place for the non-employee. Our worthy uncle of the chin whiskers makes it quite plain that, while he may tolerate the mere visitor, he does not care to have him hanging around. Makes it so plain, in fact, that a few weeks purely of sightseeing on the zone implies an adamantine financial backing. In his screened and full-provided towns, where the employee lives in such well-furnished comfort, the tourist might beat his knuckles bare and shake yellow gold in the other hand, and be coldly refused even a lodging for the night. And while he may eat a meal in the employee's hotels, at nearly twice the employee's price, the very attitude in which he is received says openly that he is admitted only on sufferance, permitted to eat only because if he starved to death our uncle would have the bother of burying him, and his own police the arduous toil of making out an accident report. Meanwhile, I must change my dwelling place, for the quartermaster of Corozal had need of all the rooms within his domain, need so imperative that seventeen bona fide and wrathy employees were even then bunking in the pool room of Corozal Hotel. Work on the zone was moving steadily Pacificward, and the accommodations refused to come with it, at least at the same degree of speed. Nor was I especially adverse to the transfer. The roommate with whom fate had cast me in House 81 was a pleasant enough fellow, a youth of unobjectionable personal manners, even though his eight-hour graft was in the sooty seat of a steam crane high above Miraflores' locks. But he had one slight idiosyncrasy that might, in time, have grown annoying. On the night of our first acquaintance, after we had lain exchanging random experiences till the evening heat had begun a retreat before the gentle night breeze, I was awakened from the first doze by my companion sitting suddenly up in his cot across the room. "'Say, I hope you're not nervous,' he remarked. "'Not immoderately.' 
One of my stunts is nightmare, he went on, rising to switch on the electric light. And when I get him, I generally imagine my roommate is a burglar trying to go through my junk, and... He reached under his pillow and brought to light a Colt of forty-five caliber. Then, crossing the room, he pointed to three large, irregularly splintered holes on the wall, some three or four inches above me, and which I had not seen simply because I had not chanced to look that way. There's the last three. But I'm trying to break myself of them, he concluded, slipping the revolver back under his pillow and turning off the light again. Which is among the various reasons why it was without protest that, with the captain's telephone consent, on the ground that I was now virtually on the force, I took up my residence in Corozal Police Station. Tis a peaceful little building of the usual zone type on a breezy knoll across the railroad, with a spreading tree and a little well-tended flower plot before it, and the broad world stretching away in all directions behind. Here lived Policeman T. and B., first-class policeman, perhaps I should take care to specify, for in zone parlance the unqualified noun implies African ancestry. But it seems easier to use an adjective of color when necessary. Among their regular duties was that of weighing down the rocking chairs on the airy front veranda, whence each nook and cranny of Corazel was in sight, and of strolling across to greet the train guard of the seven daily passengers, though the irregular ones that might burst upon them at any moment were not likely to resemble a moral expedition in the Philippines. B and I shared the big main room, for T, being the haughty station commander, occupied the parlor suite beside the office. That was all, except the black Trinidadian boy who sat on the wooden shelf that was his bed behind a huge padlock door and gazed dreamily out through the bars, when he was not carrying a bundle to the train for his wardens, or engaged in the janitor duties that kept the Corozal station so spick and span. Oh, to be sure, there are also a couple of Negro policemen in the smaller room behind the thin wooden partition of our own, but Negro policemen scarcely count in zone police reckonings. By heck, they must use a lot of mules to haul about all that dirt, observed an Arkansas farmer to his nephew, home from the zone on vacation. He would have thought so indeed could he have spent a day at Corozal and watch the unbroken, deafening procession of dirt trains scream by on their way to the Pacific. Straining moguls dragging a furlong of liquorwood flats, swaying Oliver dumps with their side chains clanking, a succession as incessant of empties grinding back again into the midst of the fray. On the tail of every train lounged an American conductor, dressed more like a miner, though his front and hind negro brakemen were as apt to be in silk ties and patent leathers. To say nothing of the train loads that go Atlantic word, and to jungle dumps, and to many an unnoticed fill. Then, when he had thus watched the day through, it would have been of interest to go and chat with some of the old-timers who live here beside the track, and who have seen, or at least heard, this same endless stream of rock and earth race by six days a week, fifty-two weeks a year for six years, as constant and heavily laden today as in the beginning. He might discover, as not all his fellow countrymen have as yet, that the little surgical operation on Mother Earth we are engaged in is no mule job. The weekend gave me time to get back in touch with affairs in the States among the newspaper files at the YMCA building. Uncle Sam surely makes life comfortable for his children wherever he takes hold. It is not enough that he shall clean up and set in order these tropical pest holes. He will have the employee fancy himself completely at home. Here I sat in one of the dozen big airy recreation halls, well stocked with men's playthings, which the government has erected on the zone. I, who two weeks before, had been thankful for lodging on the earth floor of a Honduran hut. The YMCA is the chief social center on the isthmus. The rendezvous and leisure hour headquarters of the thousands that inhabit bachelor quarters, except a few of the purely barroom type. Everybody's association, it might perhaps more properly be called, for ladies find welcome and the laughter of children over the parlor games is rarely lacking. It is not the circumspect place that are many of its type in the States, but a real man's place where he can buy his cigarettes and smoke his pipe in peace. A place for men as men are, not as the fashion plates that Mama's fond imagination pictures them. With all its excellences, it would be unjust to complain that the Zone Y.M. is a trifle lowbrow in its tastes, that the books on its shelves are apt to be popular novels rather than a reading matter, that its phonographs are most frequently screeching vaudeville noises while the Slezak and Homer discs lie tucked away far down near the bottom of the stack. With a new week, I moved to Empire, the rules and regulations in a pocket, 
and the most indispensable of my possessions under an arm. Once more we rumbled through the Millaflory's tunnel through a molehill, past her concrete lighthouse among the astonished palms, and her giant hose of water wiping away the rock hills, across the trestleless bridge with its photographic glimpses of the canal before and behind for the limbernecked, and again I found myself in the metropolis of the canal zone. At the quartermaster's office, my application for quarters was duly filed without a word, and a slip assigning me to room three, house 47, as silently returned. I climbed, by a stone-faced U.S. road, to my new home on the slope of a ridge overlooking the railway and its buildings below. It was the noon hour. My two roommates, therefore, were on hand for inspection, sprawlingly engrossed in a, quite innocent and legal, card game, on a table littered with tobacco, pipes, matches, dog-eared wads of every species of literature from real estate pamphlets to locomotive journals, and a further mass of indiscriminate matter that none but a professional inventory man would attempt to classify. About the room was the usual clutter of all manner of things in the usual unarranged, unwomaned zone way, which the Negro janitor feels it neither his duty nor privilege to bring to order, while on and about my cot and bureau were helter-skeltered the sundry possessions of an absent employee who had left for his six weeks' vacation without hanging up his shirt, after the fashion of zoners. So when I had wiped away the dust that had been gathering thereon since the days of De Lesseps, and chucked my odds and ends into a bureau drawer, I was settled, a full-fledged zone employee in the quarters to which every man on the gold roll is entitled free of charge. Just here it may be well to explain that the ICC has very dexterously dodged the necessity of lining the zone with the offensive signs black and white. It would not be exactly the distinction desired anyway. Hence the line has been drawn between gold and silver employees. The first division, paid in gold coin, is made up, with a few exceptions, of white American citizens. To the second belong any of the darker shade, and all common laborers of whatever color, these receiving their wages in Panamanian silver. "'Tis a deep and sharp-drawn line. "'The story runs that Liza Lawson, "'not long arrived from Jamaica, "'entering the office of his own dentist, "'paused suddenly before the announcement, "'Crown work, gold and silver fillings, "'extractions wholly without pain. "'There was a deep disappointment in face and voice "'as she sat down with a flounce of her starched "'and snow-white skirt, gasping, "'Ah, oh, doctor, does I have to have silver fillings?' "'My roommates,' Mitch and Tom, sat respectively at the throttle of a locomotive that jerked dirt trains out of the cut and straddled a steam shovel that ate its way into Calabra Range. Whence, of course, they were covered with the grease and grime incident to those occupations, which did not make them any the less companionable, though it did promise a distinct increase in my laundry bill. When they had descended again to the labor train and been snatched away to their appointed tasks, I sat a short hour in one of the black mission rocking chairs on the screen veranda, puzzling over a serious problem. The quarters of the gold employee is as completely furnished as any reasonable man could demand, his iron cot with springs and mattress unimpeachable. But just there, the maternal generosity of the government ceases. He must furnish his own sheets and pillow. Must, because placards on the wall sternly warn him not to sleep on the bare mattress and the New York Sunday edition that had served me thus far I had carelessly left behind at Corozal Police Station. To be sure, there were sheets for sale in Empire, at the commissary, where money has the purchasing power of cobblestones, and coupon books come only to those who have worked a day or more on the zone. Then the Jamaican janitor, drifting in to potter about the room, evidently guessed the cause of my perplexity, for he turned to point at the bed of the absent Mitch and gurgled, just you make love to dat man what got dat bed. Him got plenty of sheets. Which proved a wise suggestion. Empire Hotel sat a bit down the hill. There the gold ranks were again subdivided. The coatless ate and sweltered inside the great dining room. The formal sat in haughty state in what was virtually a second-story veranda overlooking the rail yards in a part of the town, where were tables of four, electric fans, and Ben to serve with butler formality. I found it worth while to climb the hill for my coat thrice a day. As yet, I was jangling down a Panamanian dollar at each appearance, but the day was not far distant when I should receive the recruit's hotel book and soon grow as accustomed to the rest as having a coupon snatched from it by the yellow negro at the door. Uncle Sam's boarding scale in the zone is widely varied. 
Three meals cost the non-employee a dollar fifty. The gold employee, ninety cents. The white European laborer, forty cents. And Negroes in general, thirty cents. That afternoon, when the sun had begun to bow its head on the thither side of the canal, I climbed to the newly labeled census office on the knoll behind the police station, from the piazza of which all native empire lies within sweep of the eye. The boss, a smiling youth only well started on his third decade, whose regular duties were in the sanitary department, had already moved bed, bag, and baggage into the room that had been assigned the census, that he might be always on the job. Not until eight that evening, however, did the force gather to look itself over. There was the commander-in-chief of the Census Bureau, sent down from Washington specifically for the task in hand, under whom, as chairman, we settled down into a sort of director's meeting, a wholly informal, coatless, cigarette-smoking meeting in which even the chief himself did not feel it necessary to let his dignity weigh upon him. He had been sent down alone. Hence, there had been great scrambling to gather together on the zone men enough who spoke Spanish, and with no striking success. Most noticeable of my fellow enumerators, being in uniform, were three marines from Bas Obispo, fluent with the working Spanish they had picked up from Mondano to Puerto Rico, and flushed cheeked with the prospect of a full month on pass, to say nothing of the four dollars and forty cents a day which would be added to their daily military income of sixty cents. Then there were four of the darker hue, Panamanians and West Indians, and how rare are Spanish-speaking Americans on the zone was proved by the admittance of such complexions to the gold roll. Of native U.S. citizens there were but two of us, of whom Barter, speaking only his nasal New Jersey, must perforce be assigned to the gold quarters, leaving me the native town of empire, at which we were both satisfied, Barter because he did not like to sully himself by contact with foreigners, I because one need not travel clear to the canal zone to study the way of Americans. As for the other seven, each was assigned his strip of land, something over a mile wide and five long, running back to the western boundary of the zone. That region of wilderness, known as Beyond the Canal, was to be left for special treatment later. The zone had been divided for census purposes into four sections, with headquarters and supervisor in Ancon, Empire, Gorgona, and Cristobal, respectively. Our district, stretching from the Trussellus Bridge over the canal to a great tree near Basso was easily the fat of the land, the most populous, most cosmopolitan, and embracing within its limits the greatest task on the zone. Meanwhile, we had fallen to studying the Instructions to Enumerators, the very first article of which was such as to give pause and reflection. When you have once signed on as enumerator, you cannot cease to exercise your functions as such without justifiable cause under penalty of $500 fine. Which warning was quickly followed by the hair-raising announcement, If you set down the name of a fictitious person, what can have given the good census department the notion of such a possibility, you will be fined $2,000 or sentenced to five years imprisonment or both. From there on, the injunctions grew less nerve-wracking. You must use a medium-soft black pencil, which will be furnished. Law-breaking under such conditions would be absurdity. Use no ditto marks, and... Here I could not but shudder as there passed before my eyes memories of college lecture rooms and all the strange marks that have come to mean something to me alone. Take pains to write legibly. Then we rose and swarmed upstairs to an empty courtroom, where Judge G throwing away his cigarette and removing his Iowa feet from the bar of justice, caused us each to raise a right hand and swear an oath as solemn as ever president on March 4th. An oath, I repeat, not merely to uphold and defend the Constitution against all enemies, armed or armless, but furthermore, not to share with anyone any of the information you gather as an enumerator, or show a census card, or keep a copy of the same. Yet I trust I can spin this simple yarn of my canal zone days without offense to Uncle Sam against the day when, mayhap, I shall have occasion to apply to him again for occupation. For that reason I shall take abundant care to give no information whatsoever in the following pages. End of chapter 1, part 2. Recording by Todd. Chapter 2 of Zone Policeman 88. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mickey Lee Rich. 
Zone Policeman 88, A Close-Range Study of the Panama Canal and Its Workers, by Harry A. Frank. Chapter 2 The boss and I initiated the Canal Zone Census that very night. Legally, it was to begin with the dawning of February, but there were many labor camps in our district, and the hours bordering on midnight, the only sure time to catch him in. Up in House 47, I gathered together the Legion paraphernalia for this new occupation. Some two hundred red cards, a foot long and half as wide, a surveyor's field notebook for the preservation of miscellaneous information, tags for the tagging of canvas buildings, tacks for the tacking of the same, the necessary tack hammer, the medium soft black pencil, above all the awesome legal commission, impressively signed and sealed, wherein none other than our weighty nation's chief himself did expressly authorize me to search out, enter, and question ad libitum. All this swung over a shoulder in a white canvas sack that carried memory back through the long years to my newsboy days. I descended to the town. The boss was ready. It was nearly eleven when we crossed the silent PRR tracks and plunged away into the night past great heaps of abandoned locomotives huddled dim and uncertain in the thin moonlight like ghosts of the French fiasco dashed into a camp of the laborers' village of Cunet pitched on the very edge of the new black and silent void of the canal. Eighteen thick-necked negroes in undershirts and trousers gazed up white-eyed from a suspended card game at the long camp table, but we had no time for explanations. Name? I shouted at the coal-hued Hercules nearest at hand. David Providence, he bleated in a trembling voice, and the great zone questionnaire was on. We had enrolled the group before a son of wisdom among them surmised that we were not, after all, plainclothes men in quest of criminals, and his announcement brought visible relief. Twice as many blacks were sprawled in the two rooms of double-sided, three-story bunks, mere strips of canvas on gas pipes that could be hung up like swinging shelves when not in use. Mere noise did not even disturb their dreams. We roused them by pencil jabs in the ribs, and they started up with a savage, animal-like grunts and murderous glares, which instantly subsided to sheepish grins and voiceless astonishment at sight of a white face bending over them. Now and again, open-mouthed guffaws of laughter greeted the mumbled admission of some powerful buck that he could not read or did not know his age. But there was nothing even faintly resembling insolence for these were all British West Indians, without a corrupting state nigger among them. A half hour after our arrival, we had tagged the barracks and dived into the next camp, blacker and sleepier and more populous than the first. It was a February morning before I climbed the steps of Silent 47 and stepped under the shower bath that is always preliminary on the zone to a night's repose. A dream of earthquake, holocaust, and general destruction developed gradually into full consciousness at 4.30. House 47 was in riotous uproar. No, neither conflagration nor foreign invasion was pending. It was merely the house full of engineers in the customary daily struggle to catch the labor train and be away to work by daylight. When the hour's rampage had subsided, I rose to switch off the light and turn in again. The rays of the impetuous Panama sun were spattering from them when I passed again the jumbled rows of invalided locomotives and machinery reddish with rust and bound like Gulliver by green jungle strands and tropical creepers. By day, the arch-roofed labor camps were silent and empty, but for a lonely janitor languidly mopping a floor. Before the buildings, a black gang was dipping the canvas and gas pipe bunks one by one into a great kettle of scalding water. But there are also married quarters at Cunet. A row of six government houses tops the ridge with six families in each house, and no, 
I dare not risk nomination to an ever-expanding, though unpopular, club by stating how many in a family. I will venture merely to assert that when noontime came, I was not well started on the second house, yet carried away more than sixty filled-out cards. More than two days that single row of houses endured, varied by nights spent with the boss in the labor camps of Lirio Calibra Way. Then one morning I tramped far out the highway to the old Scotchman's farmhouse that bounds empire on the north and began the long, intricate journey through the private-owned town itself. It was like attending a congress of the nations, a museum exhibition of all the shapes and hues in which the human vegetable grows, tenements and wobbly kneed shanties swarming with exhibits monopolized the landscape. Strange, the room that did not yield up at least a man and woman and three or four children. Day after blazing day, I sat on rickety chairs, wash tubs, ironing boards, veranda railings, climbing creaking stairways, now and again descending a treacherous one in unintentional haste and ungraceful posture, burrowing into blind but inhabited cubby holes, hunting out squatters' nests of tin cans and dry good boxes hidden away behind the legitimate buildings, shouting questions into dilapidated eardrums, delving into the past of every human being who fell in my way. West Indian Negroes easily kept the lead of all of the nationalities combined. Negroes blacker than the obsidian cutlery of the Aztecs, blonde Negroes with yellow hair and blue eyes, whose race was betrayed only by eyelids and the dead whiteness of skin, and whom one could not set down as such after enrolling swarthy Spaniards as white without a smile. They lived chiefly in windowless six-by-eight rooms, always a cheap, dirty calico curtain dividing the three-foot parlor in front from the five-foot bedroom behind, the former cluttered with a van load of useless junk dirty blankets, decrepit furniture, glittering goo a black baby squirming naked in a basket of rags with an Episcopal prayer book under its pillow, relic of the old demon-scaring superstitions of voodoo worship. Every inch of the walls was decorated, after the artistic temperament of the race, with pages of illustrated magazines or newspapers, half-tones of all things conceivable, with no small amount of text and sundry languages. Many a page purely of advertising matter, the muscular and brooded likeness of a certain black champion rarely missing, frequently with a Bible laid reverently beneath it. Outside, before each room, a tin fireplace for cooking precariously bestrided the veranda rail. Often a tumbled-down hovel, where three would seem a crowd, yielded up more than a dozen inmates, many of whom, being at work, must be looked for later the back calls, that is, the bete noir of the census enumerator. West Indians, however, are for the most part well acquainted with the affairs of friends and roommates, and enrollment of the absent was often possible. Occasionally, I ran into a den of impertinence that must be frowned down, notably a notorious swarming tenement over a lumber yard. But on the whole, the courtesy of the British West Indians, even among themselves, was noteworthy. Of the two great divisions among them, Barbadians seemed more well-mannered than Jamaicans, or was it merely more subtle hypocrisy? Among them all, the most unspoiled children of nature appeared to be those from the little island of Nevis. You ain't no American. Yeah, I is. Why... You the very first American I ever see that was polite, which spoke badly indeed for the others, for that not being one of the virtues I strive particularly to cultivate. But, polite or not, there can be no question of the astounding stupidity of the West Indian rank and file, a stupidity amusing if you are in an amusable mood, unendurable if you neglect to pack your patients among your bag of supplies in the morning. Tropical patients, too, is at best a frail child. The dry season sun rarely even veiled his face, and there were those among the enumerators 
who complained of the taxing labor of all day marching up and down streets and stairs and zone hills beneath it but to me fresh from tramping over the mountains of central america with twenty pounds on my shoulder this was mere pastime heat had no terrors for the enumerated however even in the hottest hour of the day i came upon negroes sleeping in tightly closed rooms the sweat running off of them in streams yet apparently vastly enjoying the situation sunday came and i chose to continue though virtually all the zones was on holiday and even the boss after what i found later to be his invariable custom had broken away from his card littering dwelling place on saturday evening and hurried away to panama drawn thither and held till monday morning by some irresistible attraction sunday turns holiday completely on the zone even to hours of trains and hotels the frequent passengers were packed from southern white end to northern black end with all nations in gladsome garb bound panama ward to see the lottery drawing and buy a ticket for the following sunday across the isthmus to breezy colon or to one of a hundred varying spots and pastimes others in khaki breeches fresh from the government laundry in cristobal and the ubiquitous leather leggings of the zoner were off to ride out the day in the jungles still others set resolutely forth afoot into tropical paths a dozen or so gleaned one by one from all the towns along the line were even on their way to church yet with all this scattering there still remained a respectable percentage lounging on the screened verandas in pajamas and kimonos old-timers of four or five or even six years standing who were convinced they had seen and heard and smelt and tasted all that the zone or tropical lands have to offer well on in the morning there was a general gathering of all the ditch-digging clans of empire and vicinity in a broad field close under the eaves of town and soon they came drifting across to me at my labor hoarse frenzied screams sounding strangely incongruous beneath the swaying palm trees come on get down with his arm ah but my time was well chosen in the spanish camps above the canal still and silent with sunday men at no other time to be run to earth were entrapped in their bunks under their dwelling place in the shade shaving exchanging haircuts washing workaday clothes reminiscing over far-off homes and pre-migratory days or merely loafing the same cheery friendly quick-witted fellows they were as in their native land even the few italians and rare portuguese scattered among them were inoculated with their cheerfulness came sudden changes to camps of martiniques a sort of wild untamed creature who spoke the distressing imitation of french which even he did not for a moment claim to be such but frankly dubbed patois restless-eyed black men who answered to their names only at the question comment belle and give their age only to those who open wide mouth and cry que vous then on again to the no less strange sing-song english of jamaica the whining tones of those whose island trees the conquesting spaniards found bearded barbados now and again a more or less dark costa rican guatemalteco venezuelan stray islander from st vincent trinidad or guadalupe individuals defying classification but the chief reward for denying myself a holiday were the back calls in the town itself which i was able to check out of my field book many a long-sought negro i roused from his holiday siesta dashing past the tawdry calico curtains to pound him awake mere auricular demonstration having only the effect of lulling him into deeper childlike slumber the surest and often only effective means was to tickle the slumberer gently on the soles of the bare feet with some airy delicate instrument such as my tack hammer or a convenient broom handle or flat iron frequently i came upon young negro men of the age and type that in white skins would have been loafing on pool-room corners reading to themselves in loud and solemn voices from the bible with a far-away look in their eyes always i was surrounded by a never-broken babble of voices 
for the West Indian Negro can let his face run unceasingly all the day through and night, though he have never a word to say. Thus my enumerated tags spread further and wider over the city of empire. I reached in due time the hodgepodge shops and stores of Railroad Avenue. Chinamen began to drift into the rolls. There appeared such names as Carmen Hua Cheng. Cooks and waitresses living in darksome back cupboards must be unearthed. Negro shoemakers were caught at their stands on the sidewalks. Shiny-haired bartenders gave up their biographies in nasal monosyllables amid the slop of suds and the scrape of celluloid froth eradicators. Rare was the land that had not sent representatives to this great dirt-shoveling Congress. A Syrian merchant gasped for breath and fell over at his counter in delight to find out that I, too, had been in his native Zakhle. Five Punjabis all but died of pleasure when I mispronounced three words of their tongue. Occasionally there came startling contrast as I burst unexpectedly into the ancestral home of some educated native family that had withstood all the tides of time and change and still lived in the beloved imperator of their forefathers. Anger was usually near the surface at my intrusion, but they quickly changed to their ingrown politeness and chatty sociability when addressed in their own tongue and treated in their own extravagant gestures. It was almost sure to return again, however, at the question whether they were Panamonians. Distinctly not. They were Colombians. There is no such country as Panama. Thus the enrolling of the faithful continued. Chinese laundrymen divulged the secrets of their mysterious past between spurts of water and steaming shirt bosoms. Chinese merchants, of whom there were hordes on the zone, queueless, dressed, and be tailored till you must look at them twice to tell them from gold employees, the flag of the new republic flapping over their doors, the new president in their lapels, left off selling crucifixes and breastpin medallions of Christ to Negro women to answer my questions. One evening I stumbled into a nest of eleven Bengali peddlers with the bare floor of their single room as bed, table, and chairs. In one corner, surmounted by their little embroidered skull caps, were stacked the bundles with which they pester zone housewives, and in another, their god, wrapped in a dirty rag against profaning eyes. Many days had passed before I landed the first zone resident I could not enroll unassisted. He was a heathen Chinese, newly arrived, who spoke neither Spanish nor English. It was Chinese Charlie who helped me out. Chinese Charlie was a resident of the zone before the days of de Lesseps, and our first meeting had insisted on being enrolled under that pseudonym, alleging it his real name. Upstairs above his store all was sepulchral silence when I mounted to investigate, and I came quickly and quietly down again, for the door had opened on the gaudy oriental splendor of a joss house where dwelt only grinning wooden aisles not counted as zone residents by the materialistic census officials. On the Isthmus, as elsewhere, John is a law-abiding citizen within limits, never obsequious, nearly always friendly, ready to answer questions quite cheerily so long as he considers the matter any of your business, but closing infinitely tighter than the maltreated bivalve when he fancies you are prying too far. In time, I reached the commissary, the government department store, and enrolled it from cash desk to cold storage. Empire Hotel, from steward to scullions, filed by me whispering autobiography. The police station, on its knoll felt like the rest. I went to jail and sat down a large score of black men and pair of European whites, back from a day's sweaty labor of road building, who lived now in unaccustomed cleanliness in the heart of the lower story of a fresh wooden building with light iron bars, easy to break out of if it were not that policemen, white and black, sleep on all sides of them. Crowded, old empire not only faces her streets, but even her backyards are filled with shacks and inhabited boxes to be hunted out. On the hem of her tattered outskirts and the jungle edges, I ran into heaps of old abandoned junk, locomotives, cars, dredges, boilers, 
some with the letters U.S. painted upon them, which sight gave some three-day investigator material to charge the ICC with untold waste, and now soon to be removed by a Chicago wrecking company. Then all the town must be done again. Back calls. By this time, so wide and varied was my acquaintance in Empire, that wenches withdrew a dripping hand from their tubs to wave at me with a sympathetic giggle, and piccaninis ran out to meet me as a re returned in quest of one missing inmate in a house of fifty. For the few laborers still uncaught, I took to coming after dark. But West Indians rarely own lamps. Not even the brass tax numbers above the doors were visible, and as for a negro in the dark. Absurd rumors had begun early to circulate among the dark brethren, in all Negrodom the conviction became general that this individual detailing, catechizing, and house-branding was really a government scheme to get lists of persons due for deportation, either for lack of work as the canal neared completion or for looseness of marital relations. Hardly a tenement did I enter, but laughing voices bandied back and forth, and there echoed and re-echoed through the building such remarks as, well, they go send us home, Penelope, or you and Percival better hurry up and get married, Ambrosia. Several dusky females regularly ran away when I approached. One, at least, I came a-seeking in vain nine times, and found her the tenth time behind a garbage barrel. Many fancied the secret marks on the enumerated tag, date, and initials of the enumerator were intimately concerned with their fate. So strong is the fear of the law imbued by the zone police that they dared not tear down the dreaded placard, but would sometimes sit staring at it for hours, striving to penetrate its secret, or exercise away its power of evil. And now and then some bolder spirit ventured out, at midnight, with a pencil, and put tails and extra flourishes on the penciled letters, in the hope of disguising them against the fatal day. Except for the chaos of nationalities and types on the zone, enumerating would have become more than monotonous. But the enumerated took care to break the monotony. There was the wealth of nomenclature, for instance. What more striking than a shining black waiter strutting proudly about under the name of Levi McCarthy? There was no necessity to ask Beresford Plangenet if he were a British subject. Naturally, the mother of Hazermanith Cumberbard Smith, baptized that very week, had to claw out the family Bible from among the bedclothes and look up the name on the flyleaf. To the enumerator, who must set down concise and exact answers to each of his questions, fifty or sixty daily scenes and replies something like these were delightful. Enumerator, sitting down on the edge of a barrel, How many living in this room? Explosive laughter from the buxom jet-black woman addressed. Enumerator on a venture. What's the man's name? He named Rasmus Eagleston. What's his metal check number? Lord Master, I don't know he check number. Haven't you a commissary book with it in? Lord, no, my love. Commissary book him finish already before last week. Is he Jamaican? No, him a malt rat, Master. Monsteration. What color is he? <laughs> what for you ask all dem questions, Mazda? For instance. Oh, him just a pitch darker than me. How old is he? Loud laughter. La, I don't know how old him are. Well, about how old. Oh, him a ripe man, my love. Him a prime man. Is he older than you? Oh, yes, him older than me. And how old are you? <laughs> Deed, I don't know how old I is. I gone lost my age paper. Is he married? Quickly and with a very grave face. Oh, yes, indeed, master. I his sure enough wife. Can he read? Hesitatingly. Eh, a little, sir. Not too much, sir. Which generally means he can spell out a few words of one syllable and make some sort of mark representing his name. What kind of work does he do? Haughtily. Him employed by the ICC. Yes, naturally. But what kind of work does he do? Is he a laborer? 
quickly and very impressively. Labor? Oh no, my sweet master, he just shovel away the dirt before the steam shovel. All right, that'll do it for Rasmus. Now your name. My name, Mistress Jane Eagleston. How long have you lived in the canal zone? Oh, not too long, my love. Since when have you lived in this house? Oh, we don't come to this house too long, sir. Can you read and write? No, I don't stay in Jamaica. I come to Panama when I'm small. Do you do any work besides your own housework? Evasively. Work? If I does any work, no, not any. Enumerator looks hard from her to wash tub. I, uh, I washes a couple of gentlemen's clothes. Very good, then. Now then, how many children? We don't get no children, sir. What? How did that happen? Loud, house-shaking laughter. Enumerator. Looking at watch and finding it 1210. Well, good afternoon. Good evening, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Variations on the above might fill many pages. How old are you? Self-appointed interpreter of the same shade. He is how old is you? How old I are? I don't rather know my age, master. My mother never told me. St. Lucian woman, evidently about forty-five, after deep thought, plainly anxious to be truthful as possible. Eh, uh, as twenty, sir. Oh, you're older than that. About sixty, say? About that, sir. Are you married? Pushing the children out of the way. No, not as yet, my, my sweet master. But, but we gon' be soon, sir. To a Barbadian woman of forty. Just you and your daughter live here? That's all, sir. Does your husband live here? Oh, I don't never marry as yet, sir. Anent the old saying about the partnership of life and hope. To a Dominican woman of fifty-two, toothless and pitted with small blocks, are you married? With simpering smile, not as yet, my sweet master. To a Dominican youth, how many people live in this room? Three persons live here, sir. I stand grammatically corrected. When did you move here? We were moved here in April. Again, I apologize for my mere American grammar now, Henry. What is your roommate's name? Well, we calls him Ethel, but I don't know his right title. Peradventure he will not work this evening, and you can ask him from himself. Do his parents live on the zone? Oh, yes, sir. He has one father and one mother. An answer, why himself, emphatically subject pronoun among Barbadians, didn't know if he'd get a job. To a six-foot black giant working at night hostler at steam shovels. Well, Josiah, I suppose you're a Jamaican. Oh, yes, boss. I work in Kingston ten years as a barmaid. Married? No, boss. I's not exactly married. I was living with a person. A colored family. Sarah Green, very black has a child named Edward White, and is now living with Henry Brown, a light yellow negro. West Indian wit. A shop sign in Empire. Don't ask for credit. He has gone on vacation since January 1, 1912. Laughter and carefree countenances are legion in the West Indian ranks. Children seem never to be punished, and to all appearances man and wife live commonly in peace and harmony. Dr. O., tells the following story, however. In his rounds, he came upon a negro beating his wife and had him placed under arrest. The negro, Why, boss, can a man chastise his wife when she deserves and needs it? Dr. O, Not on the canal zone. It's against the law. Negro, in great astonishment. Is that so, boss? Did I never do it again, boss? On the canal zone. One morning, in the heart of empire, a noise not unlike that of a rocky waterfall began to grow upon my ear. Louder and louder it swelled, as I worked slowly forward. At last, I discovered its source. In a lower room of a tenement, an old white-haired Jamaican had fitted up a private school, to which the elite among the darker brethren sent their children. Rather than patronizing the common public schools, Uncle Sam provided free to all zone residents. The old man sat before some twenty wide-eyed children, one of whom stood slouch-shouldered, book in hand, in the center of the room, 
and at regular intervals of not more than twenty seconds he shouted high above all other noises of the neighborhood you calls that english however you goin learn talk properly like that you tell me far back in the interior of an empire block i came upon an old old negro woman parchment skinned and doddering living alone in a stoop shouldered shanty of boxes and ten cans i don't know how old i is master was one of her replies but i born six years before the color was discovered when did you come to panama i don't know but it a long time ago before the americans perhaps oh long before the french ain't only just begin to dig i was ashamed to say how long i've been here just why it was not evident unless she fancied she should long ago have been made her fortune and left is you american where de american to have done wanting de make this country civilize why cha before they come we have all the time here revolutions i couldn't count to how many revolutions we had and every day they steal all what we have to even steal my clothes i so glad for one the americans come it was during my empire enumerating that i startled one morning to burst suddenly from the tawdry junk jumbled rooms of negroes into a bare floored freshly scrubbed room containing some very clean cots a small table and a hammock and a general air of frankness and simplicity with no attempt to disguise the commonplace at the table sat a spaniard in worn but newly washed working clothes book in hand i sat down and falling unconsciously into the th pronunciation of the castilian began blithely to reel off the questions that had grown so automatic name federico malero check number can you read a little the bare suggestion of amusement in his voice caused me to look up quickly my library he said with a ghost of a weird smile nodding his head slightly toward an unpainted shelf made of pieces of dynamite boxes mine and my roommates the shelf was filled with four real barcelona paper editions of hegel fitch spencer huxley and a half dozen others accustomed to sit in the same company all dog-eared with much reading some ambitious foremen i mused and went on with my queries occupation pico y pala he answered pick and shovel i exclaimed and read those no importa he answered again with his elusive shadow of a smile it doesn't matter and as i arose to leave buenos dias senor and he turned again to his reading i plunged into the jumble of negroes next door putting my questions and setting down the answers without even hearing them my thoughts still back in the clean bare room behind wondering whether i should not have been wiser after all to have ignored the sharp drawn lines and the prejudices of my fellow countrymen and joined the pick and shovel zone world there might have been pay dirt there a few months before i remembered a spanish laborer killed in a dynamite explosion in the cut had turned out to be one of the spain's most celebrated lawyers i recalled that el unico the anarchist spanish weekly published in miraflores contained some crystal clear thinking set forth in a sharp cut manner that shows a real inside knowledge of the job and the canal workers however little one may agree with its philosophy and methods then it was due to the law of contrast i suppose that the thought of tom my roommate suddenly flashed upon me and i discovered myself chuckling at the picture tom the roughneck to whom all such as federico malero with his pick and shovel were miller silver men on whom tom looked down from his high perch on his steam shovel as far less worthy of notice than the rock he was clawing out of the hillside how many a silent chuckle and how many a covert sneer must the maleros on the zone indulge in at the pompous airs of some american ostensibly far above them end of chapter two Recording by Mickey Lee Rich
Chapter 3, Part 1 of Zone Policeman 88. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Zone Policeman 88, A Close-Range Study of the Panama Canal and Its Workers, by Harry A. Frank. Chapter 3, Part 1. Meanwhile, my fellow enumerators were reporting troubles in the bush. I heard particularly those of two of the Marines, Mac and Renson. Merry, good-natured, earnest by sports, even modest fellows, quite different from what I had hitherto pictured as an enlisted man. Mac was a half-and-half half of Scotch and Italian. Naturally, he was constantly effervescing, both verbally and temperamentally. His snapping black eyes were never still. Life played across his excitable, sunny, boyish face like cloud shadows on a mountain landscape. Whoever would speak to him at any length must catch him in a vice-like grip and hold his attention by main force. He spoke with a funny little almost foreign accent, was touching on forty, and was the youngest man at that age in the length and breadth of the canal zone. At first sight, you would take Mac for a mere roustabout, like most who go a-soldiering. But before long you'd begin to wonder where he got his rich and fluent vocabulary and his warehouse of information. Then you'd run across the fact that he had once finished a course in a Middle Western University, and forgotten it. The schools had left little of their blighting mark upon him, yet pump Mac on any subject from rapid-fire guns to grand opera, and you'd get at least a reasonable answer. Though you wouldn't guess the knowledge was there unless you did pump for it, for Mac was not of the type of those who overwork the first-person pronoun not because of foolish diffidence, but merely because it rarely occurred to him as a subject of conversation. Seventeen years in the Marine Corps, you were sure he was jollying when he first said it, had taken Mac to most places where warships go, from Key King and the Islands to Cape Town and Buenos Aires, and given him not merely an acquaintance with the world, but, what is far more an acquisition, the gift of getting acquainted in almost any stratum of the world in the briefest possible space of time. Mac spoke not only his English and Italian, but a fluent island Spanish. He knew enough French to talk even to Martiniques, and he could moreover make two distinct sets of noises that were understood by Chinese and Japanese respectively. He was a man just reckless enough in all things to be generous and alive, yet never foolishly wasteful either of himself or his meager substance. Mac first rose to fame in the census department by appearing one afternoon at Empire Police Station dragging a bush native by the scruff of the neck with one hand, and carrying in the other the machete with which the bushman had tried to prove he was a Colombian and not subject to questioning by the agents of other powers. Renson, well, Renson was in some way Mac's exact antithesis, and in some his twin brother. He was one of those youths who believe in spending prodigally and in all possible haste what little nature had given them. Wherefore, though he was younger than Mac appeared to be, he already looked older than Mac was. In zone parlance, he had already laid a good share of the road to hell behind him. Yet, such a cheery, likable chap was Renson, so large-hearted and unassuming. That was just why you felt an itching to seize him by the collar of his olive-drab shirt and shake him till his teeth rattled for tossing himself so wantonly to the inferior bow-wows. Renson's bush troubles were legion. Not only were there the seducing brown spigoty woman out in the wilderness to help him on his descending trail, but when and wherever fire water of whatever nationality or degree of voltage showed its neck, and it is to be found even in the bush, there was Renson sure to give battle and fall. It's no use being a man unless you're a hell of a man, was Renson's influenced philosophy. How different this was from his native good sense when the influence was turned off, was demonstrated when he returned from cautiously reconnoitering a cottage far back in the wilds one dark night, and reported as his reason for postponing the enumerating, If you'd butt in on one of them Martinique booze festivals, they'd crown you with a bottle. Already one or two enumerators had gone back to private life, by request. Particularly sad was the case of our dainty blue-blooded Panamanian. As with many Panamanians, and not a few of the self-exalted elsewhere, he was more burdened with blue corpuscles than with gray matter, at any rate. On our cards, after the query, color, was a small space, a very small space, in which was to be written, quite briefly and unceremoniously, 
W, B, or M, X, as the case might be. Uncle Sam was in a hurry for his census. Early one afternoon, our Panamanian helpmate burst upon one of his numerous aristocratic relatives in his royal thatched domains in the ancestral bush. When he had embraced him the customary fifteen times on the right side and the fifteen accustomed times on the left side, and had performed the eighty-five gestures of greeting required by the social manual of the bush, and asked the three hundred and sixty-five questions de rigueur regarding the honorable health of his honorable horde of offspring, and his eye had fallen again on the red cards in his hand, the fact struck him that the relative was of precisely the same shade of complexion as himself. Could he set him down as he had many a mere red-blooded person, and thereby perhaps establish a precedent that might result in his own mortification? Yet could he stretch a shade, or several shades, and set him down as white? No, there was the oath of office, and the government that administered it had been found long-armed and argus-eyed. Long he sat in deepest meditation. Being a Panamanian, he could not, of course, know that Uncle Sam was in a hurry for his census. Till at length, as the sun was firing the western jungled treetops, a scintillating idea rewarded his unwanted cogitation. He caught up the medium-soft pencil and wrote in aristocratic hand down across the sheet where other information is supposed to find place, color, a very light mixture, and taking his leave with the requisite seventy-five gestures and genuflections, he drifted empirewood with a dozen cards the day had yielded. Which is why I was shocked next morning by the disrespectful report of Renson that my friend the boss had tied a can to this big's tail, and our dainty and lamented comrade went back to the more fitting blue-blood occupation of swinging a cane in the lobbies of Panama's famous hostelries. But what mattered such small losses? Had not Scotty been engaged to fill the breach, or all of them? One or two breaches more or less made small difference to Scotty. He was a cozy little barrel of a man, born in Dumbarton, and for some years past had been dispensing good old Dumbarton English in Panama's proudest educational institution. But Panama's school vacation is during her summer, her dry season from February to April. What more natural, then, than that Scotty should have concluded to pass his vacation taking census? For obviously, a man must pick up a wee bit of change wherever he can. I seem to have been appointed to a purely sightseeing job. One February noon, I reported at the office to find that passes to Gaton had been issued to five of us, Scotty, Mac, Renson, and Barter among the number. The task in the town by the dam side, it seemed, was proving too heavy for the regular enumerators of that district. We left by the 210 train. Cascadas and Balsabispo rolled away behind us. Across the canal I caught a glimpse of the wilderness surrounding the abode of old Fritz. Then we entered a, to me, unknown land. I could easily have fancied myself a tourist, especially so at Matachin, when Mac solemnly attempted to spring on me the old tourist hoax of suicided Chinaman as the derivation of the town's name. Through Gorgona, the Pittsburgh of the zone with its acres of machine shops, rumbled the train and plunged beyond into a deep, if not exactly rank, endless jungle. The stations grew small and unimportant. Bailamonos and San Pablo were withering and wasting away. Orcalagato, or hanged alligator, was barely more than a memory. Tabernilia was a mere heap of lumber being tumbled on flat cars bound for new service further Pacificward. Of Frijoles, there remained barely enough to shudder at, with the collector's nasal brawl of, Free Holes! And everywhere, the irrepressible tropical greenery was already rushing back to engulf the pygmy works of man. It seemed criminally wasteful to have built these entire towns, with all the detail and machinery of a well-governed and fully furnished city, from police station to salt cellars, only to tear them down again and utterly wipe them out four or five years after their founding. A forerunner of what, in a brief few years, will have happened to all the zone. Nay, is not this the way of life itself? For soon, the spillway at Gaton is to close its gates, and all this vast region will be flooded and come to be Gaton Lake. Villages that were old when Pizarro began his swine herding will be wiped out. Even this splendid double-track railroad goes the way of the rest, for on February 15th, a bare few days away, it was to be abandoned, and where we were now racing northwestward through brilliant sunshine and Atlantic breezes, would soon be the bottom of a lake over which great ocean steamers will glide, while far below will be tall palm trees and the spreading mangoes, the banana, king of weeds, gigantic ferns, and, well, who will say what will become of the brilliant parrots, the monkeys, and the jaguars? For nearly an hour we had not a glimpse of the canal, 
lost in the jungle to the right. Then, suddenly, we burst out upon the growing lake, now all but licking at the rails beneath us, the zone city of Gatan climbing up a hillside on its edge and scattering over several more. To the left, I caught my first sight of the world-famous locks and dam, and at 3.30 we descended at the stone station. First milepost of permanency, for being out of reach of the coming flood, it is built to stay, and shows what canal zone stations will be in the years to come. There remained for me but seven miles of the isthmus, still unseen. On the cement platform was a great foregathering of the census clans from all districts, whence we climbed to the broad porch of the administration building above. There before me, for the first time in, well, many months, spread the Atlantic, the Caribbean perhaps I should say, seeming very near, so near I almost fancied I could have thrown a stone to where it began and stretched away up to the bluish horizon, while the entrance to the canal, where soon great ships will enter, poked its way inland to the locks beside us. Across the treetops of the flat jungle, also seemingly close at hand, though the railroad takes seven miles, and thirty-five cents if you are no employee to reach it, was Cologne, the tops of whose low buildings were plainly visible above the vegetation. Not many zoners, I reflected, catch their first view of Cologne from the veranda of the administration building at Caton. We had arrived with time to spare. Fully an hour we loafed and yarned and spoke before whistle blew, and long lines of little figures began to come up out of the depths and zigzag across the landscape, until soon a line of laborers of every shade known to humanity began to form, paychecks in hand, its double head at the pay windows on the two sides of the veranda, its tail serpentining off down the hillside and away nearly to the edge of the mammoth locks. Packs of the yellow cards of Cristobal District in hand, a relief to eyes that had been staring for days at the pink ones of Empire, we lined up like birds of prey just beyond the windows. As the first laborer passed this, one, nay, several of us, pounced upon him, for all plans we had laid to line up and take turns were thus quickly overthrown, and wild competition soon reigned. From then on, each dived in to snatch his prey, and dragging him to the nearest free space, began in some language or another, Where do you live? This was the overwhelming problem. In what language to address each victim? Varder, speaking only his nasal New Jersey, took to picking out Negroes, and even then often turned away in disgust when he landed a Martinique or a Haitian. West Indian English alternated with a black potois that smelt at times fairly of French. Muscular, bullet-headed Negroes appeared slowly and laboriously counting their money in their hats. Eagle-nosed Spaniards under the boina of the Pyrenees. Spaniards from Castile speaking like a gatling gun in action. Now and again, even a snappy-eyed Andalusian with his essless, slurred speech. Slow, laborious Gallegos, Italians and Portuguese in numbers. Colombians of nondescript color a Slovak who spoke some German, a man from Palestine with a mixture of French and Arabic noises I could guess at, and scattered here and there among the others, a Turk who jabbered the lingua franca of Mediterranean ports. I got all who fell into my hands. Once I dragged forth a Hindu, and shuddered with fear of a first failure. But he knew a bit of a strange English, and I found I recalled six or seven words of my forgotten Hindustani. Then suddenly a flood of Greeks broke upon us, growing deeper with every moment. Above the pandemonium, my companions were howling hoarsely and imploringly for the interpreter, while clutching their trembling victim by the slack of his labor-stained shirt, lest he escape unenrolled. The interpreter, in accordance with a well-known law of physics, and the limitations of human nature, could not be in sixteen places at once. I crowded close, caught his words, memorized a few questions, and there I was with my Pumayanas, Postinton, Padre Mianos, and rolling Greeks unassisted, not only that, but haughtily acting as interpreter for my fellows, not only without having studied the tongue of Achilles, but never even having graced a Greek letter fraternity. Quick tropical daylight descended, and still the labor-smeared line wound away out of sight in the darkness. Still workmen of every shade and tongue jingled their brass checks timidly on the edge of the pay window, from behind which came roaring noises that the Americans within fancied Spaniards, or Greeks, or Romanians must understand, because they were not English noises. Still we pounced upon the paid as upon a tackling dummy in the early days of spring practice. The colossal wonder of it all was how these deep-chested, muscle-knotted fellows endured us, how they refrained from taking us up between a thumb and forefinger and dropping us over the veranda railing. For our attack lacked somewhat a gentle courtesy, notably so that of the rowdy. He was a chustless youth of the type that has grown so painfully prevalent in our land since the soft-hearted abolishment of the beech-rod of revered memory. 
of that all too familiar type whose proofs of manhood are cigarettes and impudence and discordant noise, and whose national superiority is demonstrated by the maltreating of all other races. But the enrolls were all, black, white, or mixed, far more gentlemen than we. Some, of brief zone experience, were sheepish with fear and the wonder as to what new mandate this incomprehensible U.S. was perpetrating to match its strange sanitary laws that forbade a man even to be uncleanly in his habits after the good old sacred rite of his ancestors to remotest ages. Then, too, there was his own policeman in dressy, new starch khaki, treading with dangling club in the ice eye of public appearance, waiting all too eagerly for someone to start something. But the great percentage of the maltreated multitude were old-timers, men of four or five years of digging, who had learned to know this strange creature, the Americans, and the world too, who smiled indulgently down upon our yelping and yanking like a St. Bernard above the snapping puppy he knows well cannot seriously bite him. Dense black night had fallen. Here and there lanterns were hung, under one of which we dragged each captive. The last passenger back to Empire roared away into the jungle night. Still we scribbled on, backed a yellow card and dived again into the muscular whirlpool to emerge dragging forth by the collar a Greek, a Pole, or a West Indian. It was like business competition, in which I had an unfair advantage, being able to understand any jargon in evidence. When at last the pay windows came down with a bang and an American curse, and the serpentining tail squirmed for a time in distress and died away as a snake's tail dies after sundown. I turned in more than a hundred cards. Tomorrow the tail would revive to form the nucleus of a new serpent, and we should return by the afternoon train to the lock city, and so on for several days to come. It was after nine of a black payday night. We were hungry. The rowdy, familiar with the lay of the land, volunteered to lead the foraging expedition. We stumbled down the hill and away along the railroad. A faint rumbling that grew to a confused roar fell upon our ears. We climbed a bank into a wild conglomeration of wood and tin architecture, nationalities, colors, and noises, and across a dark, bottomless gully from the high street we had reached, lights flashed amid a very ocean of uproar. The rowdy, as if to make the campaign as real as possible, led us racing down into the black abyss, whence we charged up the further slope and came sweating and breathless into the rampant rough and tumble of payday night in New Gaton, the time and place that is the vortex of trouble on the isthmus. Merely a short street of one of the half-dozen zone towns in which liquor licenses are granted, lined with a few saloons and pool rooms, but such a singing, howling, swarming multitude as is rivaled almost nowhere else, except it be on Broadway at the passing of the old year. But this mob, moreover, was fully seventy percent black and rather largely French, and when black and French and strong drink mix, trouble sprouts like jungle seeds. Now and then, Policeman G. drifted by through the uproar, holding his sap loosely as for ready use, and often half-consciously hitching the heavy number 38 colt under his khaki jacket a bit nearer the grasp of his right hand. I little knew how familiar every corner of this scene would one day be to me. A Chinese grocer sold us bread and cheese. Down on the further corner of the hubbub, we entered a Spanish saloon and spread ourselves over the white bar, adding beer to our humble collation. Beyond the latticework that is the color line in zone dispensaries, West Indians are dancing wild, crowded hoedowns and shuffles amid much howling and more liquidation. On our side, a few Spanish laborers quietly sipped their liquor. The Marines, of course, were busted. The rest of us scraped up a few odd spigoty dimes. The Spanish bartender, who is never the tough his American counterpart strives to show himself, but merely a cheerly good fellow, drifted into our conversation, and when we found I had slept in his native village, he would have it that we accept a round of Valdepenas which must have been potent, for it moved Scotty to unbutton an inner pocket and set up an entire bottle of Amontillado. So midnight was no great space off when we turned out again into the howling night, and, having helped Renson to reach a sleeping space, scattered to the bachelor quarters that had been found for us and lay down for the few hours that remained before the 551 should carry us back to Empire. End of Chapter 3, Part 1 Recording by Todd Chapter 3, Part 2 of Zone Policeman 88. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Zone Policeman 88, 
A Close Range Study of the Panama Canal and Its Wonders by Harry A. Frank. Chapter 3, Part 2. At last I had crossed all the isthmus and heard the wash of the Caribbean at my feet. It was the Sunday following Argaton days, and nearly a month since my landing on the zone. The morning train from Empire left me at the lakeside city for a run over locks and dam which the working days had not allowed, and there being no other train for hours, I set off along the railroad to walk the seven miles to Cologne. On either side lay hot, rampant jungle, low and almost swampy. It was noon when I reached the broad railroad yards and zone storehouses of Mount Hope and turned aside to Cristobal Hotel. Cristobal is built on the very fringe of the ocean with the roll of waves at the very edge of its windows and a far-reaching view of the Caribbean where the ceaseless zone breeze is born. There stands the famous statue of Columbus protecting the Indian maid, crude humor in bronze, for Columbus brought Indian maids anything but protection. Near at hand in the joyous tropical sunshine lay a great steamer that in another week would be back in New York tying up in sleet and ice. A western bronco and a lariat might perhaps have dragged me on board, with a struggle. There is no more line of demarcation between Cristobal and Cologne than between Ancon and Panama. A khaki-clad zone policeman patrols one sidewalk, a black one in the sweltering dark blue uniform and heavy winter helmet of the Republic of Panama lounges on the other side of a certain street. On one side are the enumerated tags of the census, on the other, none. Cross the street and you fill at once a foreigner. It is distinctly unlawful to sell liquor on Sunday or to gamble at any time on the canal zone. It is, therefore, with something approaching a shock that one finds everything wide open and raging just across the street. I wandered out past Highball's merry-go-round, where huge negro bucks are laughing and playing and riding away their month's pay on the wooden horses like the children they are, and so on to the edge of the sea. Unlike Panama, Cologne is flat and square-blocked, as it is considerably darker in complexion with its large mixture of Negroes from the Caribbean shores and islands. Uncle Sam seems to have taken the city's fine beach away from her, but then she probably never took any other advantage of it than to turn it into a garbage heap as bad as once was Bottle Alley. At one end is a cement swimming pool with the announcement, Only for Gold Employees of the ICC, or PRR, and Guests of Washington Hotel. It is merely a softer way of saying, only white Americans with money can bathe here. Then beyond are the great hospitals, second only to those of Encon, the white wards built out over the sea, and behind them the black where the Negroes must be content with second-hand breezes. Some of the costs of the canal are here, sturdy black men in a sort of bed-tick pajamas sitting on verandas or in wheelchairs, some with one leg gone, some with both. One could not but wonder how it feels to be hopelessly ruined in body early in life, for helping to dig a ditch for a foreign power that, however well it may treat you materially, cares not a whistle-blast more for you than for its old worn-out locomotives rusting away in the jungle. Under the beautiful royal palms beyond, all bent inward in the constant breeze, are park benches where one can sit with the Atlantic spreading away to infinity before, breaking with its ages-old mysterious roll on the shore, just as it did before the Europeans' white sails first broke the gleaming skyline. Out to sea runs the growing breakwater from Toro Point, the great wireless tower, yet just across the bay on a little jutting, dense-grown tongue of land is the jungle hut of a jungle family as utterly untouched by civilization as was the verdant valley of Typey on the day Melville and Toby came stumbling down into it from the hills above. But meanwhile, I was not getting the long hours of unbroken sleep the heavy mental toil of enumeration requires. Free government bachelor quarters make strange bedfellows, or at least room fellows. Quartermasters, like Justice, are hopelessly blind, or I might have been assigned quarters upon the financial knoll where habits and hours were a bit more in keeping with my own. But a bachelor is a bachelor on the zone, and though he be clerk to his highness the colonel himself, he may find himself carelessly tossed onto a roughneck brotherhood. House 47 was distinctly an abode of roughnecks. A roughneck, it may be essential to explain to those who never ate at the same table with one, is a bull-necked, whole-hearted, hard-headed, cast-iron fellow who can ride the beam of a snorting, rock-tearing steam shovel all day, rustle the night through with various starred Hennessy and its rivals, and continue that round indefinitely without once failing to turn up to straddle his beam in the morning. He seems to have been created without the insertion of nerves, though he is never lacking in nerve. He is a fine fellow in his way, but you sometimes wish his way branched off from yours for a few hours, 
when bedtime or a mood for quiet musing comes in. He is a man you are glad to meet in a saloon, if you are in a mood to be there, or tearing away at the cliffs of Calabria, but there are other places where he does not seem exactly to fit into the landscape. House 47, I say, was a house of roughnecks. That fact became particularly evident soon after supper, when the seven phonographs were striking up their seven kinds of ragtime on seven sides of us, and it was the small hours before the poker games, carried on in much the same spirit as Comanche warfare, broke up throughout the house. Then, too, many a roughneck is far from silent, even after he has fallen asleep, and about the time complete quiet seemed to be settling down, it was 4.30, and a jarring chorus of alarm clocks wrought new upheaval. Then there was each individual annoyance. Let me barely mention two or three. Of my roommates, Mitch had sat at a locomotive throttle fourteen years in the States and Mexico, besides the four years he had been hauling dirt out of the cut. Youthful ambition Mitch had left behind, for though he could still look forward to forty, railroad rules had so changed in the States during his absence that he would have had to learn his trade over again to be able to run there. Moreover, four years in the zone does not make a man look forward with pleasure to a state's winter. So Mitch, like many another zoner, was planning to buy, with the savings of his $210 a month, when the job is done, a chunk of land on some sunny slope of a southern state and settle down for an easy descent through old age. There was nothing objectionable about Mitch, except perhaps his preference for late-hour poker, but he had a way of stopping with one leg out of his trousers when at last all the house had calmed down and cots were ceasing to creak, to make some such wholly irrelevant remark as, By that dispatcher gave me 609 today, and she wouldn't pull a greased string out of a knot hole, and thereby always hung a tail that was sure to range over half the track mileage of the states and wander off somewhere into the sandy cactus wilderness of Chihuahua, at least, before Mitch succeeded in getting out of the other trouser leg. The cot directly across from my own groaned, occasionally, under the coarse-grained bulk of Tom. Tom was a roughneck par excellence, so much so that even in a household of them he was known as Tom the Roughneck, which to Tom was high tribute. Some preferred to call him Tom the Noisy. He was built like a steam caisson, or an oil barrel, though without fat, with a neck that reminded you of a mirror bull with his head down just before the escort. And when he neglected to button his undershirt, a not infrequent oversight, he displayed the hairy chest of a mammoth gorilla. Tom's philosophy of getting through life was exactly the same as his philosophy of getting through a rocky hillside with his steam shovel. When it came to argument, Tom was invariably right, not that he was oversupplied with logic, but because he possessed a voice and the bellows to work it that could rise to the roar of his own steam shovel on those weeks when he chose to enter the shovel competition, and would have utterly overthrown, drowned it out, and annihilated James Stuart Mill himself. Tom always should have had money, for your roughneck on the zone has decidedly the advantage over the white-collared college graduate when the pay car comes around. But of course, being a genuine roughneck, Tom was always deep in debt, except on the three days after payday, when he was rolling in wealth. Once, I fancied the bulk of my troubles was over. Tom disappeared, leaving not a trace behind, except his working clothes tumbled on and about his cot. Then it turned out that he was not dead, but an Ancon hospital taking the Keeley cure, and one summer evening he blew in again, his cure effected, with a bottle in his coat pocket and two inside his vest. So the next day there was Tom celebrating his recovery all over House 47, and when next morning he did finally go back to his shovel, there were scattered about the room six empty quart bottles, each labeled whiskey. Luckily, Tom ran a shovel instead of a passenger train and could claw away at his hillside as savagely as he chose without any danger whatsoever, beyond that of killing himself or an odd nigger or two. We had other treasures on exhibition in 47. There was Shorty, for example. Shorty was a jolly, ugly, open-handed, four-eyed little snipe of a roughneck machinist who had lost, in the line of duty, two fingers highly useful in his trade. In consequence, he was now, after the generous fashion of the ICC, on full pay for a year without work, providing he did not leave the zone. And while Shorty, like the great majority of us, was a very tolerable member of society under the ordinary circumstances of having to earn his three squares a day, paid leisure hung most ponderously about him. The amusements in Empire are few, and not especially amusing. There is really only one unfailing one. That is slid in glass receptacles across a yellow varnished counter down on Railroad Avenue opposite Empire machine shops. So it happened that Shorty was gradually winning the title of a 33-degree booze fighter. 
and passengers on any afternoon train who took the trouble to glance in at a wide open door just at Latterward of the station might have beheld him with his back to the track and one foot slightly raised and resting lightly and with the nonchalance of long practice on a gas pipe that had missed its legitimate mission. In fact, Shorty had come to that point where he would rather be caught in church than found dead without a bottle on him, and arriving home overflowing with joy about midnight, slept away most of the day in forty-seven, that he might spend as much of the night as the early closing laws of the zone permitted at the amusement headquarters of Empire. With these few hints of the life that raged beneath the roof of forty-seven, it may perhaps be comprehensible, without going into detail, why I came to contemplate a change of quarters. I detest a kicker. I have small use for any but the man who will take his allotted share with the rest of the world without either whining or snarling. Yet when an official government census enumerator falls asleep on the edge of a tenement wash tub with question dead on his lips, or solemnly sets down a crow-black Jamaican as white, it is Uncle Sam who is suffering, and time for correction. But it is one thing for a Canal Zone employee to resolve to move, and quite another to carry out that resolution. Nero was a meek, unassertive, submissive, tractable little chap, keenly sensible to the suffering of his fellows, compared with his own quartermaster. So the first time I ventured to push open the screen door next to the post office, I was grateful to escape unmaimed. But at last, when I had done a whole month's penance in 47, I resorted to strategy. On March 1st, I entered the dreaded precinct, shielded behind the boss with his contagious smile, and the musical quartermaster of umpire was overthrown and defeated, and I marched forth, clutching in one hand a new assignment to quarters. That night I moved. The new, or more properly the older, room was in House 35, a one-story building of the old French type, many of which the Americans revamped upon taking possession of the Ismanian junk heap, across and a bit down the graveled street. It was a single room, with no roommate to question, which I might decorate and otherwise embellish according to my own personal idiosyncrasies. At the back, with a door between, dwelt the superintendent of the zone telephone system, with a convenient instrument on his table. In short, fortune seemed at last to be grinning broadly upon me. But the sequel. I hate to mention it. I won't. It's absurdly commonplace. A commonplace? Not a bit of it. He was a champion, an artist in his speciality. How can I have used that word in connection with his incomparable performance? Or attempt to give a hint of life on the canal zone without mentioning the most conspicuous factor in it? He lived in the next room south, a half-inch wooden partition reaching halfway to the ceiling between his pillow and mine. By day he lay on his back in the right-hand seat of the locomotive cab with his hand on the throttle and the soles of his boots on the boiler plate. He was just long enough to fit into that position without wrinkling. During the early evening... He lay on his back in a stout mission rocking chair on the front porch of House 35, Empire, CZ. And about 8 p.m. daily, he retired within to lie on his back in a regulation ICC metal cot. They are stoutly built. One pine half inch from my own. Obviously, 24 hours a day of such onerous occupation had left some slight effects on his figure. His shape was strikingly similar to that of a pushball. Had he fallen down at the top of Encon or Balboa Hill, it would have been an even bet whether he would have rolled down sideways or endwise, if his general type of build and specifications will permit any such distinction. When I first came upon him, reposing serenely in the porch rocking chair on the cushion that upholstered his spinal column, I was pleased. Clearly he was no roughneck. He couldn't have been and kept his figure. There was no question but that he was perfectly harmless. His stories ought to prove cheerful and laughter-provoking and kindly. His very presence seemed to promise to raise several degrees the merriment in that corner of House 35. It did. Toward eight, as I have hinted, he transferred from rocking chair to cot. He was not afflicted with troublesome nerves. At times he was an entire minute in falling asleep. Usually, however, his time was something under the half, and he slept with the innocent, undisturbed sleep of a babe for at least twelve unbroken hours, unless the necessity of getting across to the cut to his engine absolutely prohibited. Just there was the trouble. His first gentle, slumberous breath sounded like a small boy sliding down the sheet-iron roof of thirty-five. His second resembled a force of carpenters tearing out the half-grown partitions. His third, uh, but mere words are an absurdity. At times the noises from his gorilla-like throat softened down until one merely fancied himself in the hog corral of a Chicago stockyard. At others we prayed that we might at once be transferred there. 
A thousand times during the night we were certain he was on the very point of choking to death, and set up in a bed praying he wouldn't, and offering our month's salary to charity if he would. And through all our fatiguing anguish, he snorted undisturbedly on. In House 35 he was known as the Sloth. It was a gentle and kindly title. There were a few inexperienced inmates who had not yet entirely given up hope. The long hours of the night were spent in solemn conference. Pounding on the walls with hammers, chairs, and shoe heels was like singing a lullaby. One genius invented a species of foghorn which proved very effective, in waking up all empire east of the tracks, except the sloth. Some took to dropping their heavier and more dispensable possessions over the partition. One memorable night, a fellow sufferer cast over a young dry goods box which, bouncing from the snorer's figures of the floor, caused him to lose a beat. One. And the feat is still one of the proud memories of thirty-five. On Sundays, when all the rest of the world was up and shaved and breakfasted and off on the 839 of a brilliant sunny day to Panama, the sloth would still be imperturbably snorting and choking in the depths of his cot, and in the evening, as the train roamed back through the fresh, cool, jungled dusk and deposited us at Empire Station, and we crossed the wooden bridge before the hotel and began to climb the graveled path behind, hoping against hope that we might find crepe on that door, from the night ahead would break out on our ears, a sound as of a hippopotamus struggling wildly against going down for the third and last time. Most annoying of all, the sloth was not even a bona fide bachelor. He proudly announced that, though he was a model of marital virtue, he had not lived with his wife for many years. I never heard a man who knew him by night ask why. It was close upon criminal negligence on the part of the ICC to overlook its opportunity in this matter. There were so many, many uninhabited hilltops in the zone where a private swath dwelling might have been slapped together from the remains of falling towns at Catan End. Near it, a grandstand might even have been erected and admission charged. Or at least the daily climb to it would have helped to reduce the pushball figure, and thereby have improved the general appearance of the canal zone force. End of Chapter 3, Part 2 Recording by Todd Chapter 4, Part 1 of Zone Policeman 88. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Zone Policeman 88, A Close Range Study of the Panama Canal and Its Workers by Harry A. Frank. Chapter 4, Part 1. One morning, early in March, the boss and I crossed the suspension bridge over the canal. A hand car and six husky negroes awaited us, and we were soon bumping away over temporary spurs through the jungle to strike at length the relocation opposite the giant tree near Basso Bispo that marked the northern limit of our district. The PRR, you will recall, has been operating across the isthmus since 1855. When the United States took over the zone in 1904, it built a new double-tracked line of five-foot gauge for nearly the whole 47 miles. Much of this, however, runs through territory soon to be covered by Gatun Lake. Nearly all of the rest of it is on the wrong side of the canal. An almost entirely new line, therefore, is being built through the virgin jungle on the South American side of the canal, which is to be the permanent line and is known in zone parlance as the relocation. This is 49 miles in length from Panama to Cologne, and is single track only, as freight traffic especially is expected, very naturally, to be lighter after the canal is opened. Already that portion from the Chagres to the Atlantic has been put into use, on February 15th to be exact, and the time was not far off when the section within our district, from Gamboa to Pedro Miguel, would also be in operation. That portion runs through the wilderness a mile or more back from the canal, through jungled hills so dense with vegetation one could only make one's way through it with the ubiquitous machete of the native jungle dweller, except where tiny trails appear that led to squatters' thatched huts thrown together of tin, dynamite, and dry goods boxes, and jungle reeds in little scattered patches of clearing. Some of these hills have been cut half away for the new line, great generous cuts, for to the giant 90-ton steam shovels, a few hundred cubic yards of earth more or less is of slight importance. All else is virtually impenetrable jungle. Travelers by rail across the isthmus, 
as no doubt many ships' passengers will be in the years to come, while their steamer is being slowly raised and lowered to and from the 85-foot lake, will see little of the canal. A glimpse of the Basso Bispo cut at Gamboa, and a little else from the time till they leave Gatun until they return to the present line at Pedro Miguel Station. But in compensation, they will see some wondrous jungle scenery, a tangled tropical wilderness with great masses of bush flowers of brilliant hues, gigantic ferns, countless palm and banana trees, wonderfully slender arrow straight trees rising smooth and branchless more than a hundred feet to end in an immense bouquet of brilliant purplish hue blossoms. The boss barely noticed these things. One quickly grows accustomed to them. Why Americans who have been down on the zone for a year don't know there's a palm tree on the isthmus. Or at least they do not remember there were no palm trees in Keokuk, Iowa when they left there. Along this new graveled line, still unused except by work trains, we rode in our six Negro power car, dropping off in the gravel each time we caught sight of any species of human beings. Every little way was a gang, averaging some thirty men distinct in nationality. Antiguans shoveling gravel, Martiniques snarling and quarreling as they wallowed thigh-deep in swamps and pools, a company of Greeks unloading trainloads of ties, Spaniards leisurely but steadily grading and surfacing, track bands of spigotes chopping away the aggressive jungle with their machetes, the one task at which the native Panamanian, or Colombian as many still call themselves, is worth his brass check. Every here and there we caught labor's odds and ends, diminutive water boys, likewise of varying nationality, a negro switch boy dozing under the bit of shelter he had rigged up of jungle ferns, frightening many a black laborer speechless as we pounced upon him emerging from his soldiering in the jungle. Occasionally, even a native bushman on his way to market from his palm-thatched home generations old back in the bush, who has scarcely noticed yet that the canal is being dug, fell into our hands and was inexorably set down in spite of all protest, until he could prove beyond question that he had already been taken or lived beyond the zone line. Thus we scribbled incessantly on, even through the noon hour, dropping gangs one by one away from their tasks, shaking laborers out of the brief after-lunch siesta in a patch of shade. The boss was hampered by having only two languages where ten were needed. In the early afternoon, he went on to Paraiso to feed himself and the traction power while I held the fort. Soon after, rain fell, a sort of advance agent of the rainy season, a sudden tropical downpour that ran in rivulets down across the pink cardboards and my victims. Yet strange to note, the writing of the medium-soft pencil remained as clear and unsmudged as in the driest weather, and so clean a rain was it that it did not even soil my white cotton shirt. I continued unheeding, only to note with surprise a few minutes later that the sun was shining on the dense green jungle about me, as brilliantly as ever, and that I was dry again as when I had set out in the morning. The boss returned, and when I had eaten the crackers and the bottle of pink lemonade he brought, we pushed on toward the Pacific till at length in mid-afternoon we came to the top of the descent to Pedro Miguel and knew that the end of our district was at hand. So powerful was the breeze from the Atlantic that our six-man-power engine sweated profusely as they toiled against it, even on the downgrade of the return to Empire. To Scotty had been assigned my Empire recalls, and I had been given a new and virgin territory, namely the town of Paraiso. It lies somewhat back from the village street, that is, the PRR. Indeed, trains do not deign to notice its existence except on Sundays. But there is a temporary bridge over the canal which few engineers venture to snake her across at any great speed, and the enumerator housed in Empire need not even be a graduate hobo to be able to drop off there a bit after seven in the morning and prance away up the chamois path into the town. Wherever on the zone you espy a town of two-story skeleton screened buildings scattered over hills, with winding gravel roads and trees and flowers between, there, you may be sure, live American gold employees. Yet somehow the Canal Commission had dodged the monotony you expected. Somehow they have broken up the grim lines that make so dismal the best-intentioned factory town. There are hints that the builders have heard somewhere of the science of landscape gardening. At times, these same houses are deceiving, for all ICC buildings bear a strong family resemblance, and it is only at the door that you know whether it is a bachelor's quarters, a family residence, or the Supreme Court. From the outside world, 
Preso scarcely draws a glance of attention, but once in it you find a whole zone town with all the accustomed paraphernalia of ICC hotel and commissary, hospital and police station, all ruled over and held in check by the famous colonel in command of the latter. Moreover, Pariso will some day come again into her own when the relocation opens and brings her back on the main line, while proud Culebra and haughty empire, stranded on a railless shore of the canal, will wither and waste away, and even their broad macadamied roads will sink beneath a second-growth jungle. Renson had come to lend assistance. He set to work among the Negro cabins, the upper gallery seats of Pariso's amphitheater of hills, for Renson had been a free agent for more than a month now, and was not exactly in a condition to interview American housewives. My own task began down at the row of inhabited box cars, and so on through shacks and tenements with many Spanish laborers' wives. Then toward noon the labor train screamed in, with two gold coaches and many open cattle cars with long benches jammed with sweaty workmen, easily six hundred men in the six cars, who swept in upon the town like a flood through a suddenly opened sluiceway as the train barely paused and shrieked away again. Renson and I dashed for the laborers' mess halls, where hundreds of sun-bronzed foreigners, divided only as to color, packed pell-mell around a score of wooden tables heavily stocked with rough and tumble food, yet so different from the old French catch as catch can days, when each man owned his black pot and toiled all through the noon hour to cook himself an unsanitary lunch. We jotted them down at express speed, with changes of tongue so abrupt that our heads were soon reeling, and in the place where our mind should have been sounded only a confused, chaotic uproar like a wrangling within the covers of a polyglot dictionary. Then suddenly I landed a Russian. It was the final straw. I like to speak Spanish. I can endure the creaking of Turks attempting to talk Italian. I can bend an ear to the excruciating French of Martinique Negroes. I have boldly faced sputtering Arabs, but I will not run the risk of talking Russian. It was the second and last case during my census days when I was forced to call for interpretive assistance. At best, we caught only a small percentage at each table before the crowd had wolfed and melted away. An odd half dozen more, perhaps, we found stretched out in the shade under the mess hall and neighboring quarters before the imperative screech of the labor train whistle ended a scene that must be several times repeated, and now left us silent and alone to wander wet and weary to the nearest white bachelor's quarters, there to lie on our backs an hour or more till the polyglot jumble of words in the back of our heads had each climbed again to its proper shelf. Speaking of white bachelor quarters, therein lay the enumerator's greatest problem. The Spaniard or the Jamaican is in nine cases out of ten fluently familiar with his companion's antecedents and pedigree. He can generally furnish all the information of census department calls for but it is quite otherwise with the American bachelor. He may know his roommate's exact degree of skill at poker. He probably knows his private opinion of the colonel. He is sure to know his degree of enmity to the prohibition movement, but he is not at all certain to know his name, and rarely indeed has he the shadow of a notion when and in what particular corner of the states he began the game of existence. So loose are ties down on the zone that a man's roommate might go off into the jungle and die, and the former not dream of inquiring for him for a week especially we world wanderers, as are the large percentage of zoners, with virtually no fixed roots in any soil. Floating wherever the job suggests or the spirit moves, have the facts of our past in our own heads only. No wanderer of experience would dream of asking his fellow where he came from. The answer would be too apt to be from the last place. So difficult did this matter become that I gave up rushing for the bus to Pedro Miguel each evening and the even more distressing necessity of catching that premature 6.30 train each morning in Empire and, packing a sheet and pillow and toothbrush, moved down to Pariso, that I might spend the first half of the night in quest of these elusive bits of bachelor information. Meanwhile, the enrolling by day continued unabated. I had my first experience enumerating gold married quarters, white American families, just enough for experience and not enough to suffer severely. The enrolling of West Indians was pleasanter. The wives of locomotive engineers and steam shovel crane men were not infrequently supercilious ladies who resented being disturbed during their social functions, and lacked the training and politeness of Jamaican mammies. Living in paradise now under a parental all-providing government, they seemed to have forgotten the rolling pin days of the past. It was here in Pariso that I first encountered the strange, the wondrous, strange custom of lying about one's age. Negro women never did. 
What more absurd, uncalled-for piece of dishonesty? Does Mrs. Smith fear that Mrs. Jones next door will succeed in pumping out of me that capital bit of information? Little does she know, the long prison sentence add hard labor that stares me in the face for any such slip, to say nothing of my naturally incommunicative disposition. Or is she ashamed to let me know the truth? Unaware that all such information goes in at my ears and down my pencil to the pink card before me like a message over the wires, leaving no more trace behind. Surely she must know that I care not a pencil point, whether she is eighteen or fifty-two, nor remember which one minute after her screen door has slammed behind me, unless she has caused me to glance up in wonder at her silvering temples of thirty-five when she simpers twenty-two, and to set her down at forty to be on the safe side. Oh, now, please, ladies, do not understand me as accusing the American wives of Pariso in general of this weakness. The large majority were quite pleasant, frank, and overflowing with cheery good sense. But the percentage who were not was far larger than I, who am also an American, was pleased to find it. But doubly astonishing were the few cases of lying by proxy. A clean-cut, college-graduated civil engineer of 32, whom one would have cited as an example of the best type of American, gave all data concerning himself in an unimpeachable manner. His wife was absent. When the question of her age arose, he gave it, with the slightest catch in his voice, as twenty. Now that might be all very well. Men of thirty-two are occasionally so fortunate as to marry girls of twenty. But a moment later, the gentleman in question finds himself announcing that his wife has been living on the zone with him since 1907, and that she was born in New England. Thus is, he tripped over his own clothesline. For New England girls do not marry at fifteen, mother would not let them, even if they would. I, too, had gradually worked my way high up among the nondescript cabins on the upper rim of Pariso, that seem on the very verge of pitching headlong into the noisy, smoky canal far below with the jar of the next explosion, when one sunny mid-afternoon I caught sight of Renson dejectedly trudging down across what might be called the Maiden of Pariso, back of the two-story lodge hall. I took leave of my ebony hostess and descended. Renson's troubles were indeed disheartening. Back in the jungled fringe of town he had fallen into a swarm of Martiniques, and Renson's French being nothing more than an unstudied mixture of English and Spanish, he had not gathered much information. Moreover, Negro women from the French Isles are enough to frighten any virtuous young Marine. "'What's the sense of me trying to chew the fat in French?' said Renson, with tears in his voice. I ain't in no condition to work at this census business any longer anyway. I ain't got to bed before three in the morning this week. In his air was open suggestion that it was someone else's fault. Some day I'll be getting in bad, too. This morning, a full nigger woman asked me if I didn't want her black picking any I was enumerating, thinking it was a good joke. You know how these bush kids is running around all over the country before a white man's brat could walk on its hind legs. Yes, I says, if I was going alligator hunting and needed bait. I came near catching that brat up by the feet and beating its can off. I'm out of luck anyway, and... The fact is, Renson was aching to be fired. More than thirty days had he been subject only to his own will, and it was high time he returned to the nursery discipline of camp. Moreover, he was out of cigarettes. I slipped him one and smoothed him down as its fumes grew, for Renson was tractable as a child, rightly treated, and set him to taking Jamaican tenements in the center of town while I struck off into the jungled Martinique hills myself. There were signs abroad that the census job was drawing to a close. My first payday had already come and gone, and I had strolled up the gravel walk one noonday to the disembursing office with my yellow pay certificate duly initialed by the examiner of accounts, and was handed my first four twenty-dollar gold pieces, for hotel and commissary books sadly reduce a good paycheck. Already one evening I had entered the census office to find the boss just peeling off his sweat-dripping undershirt and dotted with skin-pricking jungle life after a day mule-back on the thither side of the canal. An utterly fruitless day, for not only had he failed during eight hours of plunging through the wilderness to find a single hut, not already decorated with the enumerated tag, but not even a banana could he lay hands on when the noon hour overhauled him far from the ministrations of Ben and the breeze-swept veranda of Empire Hotel. It was, I believe, the afternoon following Renson's linguistic troubles that the boss came jogging into Pariso on his sturdy mule. In his eagerness to clean up the territory, we fell to corralling Negroes everywhere, in the streets, at work, buying their supplies at the commissary, sleeping in the shade of wayside trees, anywhere and everywhere, 
until, at last in his excitement, the boss let his medium-soft pencil slip by the column for color and dashed down the abbreviation for mixed after the question. Married or single, which may have been near enough the truth of the case, but suggested it was time to quit. So we marked Pariso, finished except for recalls, and returned to Empire. One by one, our fellow enumerators had dropped by the wayside, some by mutual agreement, some without any agreement whatever. Renson was now relieved from census duty to his great joy. There remained but four of us, the boss and Mac in the office, Scotty and I outside. A deep conference ensued, and, as if I had not had good luck enough already, it was decided that we two should go through the cut itself. It was like offering us a salary to view all the great work in detail, for virtually all the excavation of any importance on the zone lay within the confines of our district. So one day, Scotty and I descended at the girderless railroad bridge and, taking each one side of the canal, set out to canvas its every nook and cranny. The canal, as it then stood, was about the width of two city blocks, an immense chasm piled and tumbled with broken rock and earth, in the center a ditch already filled with grimy water, on either side several levels of rough rock ledges with sheer rugged stone faces, for the hills were being cut away in layers, each far above the other. High above us rose the jagged walls of the cut, with towns hanging by their fingernails all along its edge, and ahead in the abysmal, smoky distance the great channel gashed through Calubra Mountain. End of chapter 4, part 1 Chapter 4, part 2 of Zone Policeman 88 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand Zone Policeman 88, A Close-Range Study of the Panama Canal and Its Workers by Harry A. Frank Chapter 4, Part 2 The different levels varied from 10 to 20 feet, one above the other, each with a railroad on it, back and forth along which incessantly rumbled and screeched dirt trains full or empty, halting before the steam shovels that shivered and spouted thick black smoke as they ate away the rocky hills and cast them in great giant hands full on the train of one-sided flat cars that moved forward bit by bit at the flourish of the conductor's yellow flag. Steam shovels that seemed human in all except their mammoth fearless strength tore up the solid rock with snorts of rage and the panting of industry, now and then flinging some troublesome, stubborn boulder angrily upon the cars. Yet they could be dainty as human fingers, too, could pick up a railroad spike or push a rock gently an inch further across the car. Each was run by two white Americans, or at least what would prove such when they reached the shower bath in their quarters. The craneman far out on the shovel arm, the engineer within the machine itself with a labyrinth of levers demanding his unbroken attention. Then there was, of course, a gang of Negroes, firemen and the like attached to each shovel. All the day through I climbed and scrambled back and forth between the different levels, dodging from one track to another and along the rocky floor of the canal, needing eyes and ears both in front and behind, not merely for trains, but for a hundred hidden and unknown dangers to keep the nerves taut. Now and then a palatial motor car, like some railroad breed of taxi, sped by with its musical, insistent, jingling bells, usually with one of the countless parties of government guests or tourists in spotless white which the dry season brings. Dirt trains kept the right of way, however, for the work always comes first at Panama. Or it might be the famous yellow car itself with members of the commission. Once it came all but empty, and there dropped off inconspicuously a man in baggy duck trousers, a black alpaca coat of many wrinkles, and an unassuming straw hat, a white-haired man with blue, almost babyish blue eyes, a cigarette dangling from his lips as he strolled about with restless yet quiet energy. There has been no flash and glitter of military uniforms on the zone since the French sailed for home, but everyone knew the colonel for all that, the soldier who has never seen service, who has never heard the shrapnel scream by overhead, yet to whom the world owes more thanks than six conquering generals rolled into one. Scores of tripod and star drills Whole battalions of deafening machines run by compressed air brought from miles away are pounding and grinding and jamming holes in the living rock. After them will presently come nonchalantly strolling along gangs of the ubiquitous black powder men and carelessly throw down boxes of dynamite and pound the drill holes full thereof and tamp them down ready to blow at 11.30 and 5.30 
when the workmen are out of range. Those mighty explosions that, twelve times a week, set the porch chairs of every ICC house on the isthmus to rocking, and are heard far out at sea. Anywhere near the drills is such a roaring and jangling that I must bellow at the top of my voice to be heard at all. The entire gamut of sound waves surrounds and enfolds me, and with it all the powerful Atlantic breeze sweeps deafeningly through the channel. Down in the bottom of the canal, if one step behind anything that shuts off the breeze, it is tropically hot. Yet up on the edge of the chasm above, the trees are always nodding and bowing before the ceaseless wind from off the Caribbean. Scores of switcheroos drowse under their sheet iron wigwams, erected not so much as protection from the sun, for the drowsers are mostly negroes and immune to that, as from young rocks that the dynamite blasts frequently toss a quarter mile. Then over it all hang heavy clouds of soft coal dust from trains and shovels, shifting down upon the black, white, and mixed, and the enumerator alike, a dirty, noisy, perilous, enjoyable job. Everywhere are gangs of men, sometimes two or three gangs working together at the same task. Shovel gangs, track gangs, surfacing gangs, dynamite gangs. Gangs doing everything imaginable with shovel and pick and crowbar. Gangs down on the floor of the canal, gangs far up the steep walls of cut rock, Gangs stretching away in either direction, till those far off look like upright bands of the leaf-cutting ants of Panamanian jungles. Gangs nearly all, whatever their nationality, in the blue shirts and khaki trousers of the zone commissary, giving a peculiar color scheme to all the scene. Now and then the boss is a stony-eyed American with a black cigar clamped between his teeth. More often he is of the same nationality as the workers, quite likely from the same town, who jabbers a little imitation English which is one of the reasons why a force of time inspectors is constantly dodging in and out over the job, time book and pencil in hand, lest some fellow townsman of the boss be earning his $1.50 a day under the shade of a tree back in the jungle. Here are Basques and their boinas, preferring their native Esquara to Spanish, French niggers and English niggers, whom it is to the interest of peace and order to keep as far apart as possible. Occasionally a few sunburned blonde men in a shovel gang, but they prove to be Teutons or Scandinavians, laborers of every color and degree, except American labors, more than conspicuous by their absence. For the American Negro is an untractable creature in large numbers, and the caste system that forbids white Americans from engaging in common labor side by side with Negroes is to be expected in an enterprise of which the leaders are not only military men, but largely Southerners, however many may be shivering in the streets of Chicago or roaming hungrily through the byways of St. Louis. It is well so, perhaps. None of us who feels an affection for the zone would wish to see its atmosphere lowered from what it is to the brutal depths of our railroad construction camps in the States. The attention of certain state legislatures might advantageously be called to the zone's Spaniard's drinking cup. It is really a tin can on the end of a long stick, cover and all. The top is a punched sieve-like that the water may enter as it is dipped in the bucket with which the water boy strains along. In the bottom is a single small hole out of which spurts into the drinker's mouth a little stream of water as he holds it high above his head, as once he drank wine from his leather bota in far-off Spain. Many a Spanish gang comes entirely from the same town, notably Salamanca or Avila. I set them to staring and chattering by some simple remark about their birthplace. Fine view from the Paseo del Rastro, eh? Does the Puente Romano still cross the river? But I had soon to see such personalities, for picks and shovels lay idle as long as I remained in sight, and Uncle Sam was the loser. So many were the gangs that I advanced barely half a mile during this first day, and lost in my work forgot the hour until it was suddenly recalled by the insistent, strident tooting of whistles that forewarns the setting off of the dynamite charges from the little red electric boxes along the edge of the cut. I turned back towards Pariso, and, all but stumbling over little red wound wires everywhere on the ground, dodging in and out, running forward, halting or suddenly retreating, I worked my way gradually forward while all the world about me was upheaving and spouting and belching forth to the heavens, as if I had been caught in the crater of a volcano as it suddenly erupted without warning. The history of Panama is strewn with dynamite stories. Even the French had theirs in their 16% of the excavation of Culebra. In American annals, there is one for every week. Three days before, one of my empire friends set off one afternoon for a stroll through the cut he had not seen for a year. In a retired spot, he came upon two Negroes pounding an irregular bundle. 
What are you doing, boys? He inquired with idle curiosity. Just a brelden up this year dynamite, boss, languidly answered one of the blacks. My friend was one of those apprehensive, overcautious fellows, so rare on the zone. Without so much as taking his leave, he set off at a run. Some two car lengths beyond, an explosion pitched him forward and all but lifted him off his feet. When he looked back, the negroes had left. Indeed, neither of them has reported for work since. Then there was Mac's case. In his ambition for census efficiency, Mac was in the habit of stopping workmen wherever he met them. One day, he encountered a Jamaican carrying a box of dynamite on his head, and, according to his custom, shouted, Hey, boy! Had your census taken yet? What that, boss? cried the Jamaican with wide open eyes as he threw the box at Mac's feet and stood at respectful attention. Somehow, Mac lacked a bit of his old zealousness thereafter. On the second day, I pushed past Cucaracha, scene of the greatest slide in the history of the canal when 47 acres went into the cut, burying under untold tons of earth and rock, steam shovels and railroads. Star and tripod drills and all else in sight except the roughnecks, who are far too fast on their feet to be buried against their will. One by one, I dragged shovel gangs away to a distance where my shouting could be heard. One by one, I commanded drill men to shut off their deafening machines. All day, I dodged switching, snorting trains, clambered by steep, rocky paths or ladders from one level to another, howling above the roar of the cut, the time-worn questions, straining my ear to catch the answer. Many a Negro did not know the meaning of the word census and must have it explained to him in words of one syllable. Many a time I climbed to some lofty rock ledge lined with drills and gesticulating like a semaphore in signal practice, caught at last the wandering attention of a Negro to shout sore-throated above the incessant pounding of machines and the roaring of the Atlantic breeze. Hello, boy, sense is taken yet. A long stare, then, at last, perhaps the answer. Oh, yes, sir, boss. When and where? In Spanish town, Jamaica three year ago, sir which was not an attempt to be facetious, but an answer in all seriousness. Why should not one census, like one baptism, suffice for a lifetime? It was fortunate that enumerators were not accustomed to carry deadly weapons. Quick changes from Negro to Spanish gangs demonstrated beyond all future question how much more native intelligence has the white man. Rarely did I need to ask a Spaniard a question twice, still less ask him to repeat the answer. His replies came back sharp and swift as a pelota from a cesta. West Indians not only must hear the question an average of three times, but could seldom give the simplest information clearly enough to be intelligible, though ostensibly speaking English. A Spanish card one might fill out and be gone in less time than the Negro could be roused from his racial torpor. Yet of the Spaniards on the zone, surely 70% were wholly illiterate, while the Negroes from the British West Indies, thanks to their good fortune in being ruled over by the world's best colonist, could almost invariably read and write. Many of those shoveling in the cut have been trained in trigonometry. Few are the zoners now who do not consider the Spaniard the best workman ever imported in all the 65 years from the railroad surveying to the completion of the canal. The stocky, muscle-bound little fellows come no longer to America as conquistadors, but to shovel dirt, and yet more cheery, willing workers, more law-abiding subjects are scarcely to be found. It is unfortunate we could not have imported Spaniards for all the canal work. Even they have naturally learned some soldiering from example of lazy Negroes, who, where laborers must be had, are a bit better than no labor, though not much. The third day came, and high above me towered the rock cliffs of Culebra's palm-crowned hill, steam shovels approaching the summit in echelon, here and there an incipient earth and rock slide dribbling warningly down. He who still fancies the digging of the canal an ordinary task should have tramped with us through just our section, halting to speak to every man in it, climbing out of this man-made cannon twice a day, a strenuous climb even near its end, while at Culebra one looks up at all but unscalable mountain walls on either side. From time to time we hear murmurs from abroad that Americans are making light of catastrophes on the isthmus, that they cover up their great disasters by strict censorship of news. The latter is mere absurdity. As to catastrophes, a great slide or a premature dynamite explosion are serious disaster to Americans on the job, just as they would be to Europeans. But whereas the continental European would sit down before the misfortune and weep, the American swears a round oath, spits on his hands, and pitches in to shovel the slide out again. 
He isn't belittling the disasters. It is merely that he knows the canal has got to be dug and goes ahead and digs it. That is the greatest thing on the zone. Amid all the childish snarling of spigotties, the backbiting of Europe, the congressional wrangles, the cabinet politics, the man on the job, the colonel, the average American, the roughneck, goes right on digging the canal day by day as if he had never heard a rumor of all this outside noise. Mighty is the job from one point of view, yet tiny from another. With all his enormous equipment, his peerless ingenuity, and his feverish activity, all little man has succeeded in doing is to scratch a little surface wound in Mother Earth, cutting open a few superficial veins of water that trickle down the rocky face of the cut. By March 12th, we had carried our task past and under Empire Suspension Bridge, and the end of the cut was almost in sight. That day I clawed and scrambled a score of times up the face of rock walls. I zigzagged through long rows of negroes pounding holes in rock ledges. I stumbled and splashed my way through gangs of Martinique muckers. I slid down the face of government-made cliffs on the seat of my commissary breeches. I fought my way up again to stalk through long lines of men picking away at the dizzy edge of sheer precipices. I rolled down in the sand and rubble of what threatened to develop into slides. I crawled under snorting steam shovels to drag out besooted negroes. Negro so besooted, I had to ask them their color. While dodging the gigantic swinging shovel itself, to say nothing of Dahobe blasts and rocks of the size of drummer's trunks that spilled from it as it swung. I climbed up into the quivering monster itself to interpret the engineer at his levers to shout at the crane man on his beam. I sprang aboard every train that was not running at full speed, walking along the running board into the cab, if not to get the engineer at least to gain new life from his private ice water tank. I scrambled over tenders and quarter miles of Lidgerwood flats piled high with broken rock and earth, to scream at the American conductor and his black brakeman, often to find myself, by the time I had set down one of them, carried entirely out of my district, to Pedro Miguel or beyond the Chagra, to have to hit the grit in hobo fashion and catch something back to the spot where I left off. In short, I poked into every corner of the cut known to man, bawling in the November 1st voice of a presidential candidate to everything in trousers. Hey, had your senses taken yet? And what was my reward? From the northern edge of Empire to where the cut sinks away into the Chagra and the low, flat country beyond, I enrolled just 13 persons. It was then and there, though it still lacked an hour of noon, that I ceased to be a census enumerator. With slow and deliberate step, I climbed out of the canal and across a pathed field to Basabispo, and sitting down in the shade of her station, patiently awaited the train that would carry me back to Empire. 4,667 zone residents had I enrolled during those six weeks. Something over half of these were Jamaican. Of the states, Pennsylvania was best represented. Martinique Negroes, Greeks, Spaniards, and Panamanians were some 80% illiterate. Of some 300 of the first, only a half dozen even claimed to read and write, and non-wedlock was virtually universal among them. Rumor has it that there are 72 separate states and dependencies represented on the isthmus. My own cards showed a few less. Most conspicuous absences, besides American Negroes, were natives of Honduras, of four countries of South America, of most of Africa, and of entire Australia. That this was largely due to chance was shown by the fact that my fellow enumerators found persons from all these countries. I had enrolled persons born in the following places all the United States except three or four states in the far northwest, Canada, Mexico, Guatemala, Salvador, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Panama, Canal Zone, Colombia, Venezuela, British Guiana, Demerara, French and Dutch Guiana, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, and Chile, Cuba, Haiti, and Santo Domingo, Jamaica, Barbados, St. Vincent, Trinidad, St. Lucia, Montserrat, Dominica, Nevis, Nassau, Eleutheria, and in Agua, Martinique, Guadalupe, St. Thomas, Danish West Indies, Curacao and Tobago, England, Ireland, Scotland, Holland, Finland, Belgium, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Russia, France, Spain, Andorra, Portugal, Switzerland, Germany, Italy, Austria, Hungary, Greece, Serbia, Turkey, Canary Islands, Syria, Palestine, Arabia, India, from Tutacoran to Lahore, China, Japan, Egypt, Sierra Leone, South Africa, and the High Seas. 
Where are you born, boy? I had run across a wrinkled old negro who had worked more than thirty years for the PRR. Deed I don't know, boss. Oh, come, don't you know where you were born? For God, boss, I's telling you the truth. I don't know, cause I was born to see. Well, what country are you a subject of? Truly, I can't say, boss. Well, what nationality was your father? I never see him, sir. Well, then, where the devil did you first land after you were born? Deed, I can't say, boss. Tink it were one of dem islands. Reckon I's a subject of the world, boss. Weeks afterward, the population of Uncle Sam's 10 by 50 mile strip of tropics was found to have been on February 1st, 1912, 62,810. No, anxious reader, I am not giving away inside information. The source of my remarks is the public prints. Of these, about 25,000 were British subjects, West Indian Negroes with very few exceptions. Of the entire population, 37,428 were employed by the U.S. government. Of white Americans, of the Brahmin caste of the gold rule, there were employed on the zone, but 5,228. End of chapter 4, part 2. Chapter 5, Part 1 of Zone Policeman 88. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Zone Policeman 88, A Close-Range Study of the Panama Canal and Its Workers, by Harry A. Frank. Chapter 5, Part 1. Police headquarters presented an unusual air of preoccupation next morning. In the corner office, the telephone rang often and imperatively. Several times erect figures in khaki and broad Texas hats flashed by the doorway. The drone of earnest conference sounded a few minutes, and the figures flashed as suddenly out again into the world. In the inner office, I glanced once more in review through the rules and regulations. The zone, too, was now familiar ground, and as for the third requirement for a policeman, to know the zone residents by sight, a strange face brought me to a start of surprise, unless it beamed above the garb that shouted, Tourist. Now all I needed was a few hours of conference and explanation on the duties, rights, and privileges of policemen, and that, of course, would come as soon as leisure again settled down over headquarters. Musing which I was suddenly startled to my feet by the captain appearing in the doorway. Catch the next train to Balboa, he said. You've got four minutes. You'll find Lieutenant Long on board. Here are the people to look out for. He thrust into my hands a slip of paper. From another direction there was tossed at me a new brass check, and first-class private, police badge number 88, and I was racing down through Ancon. In the meadow below the Trivoli, I risked time to glance at the piece of paper. On it were the names of an ex-president and two ministers of a frowsy little South American republic, during whose rule a former president and his henchmen had been brutally murdered by a popular uprising in the very capital itself. In the first-class coach I found Lieutenant Long, towering so far above all his surroundings as to have been easily recognized even had he not been in uniform. Beside him sat Corporal Castillo of the Plain Clothes Squad, a young man of forty, with a high forehead, a stubby black mustache, and a chin that was decisive without being aggressive. Now here's the captain's idea, explained the lieutenant as the train swung away around Ancon Hill. We'll have to take turns mounting guard over them, of course. I'll have to talk Spanish, and nobody will have to look at Castillo more than once to know he was born in some crack in the Andes. Which was one of the lieutenant's jokes, for the corporal, though a Colombian, was as white, sharp-witted, and energetic as any American on the zone. But no one to look at him would suspect that, for French, is it? Frank. Oh, yes. That Frank could speak Spanish. We'll do our best to inflate that impression, and when it comes your turn at guard mount, you can probably let several things of interest drift in at your ears. I left headquarters before the captain had time to explain, I suggested. Oh, said the lieutenant. Well, here it is in a spectacle case, as our friend Kipling would put it. We're on our way to Calabra Island. There are now in quarantine there three men who arrived yesterday from South America. They are members of the party of the murdered president. Today there will arrive, and also be put in hock, the three gents whose names you have there. Now we have a private inside hunch that the three already here have come up particularly and specifically to prepare for the funeral of the three who are arriving, which is no hair off our brows, 
except it's up to us to see they don't pull off any little stunts of that kind on zone territory. At least this police business was starting well. If this was a sample, it would be a real job. The train had stopped, and we were climbing up the steps of Balboa Police Station, for without the cooperation of the Admiral of the Pacific Fleet, we could not reach Calabra Island. By the way, I suppose you're well armed? asked the lieutenant in his high, querulous voice, as we drank a last round of ice water preparatory to setting out again. Um, I've got a fountain pen, I replied. I haven't been a policeman twenty minutes yet, and I was appointed in a hurry. Fine, cried the admiral sarcastically, snatching open the door of a closet beside the desk. With a warm job like this on hand, you know what these South Americans are. With a wink at the lieutenant that was meant also for Castillo, who stood with his felt hat on the back of his head and a faraway look in his eyes. Yeah, mighty dangerous, around meal time, said the corporal, though at the same time he drew from a hip pocket a worn leather holster containing a revolver and examined it intently. Meanwhile, the admiral had handed me a massive number 88 Colt with holster, a box of cartridges, and a belt that might easily have served as a horse's saddle girth. When I had buckled it on under my coat, the armament felt like a small boy clinging about my waist. We trooped on down a sort of railroad junction with a score of abandoned wooden houses. It was here I had first landed on the zone one blazing Sunday nearly two months before, and tramped away for some miles on a rusty sandy track along a canal already filled with water, till a short jungle path led me into my first zone town. Already that seemed ancient history. The police launch, manned by Negro prisoners, with the admiral in a cushioned armchair at the wheel, was soon scudding away across the sunlit harbor, the breakwater building of the spoil of the Calabra cut on our left, ahead the cluster of small islands being torn to pieces for Uncle Sam's fortifications. The steamer being not yet sighted, we put in at Dallas Island, where the bulky policeman in charge led us to dinner at the ICC Hotel, during which the noonday blasting on the zone came dully across to us. Soon after, we were landing at the cement sidewalk of the island, where I had been a prisoner for a day in January, as my welcome to U.S. territory, and were being greeted by the pocket-edition doctor and the bay-windowed German who had been my wardens on that occasion. We found the conspirators at a table in a corridor of the first-class quarantine station, and the words of Lieutenant Long, they fully looked the part, being of distinctly merciless cut of jib. They were roughly dressed and without collars, convincing proof of some nefarious design, for when the Latin American entitled to wear them leaves off his white collar and his cane, he must be desperate indeed. We braced them at once, marching down upon them as they were murmuring with heads together over a mass of typewritten sheets. The corporal was delegated to inform them in his most urbane and hiligazeco Castilian that we were well acquainted with their errand and that we were come to frustrate, by any legitimate means in our power, the consummation of any such project on American territory. When the first paralyzed stare of astonishment that plans they had fancied locked to their own breasts were known to others, was somewhat subsided, one of them assumed spokesmanship. In just as courtly and superabundant language, he replied that they were only too well aware of the inadvisability of carrying out any act against its sovereignty on U.S. soil, that so long as they were on American territory, they would conduct themselves in a most circumspect and calaboroso manner. But, he concluded, in the most public street of Panama City, the first time we meet those three dogs, we shall spit in their faces. That's all, not a boss. And the blazing eyes announced all too plainly what he meant by that figure of speech. That was all very well, was our smiling urbane reply. But to be on the safe side, and merely as a matter of custom, we were under the unfortunate necessity of requesting them to submit to the annoyance of having their baggage and persons examined, with a view to discovering what weapons. Como non, senores? All the examination you desire which was exceedingly kind of them. Whereupon, when the lieutenant had interpreted to me their permission, we fell upon them and amid countless expressions of mutual esteem gave them and their baggage such a frisking as befalls a kaifir, leaving a South African diamond mine, and found them armed with a receipt from the quarantine doctor for one pearl-handled Smill and Wilson number 32. Either they really intended to postpone their little fare until they reached Panama, or they had succeeded in concealing their weapons elsewhere. The doctor and his assistant were already being rowed out to the steamer that was to bring the victims. They were to be lodged in a room across the corridor from the conspirators, which corridor it would be our simple duty to patrol with a view to intercepting any exchange of stray lead. 
we fell to planning such division of the twenty-four hours as should give me the most talkative period. The lieutenant took the trouble further to convince the trio of my total ignorance of Spanish by a distinct and elaborate explanation, in English, of the difference between the words muchacho and muchacha. Then we wandered down past the grimy steerage station to the shore end of the little wharf to await the doctor and our protégés. The ocean breeze swept unhampered across the island. On its rocky shore sounded the dull rumble of waves, for the sea was rolling a bit now. The swelling tide covered, inch by inch, a sandy ridge that connected us with another island, gradually drowning beneath its waters several rusty old hulls. A little rocky wooded isle to the left cut off the future entrance to the canal. Some miles away across the bay on the lower slope of a long hill drowsed the city of Panama in brilliant sunshine, and beyond, the hazy mountainous country stretched southwestward to be lost in the molten horizon. On a distant hill, some Indian was burning off a patch of jungle to plant his corn. Meanwhile, the lieutenant and the corporal had settled some Lombroso proposition and fallen to reciting poetry. The former, who was evidently a lover of melancholy, mouth-filling verse, was declaiming the raven to the open sea. I listened in wonder. Was this, then, police talk? I had expected rough, untaught fellows whose conversation at best would be pornographic rather than poetic. My astonishment swelled to the bursting point when the Columbian not only caught up the poem where the lieutenant left off, but topped it off with that peerless translation by Bernard de Venezuelan, beginning, Una fosca media noche, cuando e triste reflexiones, sombre ma da un rabo, in folio de ovidiados cronicones. And just then the quarantine launch swung around the neighboring island. I tightened my horse belt and dragged the colt around within easy reach, and a moment later the doctor and his bulking understudy stepped ashore, alone. They didn't come said the former. They were not allowed to leave their own country. Hell and damnation, said the lieutenant at length in a calm conversational tone of voice, with the air of a small boy who has been wantonly robbed of a long-promised holiday, but who is determined not to make a scene over it. The corporal seemed indifferent, and stood with a faraway look in his eyes, as if he were already busy with some other plans or worries. But then the corporal was married, as for myself, I had somehow felt from the first that it was too good to be true. Adventure has steadily dogged me all my days. A half hour later we were pitching across the bay toward Ancon Hill, scaled bare on one end by the work of fortification like a Hindu haircut. The water came spinning in board now and then, and dejected silence reigned within the craft. But spirits gradually revived, and before we could make out the details of the wharf, the corporal's hearty, genuine laughter and the lieutenant's rousing cacahata were again drifting across the water. At Balboa, I unburdened myself of my shooting hardware and, catching the labor train, was soon mounting the graveled walk to Ancom Police Station. In the second-story squad room of the bungalow were eight beds, for there were more than enough policemen to go around, and the legal occupant of the bunk I fell asleep in returned from duty at midnight, and I transferred to the still warm nest of a man on the graveyard shift. It's custom to put a man in uniform for a while first before assigning him to plain clothes duty, the inspector was saying next morning when I finished the oath of office that had been omitted in the haste of my appointment. But we have waived that in your case because of the knowledge of the zone the census must have given you. Thus casually was I robbed of the opportunity to display my manly form in uniform to tourists of the trains and the Trivoli. Tourists, I say, because the zoners would never have noticed it. But we must all accept the decrees of fate. That was the full extent of the inspector's remarks. No mention whatever of the sundry little points the recruit is anxious to be enlightened upon. In government jobs, one learns those details by experience. For the time being, there was nothing for me to do but to descend to the gumshoe desk in Encon Station and sit in a swivel chair opposite Lieutenant Long, waiting for orders. Toward noon, a thought struck me. I swung the telephone around and got the inspector. All my junk is up in Empire yet, I remarked. All right. Tell the deskman down there to make you out a pass. Or, hold the wire. As long as you're going out, there's a prisoner over in Panama that belongs of an empire. Go over and tell the chief you want Tal Fulano. I worked my way through the fawning, neck-craning, mini-shaded mob of political henchmen and obsequious petitioners into the sacred, hushed precincts of Panama Police Headquarters. A pouched spigotti with a shifty eye behind large bowed glasses vainly striving to exude dignity and wisdom, 
received me with the oily smirk of the Panamanian officeholder who feels the painful necessity of keeping on outwardly good terms with all Americans. I flashed my badge and mentioned a name. A few moments later there was presented to me a sturdy, if somewhat flabby, young Spaniard, carefully dressed and perfumed. We bowed like lifelong acquaintances, and stepping down to the street, entered a cab. The prisoner, which he was now only a name, was a muscular fellow with whom I should have fared badly in personal combat. I was wholly unarmed and in a foreign land. All these sundry little unexplained points of a policeman's duty were bubbling up within me. When the prisoner turned to remark it was a warm day, should I warn him that anything he said would be used against him? When he ordered the driver to halt before the Panazone, that he might speak to some friends, should I fiercely countermand the order? What was my duty when the friends handed him some money and a package of cigars? Suppose he should start to follow his friends inside to have a drink. But he didn't. We drove languidly on down the avenue and up into Ancon, where I heaved a genuine sigh of relief as we crossed the unmarked street that made my badge good again. The prisoner was soon behind padlocks, and the money and cigars in the station safe. These, and him, and the transfer card, I took again with me into the foreign republic in time for the evening train. But he seemed even more anxious than I to attract no attention, and once an empire requested that we take the shortest and most inconspicuous route to the police station, and my responsibility was soon over. Many were the ZP facts I picked up during the next few days in the swivel chair. The Zone Police Force of 1912 consisted of a chief of police, an assistant chief, two inspectors, four lieutenants, eight sergeants, twenty corporals, one hundred and seventeen first-class policemen, and one hundred and sixteen policemen. West Indian Negroes, without exception, though none but an American citizen would aspire to any white position, not to mention five clerks at headquarters who are quite worth the mentioning. Policemen wore the same uniform as first-class officers, with khaki-covered helmet instead of Texas hat, and canvas instead of leather leggings, drew one half the pay of a white private, were not eligible for advancement, and with some few notable exceptions, were noted for what they did know and the facility with which they could not learn. One inspector was in charge of detective work, and the other an overseer of the uniformed force. Each of the lieutenants was in charge of one-fourth of the zone with headquarters respectively at Ancon, Empire, Gorgana, and Cristobal, and the substations within these districts in charge of sergeants, corporals, or experienced privates, according to importance. Years ago, when things were yet in primeval chaos, and the memorable 6th of February, 1904, was still well above the western horizon, there was gathered together for the protection of the newly born canal strip a band of bad men from our ferocious southwest, warranted to feed on criminals each breakfast time, and in command of a man-eating rough rider. But somehow the bad men seemed unable to transplant to this new and richer soil the banefulness which had thrived so successfully in the land of sagebrush and cactus. The gormandizing promised to be chiefly at the criminal tables, and before long it was noted that the noxious gentlemen were gradually drifting back to their native sand dunes, and the rough riding gave way to a more orderly style of horsemanship. Then, bit by bit, some men, just men, without any qualifying adjective whatever, began to get mixed up in the matter. One after another, army lieutenants were detailed to help the thing along, until by and by they got the right army lieutenant and the right men, and the ZP grew to what it is today. Not the love, perhaps, but the pride of every zoner whose name cannot be found on some old blotter. There are a number of ways of getting on the force. There is the broad and general highway of being appointed in Washington and shipped down like a nice fresh vegetable in the original package and delivered just as it left the garden without the pollution of alien hands. Then there's the big, impressive, broad-shouldered fellow with some life and military service behind him, and the papers to prove it who turns up on the zone and can't help getting on if he takes the trouble to climb to the headquarters. Or there are the special cases, like Marley, for instance. Marley blew in one summer day from some uncharted point of the compass with nothing but his hat and a winning smile on his brassy features, and naturally soon drifted up the thousand stairs. But Marley wasn't exactly of that manly build that takes the chief and the captain by storm, and there were suggestions on his young old face that he had seen perhaps a trifle too much of life so he wiped the sweat from his brow several times at the third-story landing, only to find as often that the expected vacancy was not yet. Meanwhile, the tropical days slipped idly by, and Marley's stand-in, with the owners of the ICC hotel books, began to strain and threaten to break away, and everything sort of gave up the ghost and died. 
everything, that is, except the winning smile. Till one afternoon, with only that asset left, Marley met the department head on the grass-bordered path in front of the Episcopal Chapel, just where the long descent ends and a man begins to regain his tractical mood, and said Marley, Say, look here, Chief. It's a question of eats with me. We can't put this thing off much longer, or... Which is why that evening's train carried Marley, with the police badge and the little flat volume bound in imitation leather in his pocket, out to some substation commander along the line for the corporal in charge to break in and hammer down into that finished product, a zone policeman. Incidentally, Marley also illustrated some months later one of the special ways of getting off the force. It was still simpler. Going on pass to Cologne to spend a little evening, Marley neglected to leave his number 38 behind in the squad room, according to ZP rules, which was careless of him. For when his spirits reached that stage where he recognized what sport it would be to see the spigoty policeman of Bottle Alley dance a western can-can, he bethought him of the number 38, which accounts for the fact that the name of Marley can no longer be found on the rolls of the ZP. But all this is sadly anticipating. Obviously, you will say, a force recruited from such a dissimilar sources must be a thing of wide and sundry experience. And obviously you are right. Could a man catch up the ZP by the slack of the khaki riding breeches and shake out their stories as a giant in need of car fare might shake out their loose change? Then might he retire to some sunny hillside of his own and build him a soundproof house with a swimming pool and a revolving bookcase and a stable of riding horses and cause to be erected on the front lawn a kneeling place where publishers might come and bow down and beat their foreheads on the pavement. End of Chapter 5, Part 1 Recording by Todd Chapter 5, Part 2 of Zone Policeman 88 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Zone Policeman 88, A Close-Range Study of the Panama Canal and Its Workers, by Harry A. Frank. Chapter 5, Part 2 There are men in the ZP who in former years have played horse with the startled markets of great American cities men whose voices will boom forth in the pulpit and whisper sage counsels in the professional in years to come, men whose doting parents have sent to Harvard, on whom it failed to take except on their clothes, men who have gone down into the valley of the shadow of death and crawled on hands and knees through the brackish red brook that runs at the bottom and come out again smiling on the brink above, careers more varied than Mexican sombreros one might hear in any ZP squad room were not the ZP so much more given to action than to autobiography. They bore little resemblance to what I had expected. My mental picture of an American policeman was that conglomerate average one unconsciously imbibes from a distant view of our city forces, and by comparison with foreign, a heavy-footed, discordious, half-fanatical, half-irregular clubber whose wits are as slow as his judgment is honest. Instead of which I found the ZP composed almost without exception of good-hearted, well-set-up young Americans, almost all of military training. I had anticipated, from other experiences, a constant bickering and a general striving to make life unendurable for a newcomer. Instead, I was constantly surprised at the good fellowship that existed throughout the force. There were, of course, some healthy rivalries. There were no angels among them. Or I should have fled the Isthmus much earlier. But for the most part, the ZP resembled nothing so much as a big, happy family. Above all, I had expected early to make the acquaintance of Graft, that shifty-eyed monster which we who have lived in large American cities think of as sitting down to dinner with the force at every mess hall. Graft? Why, a zone policeman could not ride on a PRR train in full uniform when off duty without paying his fare, though he was expected to make arrests if necessary and stop behind with his prisoner. Compared indeed with almost any other spot on the broad earth's surface, Graft eats slim meals on the canal zone. The average zone policeman would arrest his own brother, which is, after all, about the supreme test of good policehood. He is not a man who likes to keep blotters, make out accident reports and such things. That can be of interest only to those with clerks and bookkeepers' souls. He would far rather be battling with sun, man, and vegetation in the jungle, 
he is of those who genuinely and frankly have no desire to become rich and successful, a lack of ambition that formal society cannot understand and fancies a weakness. I had still another police surprise during these swivel chair days. I discovered there was on the zone a yellow tailor who made Beau Brommel uniforms at $7.50, compared with which the $5 ready-made ones were mere clothes. All my life long I had been laboring under the delusion that a uniform is merely a uniform. But one lives and learns. There are a few left, I suppose, who have not heard that grey-bearded story of the American in the Philippines who called his native servant and commanded, Juan, va fetch the caballo from the Prado and, and, oh, saddle and bridle him. Damn such a language anyway. I'm sorry I ever learned it. This is capped on the zone by another that is not only true but strikingly typical. An American boss, who had been much annoyed by unforeseen absences of his workmen, pounced upon one of his Spaniards one morning, crying, When you know por la noche that you're not going to trabaja por la manana, why in don't you habla? Si, sí, senor, replied the Spaniard. By which it may be gathered that linguistic ability on the zone is on a par with that in any other U.S. possessions. Of the seven of us assigned to plainclothes duty on this strip of seventy-two nationalities, there was a Colombian, a gentleman of Swedish birth, a Chinaman from Martinique, and a Greek, all of whom spoke English, Spanish, and at least one other language. Of the three Native Americans, two spoke only their mother tongue. In the entire white uniform force, I met only Lieutenant Long and the corporal in charge of Mia Flores, who could seriously be said to speak Spanish, though I am informed that there were one or two others. This was not for a moment any fault of the Z.P. It comes back to our government, and beyond that to the American people. With all our expanding over the surface of the earth in the past fourteen years, there still hangs over us that old provincial backwoods bogey, English was good enough for me. We have only to recall what England does for those of her colonial servants who want seriously to study the language of some portion of her subjects to have something very like the blush of shame creep up the back of our necks. Child's task as is the learning of a foreign language, provincial old Uncle Sam just flat foots along in the same old way, expecting to govern and judge and lead along the path of civilization his foreign colonies, by bellowing at them in his own nasal draw and treating their tongue as if it were some purely animal sound. He is well personified by Corporal Blank, late of the ZP. The corporal had served three years in the Philippines and five on the zone, and could not ask for bread in the Spanish tongue. Why don't you learn it? someone asked one day. Ah, drawled the corporal, what's the use of going to all that trouble? If you have to have an interpreting done, all you got to do is to call in a nigger. Uncle Sam not merely lends his servants no assistance to learn the tongues of his colonies, but should one of his subjects appear bearing that extraordinary accomplishment, he gives him no preference whatever, no better position, not a copper cent more salary, and if things get to a pass where a linguist must be hired, he gives the job to the first citizen that comes along who can make a noise that is evidently not English, or, more still likely, to some foreigner who talks English like a mouthful of Hungarian goulash. It is not the least of the reasons why foreign nations do not take us as seriously as they ought, why our colonials do not love us, and, what is of far greater importance, do not advance under our rule as they should. Meanwhile, there had gradually been reaching me, through the proper channels, as everything does on the zone, even to our ice water, the various coupon books and the like indispensable to zone life and the proper pursuit of plain clothes duty. Distressing as our statistics, the full comprehension of what might follow requires the enumeration of the odds and ends I was soon carrying about with me. A brass check. Police badge. ICC hotel coupon book. Commissary coupon book. 120 trip ticket a booklet containing blank passes between any stations on the PRR to be filled out by holder. Mileage book, purchased by employees at half rates of two and a half cents a mile for use when traveling on personal business. 24 trip ticket, a free courtesy pass to all gold employees, allowing one monthly round trip excursion over any portion of the line. Freight train pass for the PRR. Dirt train and locomotive pass for the Pacific Division. Ditto for the Central Division. Likewise for the Atlantic Division. In short, about everything on wheels was free to the gumshoe, except the yellow car. Passes admitting to docks and steamers at either end of the zone. Notebook. Pencil or pen. Report cards and envelopes. 
one of which the plainclothes man must fill out and forward to headquarters, via train guard, whenever night might overtake him. The gumshoe's day's work, as the idle uniformed man facetiously dubs it. Furthermore, the man out of uniform is popularly supposed never to venture forth among the population without belt, holster, cartridges, and the number 38 colt that reminds you of a drowning man trying to drag you down, handcuffs, police whistle, blackjack, officially he never carries this, theoretically there is not one on the isthmus, but the gumshoe naturally cannot twirl a police club, and it is not always policy to shoot every refractory prisoner. Then, if he chances to be addicted to the weed, there is the cigarette case and matches. A watch is frequently convenient, and incidentally a few articles of clothing are more or less indispensable, even in the dry season. Now and again, too, a bit of money does not come amiss. For though the canal zone is a utopia where man lives by work coupons alone, the detective can never know at what moment his all-embracing duties may not carry him away into the foreign land of Panama, and even were that possibility not always staring him in the face, in the words of Gorgona Red, You've got to have money for your booze, ain't you? Which seems also to be Uncle Sam's view of the matter. Far and away more important than any of the plain clothes equipment thus far mentioned is the expense account. It is unlike the others in that it is not visible and tangible, but a mere condition, a pleasant sensation like the consciousness of a good appetite or a youthful fullness of life. The only reality is a form signed by the Tsar of the Zone himself, tucked away among ICC financial archives. That authorizes the man assigned to special duty in plain clothes to be reimbursed money expended in the pursuit of duty up to the sum of $60 per month. Although it is said that the interpretation of this privilege to the full limit is not unlikely to cause flames of light, thunderous rumblings, and other natural phenomena in the vicinity of Empire and Calabra. But please note further, these expenditures may be only for cab or boat hire, meals away from home, and liquor and cigars. Plainly, this gumshoe should be a bachelor. Fortunately, however, the proprietor of the expense account is not required personally to consume it each month. It is designed, rather, to win the esteem of bartenders, loosen the tongue of suspects, libate the thirsty stool pigeon, and prime other accepted sources of information. But beware, exceeding care in filling out the account of such expenditures at the month's end. Carelessness leads a hunted life on the canal zone. Take, for example, the slight error of my friend, who, having made such expenditure in Cologne, by a slip of the pen, or, to be nice, of the typewriter, sent in among three score and ten items the following. February 4th, two bottles beer, Cristobal, fifty cents. And in the course of time, found said voucher again on his desk, with a marginal note of mild-eyed wonder and more than idle curiosity, in the handwriting of a man very high up indeed. Where can you buy beer in crystal ball? All this and more I learned in the swivel chair waiting for orders, reading the latest novel that had found its way to Ancon Station, and receiving frequent assurances that I should be quite busy enough once I got started. Opposite sat Lieutenant Long, pouring choice bits of substation orders into the phone. Don't you believe it? That was no accident. He didn't lose everything he had in every pocket rolling around drunk in the street. He's been systematically frisked. Sabe frisked? Get on the job and look into it. For the lieutenant was one of those scarce and enviable beings who can live with his subordinates as man to man, yet never find an ounce of his authority missing when authority is needed. Now and then a ZP story wiled away the time. There was a side case of Corporal Blank in charge of Blank Station. Early one Sunday afternoon, the corporal saw a Spaniard leading a goat along the railroad. Naturally, the day was hot. The corporal sent a policeman to arrest the inhuman wrench for cruelty to animals. When he had left the culprit weeping behind padlocks, he went to inspect the goat, tied in the shade under the police station. Poor little beast, said the sympathetic corporal, as he set before it a generous pan of ice water fresh from the police station tank. The goat took one long, eager, grateful draft, turned over on his back, curled up like the sensitive plants of Panama jungles when a finger touches them, and departed this veil of tears. But Corporal Blank was an artist of the first rank. Not only did he get away with it, under the very frowning battlements of the judge, but sent the Spaniard up for ten days on the charge against him. ZPs who tell the story assert that the Spaniard did not so much mind the sentence as the fact that the Corporal got his goat. Then there was the mystery of the knocked-out niggers. 
Day after day there came reports from a spot out along the line that some negro laborer strolling along in a perfectly reasonable manner suddenly lay down, threw a fit, and went into a comatose state from which he recovered only after a day or two in Ancon or Cologne hospitals. The doctors gave it up in despair. As a last resort, the case was turned over to a Z.P. sleuth. He chose himself a hiding place as near as possible to the locality of the strange manifestation. For half the morning he sweltered and swore without having seen or heard the slightest thing of interest to an old zoner. A dirt train rumbled by now and then. He strove to amuse himself by watching the innocent games of two little Spanish switchboys not far away. They were enjoying themselves, as guileless childhood would, between their duties of letting a train in or out of the switch. Well on in the second half of the morning, another diminutive Iberian, a water boy, brought his compatriots a pail of water and carried off the empty bucket. The boys hung over the edge of the pail a sort of wire hook, the handle of their homemade drinking can, no doubt, and went on playing. By and by, a burly black Jamaican in shirt sleeves loomed up in the distance. Now and then, as he advanced, he sang a snatch of West Indian Ballad. As he espied the switch arrows, a smile broke out on his features, and he hastened forward, his eyes fixed on the water pail. In a working species of Spanish, he made some request to the boys, the while wiping his ebony brow with his sleeve. The boys protested. Evidently they had lived in the zone so long, they had developed a color line. The negro pleaded. The boys, sitting in the shade of their wigwam, still shook their heads. One of them was idly tapping the ground with a broom handle that had laid beside him. The negro glanced up and down the track, snatched up the boy's drinking vessel, of which the wire looped over the pail was not, after all, the handle, and stooped to dip up a can of water. The little fellow with the broomstick, ceasing a useless protest, reached a bit forward and tapped dreamily the rail in front of him. The Jamaican suddenly sent the can of water some rods down the track, danced an artistic buck and wing shuffle on the thin air above his head, sat down on the back of his neck, and after trying a moment in vain to kick the railroad out by the roots, lay still. By this time, the sleuth was examining the broom handle. From its split end protruded an inch of telegraph wire, which chanced also to be the same wire that hung over the edge of the galvanized bucket. Close in front of the innocent little fellows ran a third rail. Then suddenly this life of anecdote and leisure ended. There was thrust into my hands a typewritten sheet, and I caught the next thing on wheels out to Corazel for my first investigation. It was one of the most commonplace cases on the zone. Two residents of my first dwelling place on the Isthmus had reported the loss of $150 in U.S. gold. Easier burglary than this the world does not offer. Every bachelor quarters on the Isthmus, completely screened in, is entered by two or three screen doors, none of which is or can be locked. In the buildings are from twelve to twenty-four wide-open rooms of two or three occupants each, no three of whom know one another's full names or anything else, except that they are white Americans and ipso facto, so runs own philosophy, above dishonesty. The quarters are virtually abandoned during the day. Two Negro janitors dawdle about the building, but they, too, leave it for two hours at midday. Moreover, each of the forty-eight or more occupants probably has several friends or acquaintances or enemies who may drift in looking for him at any hour of the day or night. No Negro janitor would venture to question a white man's errand in a house. Panama's below the Mason and Dixon line. In practice, any white American is welcome in any bachelor quarters, and even to a bed, if there is one unoccupied, though he be a total stranger to all the community. Add to this that the Negro tailor's runner often has permission to come while the owner is away for suits in need of pressing that John Chinaman must come and claw the week's washing out from under the bed where the roughneck kicked it on Saturday night, that there are a dozen other legitimate errands that bring persons of varying shades into the building, and above all that the bachelors themselves, after the open-hearted old American fashion, have the all but universal habit of tossing gold and silver, railroad watches and real estate bonds, or anything else of whatever value, indifferently on the first clear corner that presents itself. Precaution is troublesome and un-American. It seems a fling at the character of your fellow bachelors, and in the vast majority of zone cases it would be. But it is in no sense surprising that among the many thousands that swarm upon the isthmus, there should be some not adverse to increasing their income by taking advantage of these guileless habits in bucolic conditions. There are suggestions that a few, not necessarily whites, make a profession of it. No wonder our chief trouble is burglary, and has been ever since the Z.P. can remember. Summed up, the payday gold that has thus faded away is perhaps no small amount, compared with what it might have been under prevailing conditions 
it is little. As for detecting such felonies, police officers the world around know that theft of coin of the realm in not too great quantities is virtually as safe a profession as the ministry. The Z.P. plainclothes man, like his fellows elsewhere, must usually be content in such cases with impressing on the victim his Sherlockian astuteness, gathering the available facts of the case, and return to typewrite his report thereof to be carefully filed away among headquarters archives, which is exactly what I had to do in the case in question, diving out the door, notebook in hand, to catch the evening train to Panama. I was growing accustomed to ANCON, and even to ANCON police mess, when I strolled into headquarters on Saturday the 16th, and the inspector flung a casual remark over his shoulder. Better get your stuff together. You're transferred to Caton. I was already stepping into a cab en route for the evening train when the inspector chanced down the hill. New Gaton is pretty bad on Saturday nights, he remarked. All too well I remembered it. The first time a nigger starts anything, run him in, and take all the witnesses in sight along. Uh, that reminds me, I haven't been issued a gun or handcuffs yet, I hinted. Hell's fire, no? queried the inspector. Tell the station commander at Gaton to fix you up. End of chapter 5, part 2 Recording by Todd Chapter 6, Part 1 of Zone Policeman 88 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by K. Hand Zone Policeman 88 A Close-Range Study of the Panama Canal and Its Workers by Harry A. Frank. Chapter 6, Part 1. I scribbled myself a ticket and was soon rolling northward, greeting acquaintances at every station. The zone is like Egypt. Whoever moves must travel by the same route. At Pedro Miguel and Cascadas, armies of locomotives, the mules of the man from Arkansas, stood steaming and panting in the twilight after their day's labor and the wild race homeward under hungry engineers. As far as Bas Abispo, this busy, teeming isthmus seemed a native land. Beyond was like entering into foreign exile. It is common zone experience that only the locality one lives in during his first week ever feels like home. The route, too, was a new one. From Gorgona, the train returned crabwise through Matachin and across the sandy dike that still holds the Chagres out of the cut, and halted at Gamboa Cabin. Day was dying as we rumbled on across the iron bridge above the river and away into the fresh jungle night along the rock-ballasted relocation. The stillness of this less inhabited half of the zone settled down inside the car and out, the evening air of summer caressing almost roughly through the open windows. The train continued its steady way almost uninterruptedly, for though new villages were springing up to take the place of the old sinking into desuetude and the flood along with the abandoned line, there were but two where once were eight. We paused at the new Frijoles and the boxcar town of Monte Lirio, and, skirting on a higher level with a wide detour on the flanks of thick jungled and forested hills, what is some day to be Gatun Lake, drew up at 7.30 at Gatun. I wandered and inquired for some time in a black night, for the moon was on the graveyard shift that week, before I found Gatun police station on the nose of a breezy knoll. But for Davy, the desk man, who it turned out was also to be my roommate, and a few wistful-eyed negroes in the steel-barred room in the center of the building, the station was deserted. Circus, said the desk man briefly. When I mentioned the matter of weapons, he merely repeated the word with the further information that only the station commander could issue them. There was nothing to do, therefore, but to ramble out armed with a lead pencil into a virtually unknown town riotous with liquor and negroes and the combination of Saturday night, circus time, and the aftermath of payday, and to strut back and forth in a way to suggest that I was a perambulating arsenal. But though I wandered a long two hours into every hole and corner where trouble might have its breeding place, nothing but noise took place in my sight and hearing. I turned disgustedly away toward the tents pitched in a grassy valley between the two gatuns. At least there was a faint hope that the equestrian might assault the ringmaster. I approached the tent flap with a slightly quickening pulse. Worldwide and centuries old as is the experience, personally I was about to spring my badge for the first time. 
Suppose the door tender should refuse to honor it and force me to impress upon him the importance of the ZP. Without a gun? Outwardly nonchalant, I strolled in between the two ropes. Proprietor Ship looked up from counting his winnings and opened his mouth to shout, Ticket! I flung back my coat, and with a nod and a half-wink of wisdom, he fell back again to computing his lawful gains. By the way, are not you who read curious to know, even as I for long years wondered, where a detective wears his badge? Know, then, that long and profound investigation among the ZP seems to prove conclusively that as a general and all but invariable rule, he wears it pinned to the lining of his coat, or under his lapel, or on the band of his trousers, or on the breast of his shirt, or in his hip pocket, or up his sleeve, or at home on the piano, or riding around at the end of a string in the baby's nursery, though as is the case of all rules, this one, too, has its exceptions. Entertainments come rarely to Gatun. The one-ringed circus was packed with every grade of society, from gaping Spanish laborers to haughty wives of dirt train conductors, among whom it was not hard to distinguish in a far corner the uniformed sergeant in command of Gatun and the long lean corporal tied in a bowline knot at the alleged wit of the versatile but solitary clown who changed his tongue every other moment from English to Spanish. But the end was already near. Excitement was rising to the finale of a performance, a wrestling match between a circus man and Andy of Pedro Miguel Locks. By the time I found a leaning place it was on, and the circus man, of course, was conquered amid the gleeful howling of roughnecks, who collected considerable sums of money and went off shouting into the black night, in quest of a place where it might be spent quickly. It would be strange indeed if among all the thousands of men in the prime of life who are digging the canal, at least one could not be found who could subjugate any champion a wandering circus could carry among its properties. I took up again the random tramping in the dark unknown night, till it was two o'clock of a Sunday morning, when at last I dropped my report card in the train guard box and climbed upstairs to the cot opposite Davy, sleeping the silent, untroubled sleep of a babe. I was barely settled in Gatun when the train guard handed me one of those frequent typewritten orders calling for the arrest of some straggler or deserter from the Marine camp of the 10th Infantry. That very morning I had seen the boss of census days off on his vacation to the States, from which he might not return. In here, I was coldly and peremptorily called to go forth and arrest and deliver to Camp Elliot on its hill, Mac, the pride of the census, with a promise of $25 reward for the trouble. Mac? Dessert? It was to laugh. But naturally, after six weeks of unceasing repetition of that pink set of questions, Mac's throat was a bit dry and he could scarcely be expected to return at once to the humdrum life of camp without spending a bit of that $5 a day in slaking a tropical thirst. Indeed, I question whether any but the prudish will loudly blame Mac, even because he spent it a bit too freely and brought up in Empire Dispensary. Word of his presence there soon drifted down to the wily plainclothes man of Empire District, but it was a hot noonday, the dispensary lies somewhat uphill, and the uniformless officer of the zone metropolis is rather thickly built. Wherefore, stowing away this private bit of information under his hat, he told himself with a yawn, Oh, I'll drag him in later in the day and drifted down to a wide-open door on Railroad Avenue to spend a bit of the $25 reward in offsetting the heat. Meanwhile, Mac, feeling somewhat recovered from his financial extravagance, came sauntering out of the dispensary, and seeing his curly-headed friend strolling a beat not far away, naturally cried out, Hello, Eck! And what could Eck say, being a reputable zone policeman, but? Why, hello, Mac, how they frame it up? Consider yourself pinched. Which was lucky for Mac for Eck had once worn a marine hat over his own right eye, and he knew from melancholy experience that the $25 was no government generosity, but Mac's own involuntary contribution to his finding and delivery so managed to slip most of it back into Mac's hands. Long, long after, more than six weeks after, in fact, I chanced to be in Bas Obispo with a half hour to spare, and climbed to the flowered and many-roaded camp on its far-viewing hilltop that falls sheer away on the east into the canal. In one of the airy barracks I found Renson, cards in hand, clear-skinned, and fit now, thanks to the regular life of this adult nursery, though his lost youth was gone for good. And Mac? Yes, I saw Mac too, or at least the back of his head and shoulders through the screen of the guardhouse where Renson pointed him out to me, as he was being locked up again after a day of shoveling sand. 
The first day's in Gatun called for little else than patrol duty without fixed hours interspersed with an occasional loaf on the second-story veranda of the police station overlooking the giant locks. Close at hand was the entrance to the canal, up which came slowly barges loaded with crushed stone from Porto Bello Quarry twenty miles east along the coast or sand from Nombre de Dios, twice as distant, while further still spread Limon Bay, from which swept a never-ending breeze one could wipe dry as on a towel. So long as he has in his pocket no typewritten report with the inspector's scrawl across it, for investigation and report, the plainclothes man is virtually his own commander, with few duties beside, trying to be in as many parts of his district at once as possible, and the ubiquitous duty of keeping in touch with headquarters. So I wandered and mingled with all the life of the vicinity, exactly as I should have done had I not been paid a salary to do so. By day, one could watch the growth of the great locks, the gradual drowning of little green new-made islands beneath the muddy still waters of Gatun Lake, tramp out along jungle-flanked country roads, through the Mindy Hills, or down below the old railroad, to where the Cayucas that floated down the Chagres, laden with fruit, came to land on the ever-advancing edge of the waters. With night, things grew more compact. From twilight till after midnight, I prowled in and out through New Gatun, spilled far and wide over its several hills, watching the antics of Negroes, pausing to listen to their guitars and their boisterous merriment, with an eye and ear ever open for the unlawful. When I drifted into a saloon to see who might be spending the evening out, the bartender proved he had the advantage of me in acquaintance by crying, Hello, Frank, what you having? And showing great solicitude that I get it. After which I took up the starlit tramp again to run perhaps into some such perilous scene as on that third evening. A riot of contending voices rose from a building back in the center of a block, with now and then the sickening thump of a falling body. I approached noiselessly, likewise weaponless, peeped in and found four negro bakers stripped to the waist, industriously kneading tomorrow's bread, and discussing in profoundest earnest the object of the Lord in creating mosquitoes. Beyond the native town, as an escape from all this, there was the back country road that wound for a mile through the fresh night and the droning jungle, yet instead of leading off into the wilderness of the interior, swung around to American Gatun on its close-cropped hills. I awoke one morning to find my name bulletined among those ordered to report for target test. A fine piece of luck was this for a man who had scarcely fired a shot since, aged ten, he brought down with an air gun an occasional sparrow at three cents a head. We took the afternoon train to Mount Hope on the edge of Cologne and trooped away to a little plain behind Monkey Hill, the last resting place of many a zoner. The Cristobal lieutenant, father of ZP, was in charge, and here again was that same ZP absence of false dignity and the genuine good fellowship that makes the success of your neighbor as pleasing as your own. Shall I borrow a gun, lieutenant? I asked when I found myself on deck. Well, you'll have to use your own judgment as to that, replied the lieutenant, busy pasting stickers over the holes in the target. The test was really very simple. All you had to do was cling to one end of a number 38 horse pistol, point it at the bull's eye of a target, hold it in that position until you had put five bullets into said bull's eye, repeat that twice at growing distances, mortally wound ten times the image of a Martinique negro running back and forth across the field, and you had a perfect score. Only, simple as it was, none did it, not even old soldiers with two or three hitches in the army. So I had to be content with creeping in on the second page of a seven-page list of all the tested force from the chief to the latest Negro recruit. The next evening, I drifted into the police station to find a group of laborers from the adjoining camps awaiting me on the veranda bench because the desk man didn't sabe their lingo. They proved upon examination to be two Italians and a Turk, and their story short, sad, by no means unusual. Upon returning from work, one of the Italians had found the lock hinges of his ponderously padlocked tin trunk hanging limp and screwless, and his payday roll of some thirty dollars missing from the crown of a hat stuffed with a shirt securely packed away in the deepest corner thereof. The Turk was similarly unable to account for the absence of his thirty-three dollars savings safely locked the night before inside a pasteboard suitcase, unless the fact that, thanks to some sort of surgical operation, one entire side of the grip now swung open like a barn door might prove to have something to do with the case. The $33 had been, for further safety's sake, in Panamanian silver, suggesting a burglar with a wheelbarrow. The mysterious detective work began at once. 
Without so much putting on a false beard, I repaired to the scene of the nefarious crime. It was the usual zone type of laborer's barracks, a screen building of one huge room. It contained two double rows of three-tier standee canvas bunks on gas pipes. Around the entire room, close under the sheet iron roof, ran a wooden platform or shelf reached by a ladder and stacked high with the tin trunks, misshapen bundles, and pressed paper suitcases containing the worldly possessions of the 50 or more workmen around the rough table below. Theoretically, not even an inmate thereof may enter a zone labor camp during working hours. Practically, the West Indian janitors to whom is left the enforcement of this rule are nothing if not fallible. In the course of the second day, I unearthed a second Turk who, having chanced the morning before to climb to the baggage shelf for his razor and soap preparatory to welcoming a fellow countryman to the isthmus, had been mildly startled to step on the shoulder blade of a negro of given length and proportions lying prone behind the stacked-up impedimenta. The latter explained both his presence in a white labor camp and his unconventional posture by asserting that he was the Mosquito Man, and shortly thereafter went away from there without leaving either card or address. By all my library training and detective work, the next move obviously was to find what color of cigarette ashes the Turk smoked. Instead, I blundered upon the absurdly simple notion of trying to locate the negro of given length and proportions. The real mosquito man, one of that dark band that spends its zone years with a wire hook and a screened bucket gathering evidence against the defenseless mosquito for the sanitary department to gloat over, was found not to fit the model even in hue. Moreover, mosquito men are not accustomed to carry their devotion to duty to the point of crawling under trunks in their quest. For a few days following, the hunt led me through all Gatun and vicinity. Now I found myself racing across the narrow plank bridges above the yawning gulf of the locks with far below tiny men and toy trains, now in and out among the cathedral-like flying buttresses under the giant arches past staring signs of danger on every hand, as if one could not plainly hear its presence without the posting. I descended to the very floor of the locks, far below the earth, and tramped the long half-mile of the three flights between the soaring concrete walls. Above me rose the great steel gates, standing ajar and giving one the impression of an opening in the Great Wall of China, or of a skyscraper about to be swung lightly aside. On them resounded the roar of the compressed air riveters, and all the way up the sheer faces, growing smaller and smaller as they neared the sky, were McClintic marshal men driving into place red-hot rivets, thrown at them viciously by negroes at the forges and glaring like comet's tails against the twilight void. The chase sent me more than once stumbling away across rock-tumbled Gatun Dam that squats its vast bulk where for long centuries, eighty-five feet below, was the village of Old Gatun, with its proud church and its checkered history, where Morgan and Peruvian viceroys and forty-niners were wont to pause from their arduous journeyings. They call it a dam. It is rather a range of hills, a part and portion of the highlands, that east and west enclose the valley of the Chagres, its summit resembling the terminal yards of some great city. There was one day when I sought a Negro brakeman attached to a given locomotive. I climbed to a yardmaster's tower above the spillway, and the yardmaster, taking up his powerful field glasses, swept the horizon, or rather the dam, and discovered the engine for me as a mariner discovers an island at sea. Er, would you be kind enough to tell us where we can find this Gatun Dam we've heard so much about? Asked a party of four tourists, half and half as to sex, who had been wandering about on it for an hour or so with puzzled expressions of countenance. They addressed themselves to a busy civil engineer in leather leggings and rolled up shirt sleeves. I'm sorry, I haven't time to use the instrument, replied the engineer over his shoulder, while he wigwagged his orders to his negro helpers scattered over the landscape. But nearly as I can tell with the naked eye, you are now standing in the exact center of it. The result of all this sweating and sightseeing was that some days later there was gathered in a young Barbadian who had been living for months in and about Gatun without any visible source of income whatever, not even a wife. The Turk and the camp janitor identified him as the culprit. But the primer lesson the police recruit learns is that it is one thing to believe a man guilty and quite another to convince a judge the most skeptical being known to zoology, of that perfectly apparent fact. With the suspect behind bars, therefore, I continued my underground activities, with the result that when at length I took the train to New Gatan one morning for the courtroom in Cristobal, 
I loaded into a second-class coach, six witnesses aggregating five nationalities, ready to testify, among other things, to the interesting little point that the defendant had a long prison record in Barbados. End of Chapter 6, Part 1「had died away, and the little white-haired judge had taken his bench, I made the discovery that I was present in not one, but in four capacities, as arresting officer, complainant, interpreter, and to a large extent prosecuting attorney. To swear a Turk who spoke only Turkish, through another Turk, who mangled a little Spanish, for a judge who would not recognize a non-American word from the voice of a steam shovel, with a solemn so help me god to clinch and strengthen it when the witness was a follower of the prophet of medina or nobody was not without its possibilities of humour the trial proceeded the witnesses witnessed in their various tongues the perspiring arresting officer reduced their statements to the common denominator of the judge's single tongue and the smirking bullet-head defendant was hopelessly buried under evidence Wherefore, when the shining black face of his lawyer, retained during the two minutes between the oye and the opening of the case, rose above the scene to purr. Your Honor, the prosecution has shown no case. I move the charge against my client be quashed. I choked myself just in time to keep from gasping aloud, while of all the nerve. Never will I learn that the lawyer's profession admits lying on the same footing with truth in the defense of a culprit. Cause shown, mumbled the judge, without looking up from his writing, defendant bound over for trial in the circuit court. A week later, therefore, there was a similar scene, a story higher in the same building. Here, on Thursdays, sits one of the three members of the Zone Supreme Court. Jury trial is rare on the Isthmus, which makes possibly for surer justice. This time there was all the machinery of court, and I appeared only in my legal capacity. The judge, a man still young, with an astonishingly mobile face that changed at least once a minute from a furrowy scowl with great pouting lips to a smile so broad it startled, sat in state in the middle of three judicial armchairs, and the case proceeded. Within an hour the defendant was standing up, the cheery grin still on his black countenance, to be sentenced to two years and eight months in his own penitentiary at Culebra. A deaf man would have fancied he was being awarded some prize. One of the never-ending surprises on the zone is the apparent indifference of Negro prisoners whether they get years or go free. Even if they testify in their own behalf, it is in a listless, detached way, as if the matter were of no importance anyway. But the glance they throw at the innocent arresting officer as they pass out on their way to the barbed wire enclosure on the outskirts of the zone capital tells another story. There are members of the ZP who sleep with a gun under their pillow because of that look or a muttered word. But even were I nervous, I should have been little disturbed at the glare in this case, for it will probably be a long walk from Culebra Penitentiary to where I am thirty-two months from that morning. A holiday air brooded over all Gatun and the countryside. Workmen in freshly washed clothing lolled in the shade of labor camps. Black Britishers were gathering in flat meadows fitted for the national game of cricket. Far and wide sounded the carefree laughter and chattering of Negroes, while well, even within Gatun Police Station, leisure and peace seemed almost in full possession. The morning touch with headquarters over, therefore, I scrambled away across the silent, yawning locks and the trainless and workless dam to the spillway, over which already some overflow from the lake was escaping to the Caribbean. My friend, Dusty and H, had carried their canoe to the Chagres below, and before nine we were off down the river. It was a day that all the world north of the Tropic of Cancer could not equal. Just the weather for a perfect day off. A plain clothes man, it is true, is not supposed to have days off. Someone might run away with the administration building on the edge of the Pacific and the telephone wires be buzzing for me, with the sad results that a few days later there would be posted in zone police stations where all who turned the leaves might read. Special order number. Having been found guilty of charges of neglect of duty, preferred against him by his commanding officer, First class policeman number 88 is hereby fined $2. J. 
chief of division. But shades of John Aspinwall, should even a detective work on such a Sunday? Surely no criminal would, least of all a black one. Moreover, these forest-walled banks were also part of my beat. The sun was hot, yet the air of that ozone-rich quality for which Panama is famous. For headgear we had caps, and did not wear those, though barely a few puffy snow-white clouds ventured out into the vast chartless sky all the brilliant day through. Then the river. Who could describe this lower reach of the Chagres, as it curves its seven deep and placid miles from where Uncle Sam releases it from custody to the ocean? Its jungled banks were without a break, for the one or two clusters of thatch and reed huts along the way are but a part of the living vegetation. Now and then we had glimpses across the treetops of brilliant green jungle hills farther inland. Everywhere were huge, splendid trees, the stack-shaped mango, the soldier-erect palm, heavy yet unburdened with coconuts. Some fish resembling the porpoise rose here and there, back and forth above the shadows, winged snow-white cranes so slender one wondered the sea breeze did not wreck them. Above all, the quiet and peace and contentment of a perfect tropical day enfolded the landscape in a silence only occasionally disturbed by the cry of a passing bird. Once, a gasoline launch, deep laden with Sunday-starched Americans, snorted by, bound likewise to Fort Lorenzo at the river's mouth, and we lay back in our soft, rumpled khaki and drowsily smiled our sympathy after them. When they had drawn out of earshot, life began to return to the banks, and nature again took possession of the scene. Alligators abounded once on this lower chagres, but they have grown scarce now, or shy, and though we sat with H's automatic rifle across our knees in turns, we saw no more than a carcass or a skeleton on the bank at the foot of the sheer wall of impenetrable verdure. Till at length the sea opened on our sight through the alleyway of jungle, and a broad, inviting coconut grove nodded and beckoned on our left. Instead we paddled out across the sandbar to play with the surf of the Atlantic, but found it safer to return and glide across the little bay to the drowsy straw and tin village. Here, for the mouth of the Chagres, like its source, lies in a foreign land, a solitary Panamanian policeman in the familiar Arctic uniform enticed us toward the little thatched office and house and swinging hammock of the Alcalde to register our names and our business had we any. So deep-rooted was the serenity of the place that even when dusty, in all zone innocence, addressed the white-haired little mulatto as hombre, he lost neither his dignity or his temper. The policeman and a brown boy of merry breed went with us up the grassy rise to the old fort. In its musty vaulted dungeons were still the massive rust-corroded irons for feet, and the neck of prisoners of the old brutal days. Blind owls stared upon us. Once the boy brought down with his honda, or slung shot, one of the bats that circled uncannily above our heads. In dank corners were mounds of worthless powder. The bakery that once fed the miserable dungeon dwellers had crumbled in upon itself. Outside, great trees straddled and split the massive stone walls that once commanded the entrance to the Chagres. Jungle waved in undisputed possession in its earth-filled moat. Even the old cannon and heaped-up cannonballs lay rust-eaten and dejected, like decrepit old men who had long since given up the struggle. We came out on the nose of the fort bluff and had before and below us and underfoot all the old famous scene, for centuries the beginning of all trans isthmian travel. The scalloped, surf-washed shore with its dwindling palm groves curving away into the west, the Chagres pushing off into the jungled land. We descended to the beach of the outer bay and swam in the salt sea, and the policeman, scorning the launch party, squatted a long hour in the shade of a tree above in tropical patience. Then, with sour oranges for thirst and nothing for hunger, for Lorenzo has no restaurant, we turned to paddle our way homeward up the Chagres, that bears the salt taste of the sea clear to the spillway, whence one verse only of a stanza by the late bard of the isthmus struck a false note on our ears. Then go away if you have to, then go away if you will, to again return you will always yearn, while the lamp is burning still. You've drunk the Chagres water, and the mango eaten free, and strange though it seems, it will haunt your dreams, this land of the coconut tree. No catastrophe had befallen during my absence. The same peaceful sunny Sunday reigned in Gatun. New laundered laborers were still lolling in the shade of the camps. West Indians were still batting at interminable balls with their elongated paddles in the faint hope of deciding the national game before darkness settled down. 
Then twilight fell, and I set off through the rambling town, already boisterous with church services. Before the little substation, a swarm of negroes was pounding tambourines and bawling lustily. Oh, you must be a lover of Delard, or you can't get to heaven when you die. Further on, a lady, who would have made ebony seem light gray, bowed over an organ, while a burly Jamaican, blacker than the night outside, stood in the vestments of the Church of England, telling his version of the case in a voice that echoed back from the town across the gully, as if he would drown out all rival sects and arguments by volume of sound. The meeting house on the next corner was thronged with a singing multitude, tambourines scattered among them, and all clapping hands to keep time even to the pastor, who let the momentum carry on and on into verse after verse, as if he had not the self-sacrifice to stop it. While outside, in the warm night, another crowd was gathered at the edge of the shadows, gazing as at a vaudeville performance. How well fitted are the various brands of Christianity to the particular likings of their flocks? The strong outward manifestation of the religion of the West Indian black is this boisterous singing. All over town were dusky throngs exercising their strong, untrained voices in Delard's service, though the West Indian is not noted as being musical. Here a preacher wanting suddenly to emphasize a point or clinch an argument swung an arm like a college cheerleader and the entire congregation roared forth with him some well-known hymn that settled the question for all time. I strolled on into darker High Street. Suddenly, on a veranda above there, broke out a wild, unearthly screaming. Two Negroes were engaged in savage, sanguinary combat. Around them, in the dim light thrown by a cheap tenement lamp, I could make out their murderous weapons, machetes or great bars of iron, slashing wildly, while above the din rose screams and curses. Yo! Badge again! I kill you! I sped stealthily yet swiftly up the long steps, drawing my number 38, for at last I had been issued one, as I ran and dashed into the heart of the turmoil, swallowing my tendency to shout, Unhand him, villain, and crying instead, Here, what the devil's going on here? Whereupon two negroes let fall at once two pine sticks and turned upon me their broad, childish grins with, We only play in sar, play in single sticks, which we learn to the army in Barbados, sergeant. Thus I wandered on, in and out, till the night lost its youth and the last train from Cologne had dumped its merry crowd at the station, then wound away along the still and deserted back road through the night chirping jungle between the two surviving gatoons. There was a spot behind the division engineer's hill that I rarely succeeded in passing without pausing to drink in the scene, a scallop in the hills where several trees stood out singly and alone against the myriad starlit sky, below and beyond the indistinct valleys and ravines from which came up out of the night the chorus of the jungle. Further on, in American Gatun, there was a seat on the steps before a bungalow that offered more than a good view in both directions. A broad, U.S.-tamed ravine sank away in front, across which the Atlantic breeze wafted the distance softened thrum of guitar, the tones of fifes and happy negro voices, while overhead feathery gray clouds as concealing as a dancer's gossamer hurried leisurely by across the brilliant face of the moon. To the right, in a free space, the southern cross, tilted a bit awry, gleamed as it has these untold centuries, while ephemeral humans come and pass their brief way. It was somewhere near here that Gatun's dry-season mosquito had his hiding place. Rumor whispers of some such letter as the following received by the colonel, not the blue-eyed czar at Culebra this time, for you must know there is another colonel on the zone every whit as indispensable in his sphere. Gatun, 26th, 1912 Dear Colonel, I am writing to call your attention to a gross violation of Sanitary Ordinance number 3621 to an apparent loophole in your otherwise excellent department. The circumstances are as follows. On the evening of 24th, as I was sitting at the roadside between Gatun and New Gatun, some 63 paces beyond House 226, there appeared a mosquito, which buzzed openly and for some time about my ears. It was probably merely a male of the species, as it showed no tendency to bite, but a mosquito nevertheless. I trust you will take fitting measures to punish so bold and insolent a violation of the rules of your department. I am, sir, very truly yours, Mrs. Henry Peck. P.S. The mosquito might easily be recognized by a particularly triumphant, defiant note in its song. I cannot personally vouch for the above, 
but if it was received, any zoner will assure you that prompt action was taken. It is well so. The French failed to dig the canal because they could not down the mosquito. Of course, there was the champagne and the other things that come with it later in the night. But after all, it was the little songful mosquito that drove them in disgrace back across the Atlantic. Still further on toward the hotel and a midnight lunch, there was one house that was usually worth lingering before, though good music is rare on the zone. Then there was the naughty poker game in bachelor quarters number, well, never mind that detail, to keep an ear on in case the pot grew large enough to make a worthwhile violation of the law that would warrant the summoning of the mounted policeman. Meanwhile, cases stacked up about me. Now one took me out the hard U.S. highway that once out of sight of the last Negro shanty rambles erratically off like the reminiscences of an old man through the half-cleared, mostly uninhabited wilderness, rampant green with rooted life and almost noisy with the songs of birds. Eventually, within a couple of hours, it crossed Fox River with its little settlement and descended to Mount Hope Police Station, where there is a phone with which to get in touch again, and then a mission rocker on the screen veranda where the breezes of the nearby Atlantic will have you well cooled off before you can catch the shuttle train back to Gatun. Or another led out across the lake by the old abandoned line that was the main line when first I saw Gatun. It drops down beyond the station and charges across the lake by a causeway that steam shovels were already devouring toward forsaken Bojillo. Picking its way across the rotting spiles of culverts, it pushed on through the unpeopled jungle, all the old railroad gone, rails, ties, the very spikes torn up and carried away, while already the parrots screamed again in derision as if it were they who had driven out the hated civilization and taken possession again of their own. A few short months and the devouring jungle will have swallowed up even the place where it has been. If it was only the little typewritten slip reporting the disappearance of a half dozen jacks from the dam, every case called for full investigation. For days to come, I might fight my way through the encircling wilderness by tunnels of vegetation to every native hut for miles around to see if by any chance the lost property could have rolled thither. More than once, such a hunt brought me out on the water tank knoll at the far end of the dam, overlooking miles of impenetrable jungle behind and above, chanting with a visible life, to the right filling the lake, stretching across to low blue ranges dimly outlined against the horizon and crowned by fantastic trees, and all Gatun and its immense works and workers below and before me. Times were when duty called me into the squalid, red-lighted district of Cologne and kept me there till the last train was gone. Then there was nothing left but to pick my way through the night, out along the PRR tracks, to shout in at the yardmaster's window, How soon you got anything going up the line? And according to the answer, return to read an hour or two in Cristobal YMCA or push on at once into the forest of boxcars to hunt out the lighted caboose. Night freights do not stop at Gatun, nor anywhere merely to let off a gum shoe. But just beyond New Gatun Station is a grade that sets the Negro firemen to sweating even at midnight, and the big mogul to straining every nerve and sinew, and I did not meet the engineer that could drag his long load by so swiftly, but that one could easily swing off on the road that leads to the police station. Even on the rare days when cases gave out, there was generally something to while away the monotony. As one morning, an American widely known in Gatun was arrested on a warrant and, chatting merrily with his friend Policeman Blank, strolled over to the station. There his friend Corporal Macy subdued his broad Irish smile and ordered the deskman to book him up. The latter was reaching for the keys to a cell when the American broke off his pleasant flow of conversation to remark, All right, Corporal, I'm going over to the house to get a few things and write a few letters. I'll be back inside of an hour. Whereupon, Corporal Macy, being a man of iron self-control, refrained from turning a double-back somersault and mildly called the prisoner's attention to a little point of his own police rules he had overlooked. If every other known form of amusement absolutely failed, it was still the dry or tourist season and poured down from the States hordes of unconscious comedians or investigators who rushed two whole days about the isthmus, taking care not to get into any dirty places, and rushed home again to tell an eager public all about it. Sometimes the sightseers came from the opposite end of the earth, a little band of South Americans in tongueless awe at the undreamed monster of work about them, yet struggling to keep their fancied despite of the Yankee, to which the Yankee is so serenely indifferent. Priests from this Southland were especially numerous. 
The week never passed that a group of them might not be seen peering over the dizzy precipice of Gatun locks and crossing themselves ostentatiously as they turned away. One does not, at least in a few months, feel the sameness of climate at Panama and long again to see spring grow out of winter. Yet there is something, perhaps, in the popular belief that even northern energy evaporates in this tropical land. It is not exactly that, but certainly many a zoner wakes up day by day with ambitious plans and just drifts the day through with the fine weather. He fancies himself as strong and energetic as in the north, yet when the time comes for doing, he is apt to say, Oh, I guess I'll loaf here in the shade half an hour longer, and before he knows it, another whole day is charged up against his meager credit column with father time. There came the day, early in April, when the inspector must go north on his forty-two days vacation. I bade him bon voyage on board the 841 between the two gatoons, and soon afterward was throwing together my belongings and leaving Davy to enjoy his room alone. For Corporal Castillo was to be head of the subterranean department ad interim, and how could the digging of the canal continue with no detective in all the wilderness of morals between the Pacific and Culebra? Thus it was that the afternoon train bore me away to the southward. It was a tourist train. A New York steamer had docked that morning, and the first-class cars were packed with venturesome travelers in their stout campaign outfits with which to rough it, in the tivioli and the sightseeing motors, in their roof-like cork helmets and green veils for the terrible Panama heat, which is sometimes as bad as in northern New York. The PRR is one of the few railroads whose passengers may drop off for a stroll, let the tray go on without them, and still take it to their destination. They have only to descend, as I did, at Gamboa Cabin, and wander down into the cut, climb leisurely out to Bass Obispo, and chat with their acquaintances among the Marines lolling about the station until the train puffs in from its shuttleback excursion to Gorgona. The zone landscape had lost much of its charm. For days past, jungle fires had been sweeping over it, doing the larger growths small harm, but leaving little of the greenness and rank, clinging life of other seasons. Everywhere were fires along the way, even in the towns. For quartermasters, to the rage of zone housewives, were sending up in clouds of smoke the grass and brushes that quickly turned to breeding places of mosquitoes and disease with the first rains. Night closed down as we emerged from Miraflores Tunnel. Soon we swung around toward the houses, row upon row, and all alight, climbed the lower slope of Ancone Hill, and at seven I descended in familiar Cab crowded, bawling Panama. End of chapter six, part two. Chapter seven of Zone Policeman eighty eight. Read by Mickey Lee Rich. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Zone Policeman eighty eight. A Close-Range Study of the Panama Canal and Its Workers by Harry A. Frank Chapter 7 It might be worth the ink to say a word about socialism in the canal zone. To begin with, there isn't any, of course. No man would dream of looking for socialism in the undertaking set in motion by the Republican Party and kept on the move by the regular army. But there are a number of little points in the management of this private government strip of earth that savors more or less faintly of the socialist program, and the zone offers perhaps as good a chance as we shall ever have to study some phases of those theories in practice. Few of us now deny the socialists' main criticisms of existing society. Most of us question his remedies. Some of us go so far as to feel a sneaking curiosity to see railroads and similar purely public utilities government-owned, just to find out how it would work. Down on the canal zone, they have a sort of modified socialism where one can watch much of this under a bell jar. There, one quickly discovers that a locomotive with the brief and sufficient information U.S. on her tender flanks, or more properly the flanks of her tender, give one a swelling of the chest no other combination of letters could inspire. Thus far, too, theory seems to work well. The service could hardly be better, and recalling that under the old private system, the fare for the 47 miles across the isthmus was $25 with a charge of $0.10 cents for every pound of baggage, the $2.40 of today does not seem particularly exorbitant. 
The official machinery of this private government ship also seems to run like clockwork. To be sure, the wheels even of a clock grind a bit with friction at times, but the clock goes on keeping time for all that. The Canal Zone is the best governed district in the United States. It is worth any American's time and seasickness to run down there, if only to ensure himself that Americans really can govern. Until he does, he will not have a very clear notion of just what good American government means. But before we go any further, be it noted that the socialism of the Canal Zone is under a benevolent dispo. An omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent ruler, which is perhaps the one way that socialism would work, at least in this present stage of human progress. The three omnis are combined into an inconspicuous, white-haired American popularly known in the zone as the Colonel. So popularly, in fact, that an attempt to replace him would probably start something among the classes and races of the zoners. That he is omnipotent on the zone, not many will deny. A few have questioned, and landed in the States a week later much less joyous but far wiser. Omniscient? Well, they have even Chinese secret service men on the isthmus, and soldiers and marines not infrequently go out in civilian clothes under sealed orders, to say nothing of the colonel's private gumshoe, and probably a lot of other underground sources of information neither you nor I shall ever hear of. But you must get used to spies under socialism, you know, until we all wear one of St. Peter's halos. Look at the elaborate system of the Incas, even with their docile and uninitiative subjects. In the matter of omnipresence, it would be pretty hard to find a hole on the canal zone where you could pull off a stunt of any length or importance without the ICC having a weather eye on you. When it comes to the no less indispensable ingredient of benevolence, one glimpse of those mild blue eyes would probably reassure you in that point, even without the pleasure of watching the despo sit in judgment on his subjects in the castle office on Sunday mornings like old St. Louis under his oak, though with a ten of cigarettes behind him that old Louis had to worry along without. This all-powerful government insists on and enforces many of the things which Americans as a whole stand for. Sunday closing, suppression of resorts, forbidding of gambling, but the zone is no test whether these laws could be genuinely enforced in a whole nation. For down there, Panama and Colin serve as a sort of safety valve, where a man can run down in an hour or so on mileage or monthly pass and blow off steam, get rid of the bad internal vapors that might cause explosion in a ventless society. This we should not lose sight of when we boast that there are few crimes and no real resorts on the zone. The colonel himself will tell you there's no gambling. Yet, it's curious, how many of the weekly prizes of the Panama Lottery find their way into the pockets of American canal builders, and in any zone gathering, of whatever hour or sex, you're almost certain to hear flitting back and forth mysterious whispers of, have a six out of four this week. The zone system is a work coupons for all, much as the socialists would have it. Only the legitimate members of the community, the workers, can live in it long. You should see the nonchalant way a clerk at the government's Tavali Hotel charges a tourist a quarter for a cigar the government sells for six cents in its commissaries. Mere money does not rank high in zone society. It's the labor coupon that counts. They sell cigarettes at the YMCA. You are in that state where you would give your ticket home for a smoke. Yet when you throw down good gold or silver, Black Sam, behind the counter, looks at you with that pitying cold eye kept in stock for newcomers and says wearily, Can't take no money here, boss. That surely is a sort of socialism where a slip of paper showing merely you have done your appointed task gets you the same meal wherever you may drop in. A total stranger, yet without being identified, without a word from anyone, but merely thrusting your coupon book at the yellow West Indian at the door as you enter that he may snatch out so many minutes of labor. Drop in anywhere there's a vacant bed and you're perfectly at home. There is the shower bath, the ice water, the veranda rocker. You knew exactly what was coming to you, just what kind of bed, just what vegetables you would be served at dinner. It reminds one of the Inca system of providing a home for every citizen and tambos along the way if he must travel. But it is the same meal. That is just the point. There is where you begin to furrow your brow and look more closely at this splendid system and fall to wondering if the publication of socialism would not become in time an awful bore. 
There are some things in which we want variety and originality and above all, personality. A meal is a meal, I suppose, as a cat is a cat. Yet there are many subtle little things that make the same things distinctly different. When it comes to dinner, you want a rosy fat German or a bulky French madame putting thought and pride and attention into it, which they will do only if they get good coin of the realm or similar material mullament out of it in proportion. No one will ever fancy he has a mission to serve good meals to the public. In the ICC hotels, we have a government steward who draws a good salary and wears a nice white collar. But, though he is sometimes a bit different and succeeds in making his hotel so, it is only in degree. He's not a great frequenter of the dining room, a time one wonders just what his activities are. Certainly, it's not the planning of meals, for the ICC menu is as fixed and automatic as if it had been taken from a stone slab in the pyramids. A poor meal neither turns his hair white nor cuts down his income. Frequently, especially if he is English and certainly if he has been a ship steward, the Negro waiters seem to run his establishment without interference. Dinner hours, for example, are from 11 to 1. But beware the glare of the waiter at whose table you sit down at 12.50. He slams cold rubbish at you from the discard and snatches it away again before you have time to find you can't eat it. You have your choice of enduring this maltreatment or of unostentatiously slipping him a coin and a hint to go cook you the best he can himself. For you know that as the closing hour approaches, the cooks will not have their private plans interfered with by accepting your order. Here again is where the fat German or the French madame is needed with an ox goad. In other words, the tip system invented by Pharaoh and vitiated by quick rich Americans rages as fiercely in government hotels on the zone as in any lobster palace bordering Broadway. Worse, for here the non-tipper has no living being to advocate his cause. All food is government property. Yet, I have sat down opposite a man who gave the government at the door a work coupon identical with mine, but who furthermore dropped into the waiter's hand 35 cents big, which is half as bad as to do it in U.S. currency. And while I was gazing tearfully at a misshapen lump of vernacular gristle, there was set before him, steaming hot from the government kitchen, a porterhouse steak which a dollar bill would not have brought him within scenting distance of in New York. Do not blame the waiter. If he does not slip an occasional coin to the cook, he will invariably draw the gristle, and even occasional coins do not grow on his waistband. It would be as absurd to charge it to the cook. He probably has a large family to support, as he would under socialism. There runs this story on the zone, vouched for by several. A zoner called an ICC steward and complained that his waiter did not serve him reasonably. Well sneered the steward. I guess you didn't come across. Come across? Why, damn you, I suppose you're getting your rake off too. I certainly am, replied the steward. What do you think I'm down here for, me health? Surely we can't blame it all on the steward or to any other individual. Lay it rather to human nature, that stumbling block of so many varnished and upholstered systems. I hope I am not giving the impression that the ICC hotels are unendurable. Stay home which on the zone means always eat at the same hotel table. Subsidize your waiter, and you do moderately well. But to move thither on yawn as any plainclothes man must is unfortunate. The only difference then is that the next is worse than the last. Whatever their convictions upon arrival, almost all Americans have come down to paying their waiter the regular blackmail of a dollar a month and setting it down as one of the unavoidable evils of life. One or two I knew who insisted on sticking to principles, and they grew leaner and lanker day by day. Because of these things, many an American employee will be found eating in private restaurants of the ubiquitous Chinaman or the occasional Spaniard, though here he must often pay in cash instead of in futures on his labor, which are so much cheaper the world over. It is sad enough to dine on the same old identical round for months, but how if you were one of those who blew in on the heels of the last Frenchman and have been eating it ever since? By this time, even rat tails would be a welcome change. And with genuine socialism, there would not even be that escape. 
It is said to be this hotel problem as much as the perpetual springtime of the zone that so frequently reduces, with the open connivance of the government, a building housing 48 quiet, harmless bachelors to a four-family residence housing eight and gradually upwards. That wreaks such matrimonious havoc among the white frock stenographers who come down to type and remain to cook. Besides the hotel, there is the PRR commissary, the government department stores. It is likewise laundry, bakery, ice factory. It makes ice cream, roast coffee, sends out refrigerator cars, and morning supply train to bring your orders right to your door. Oh yes, it strongly resembles what Bellamy dreamed years ago. Only, as in the case of the hotel, there seems to be a fly or two in the amber. The laundry is tolerable. Fancy turning your soiled linen over to a railroad company. All machine done, of course, as everything would be under socialism, and no comeback for the garment that is not hardly enough of constitution to stand the system. In the stores is little or no shoddy material. In general, the stock is the best available. If a biscuit or a bolt of khaki is better made in England than in the United States, the commissary stocks with the English goods, which is unexpected broad-mindedness for government management. But while prices are lower than in Panama or Colon, they are every whit as high as in American stores. And most of us know something of the exorbitant profit our private merchants exact, particularly on manufactured goods. The government claims to run the commissary only to cover cost. Either that is a crude government joke or there is a colored gentleman ensconced in the coal bin. Moreover, if the commissary hasn't the stuff you want, you had better give up wanting for it has no object in laying in a supply of it just to oblige customers. Its clerks work in the most languid, unexcited manner. They have no object, whatever, in holding your trade, and you can wait until they are quite ready to serve you or go home without. True, most of them are merely Negroes, and a few Americans at the head of the departments are chiefly provincial little fellows from small towns whose notions of business are rather those of Podunk, Massachusetts, than of New York. But lolling about the commissary a half hour, hoping to buy a box of matches, one cannot shake off the conviction that it is a system more than the clerks. Poets and novelists and politicians may work for glory, but no man is going to show calico and fit slippers for such remuneration. Nor are all the old evils of the competitive method banished from the zone. In the canal record, the government organ, the government commissary, advertised a sale of excellent $7 raincoats at a dollar each. The record! It is like reading it in the Bible. Witness the rush of the bargain hunters who, it proves, are by no means of one gender. Yet those splendid raincoats, as managers, clerks, and even Negro sweepers well knew and could not refrain from snickering to themselves at the thought of, were just as rainproof as a poor grade of cheesecloth. I do not speak from hearsay, for I was numbered among the garden hunters. Recruits are the natural victims, and there arrive enough of them each year to get rid of worthless stock. Ten minutes after making the purchase, I set out to walk the Corazal through the first mild shower of the rainy season, and arrived there, I went and laid the bargain gently in the wastebasket of the Corazal police station. All small things, to be sure, but it is the sum of small things that make up that great complex thing, life. Few of us would object to living in that ideal dream world, but could it ever be? I have anxiously asked this question and hinted at these little weaknesses suggested by zone experiences to several zone socialists, who are not hard to find. They merely answer that these things have nothing to do with the case. But not one of them has ever went so far as to demonstrate. And though I was born a long way north of Missouri, I once passed through the corner of the state. As to the other side of the ledger, equal pay for all, nowhere is man further from socialism than on the canal zone. Cast lines are sharply drawn as in India, which should not be unexpected in an enterprise largely in charge of graduates of our chief training school for caste. The Brahmins are the gold employees, white American citizens with all the advantages and privileges thereto appertaining. But, and herein we out-Hindu the Hindus, the Brahmin caste itself is divided and subdivided into infinitesimal gradations. Every rank and shade of man has a different salary, and exactly in accordance with that salary is he housed, furnished, and treated down to the least item. Number of electric lights, candle power, style of bed, size of bookcase. His Brahmin Highness, the Colonel, has a palace, relatively, and all that goes with it. The high priests, the members of the Isthmian Canal Commissions, 
have less regal palaces. Heads of big departments have merely palatial residences. Bosses live in well-furnished dwellings. Conductors are assigned a furnished house or quarter of a house. Policemen, artisans, and the common garden variety of bachelors have a good place to sleep. It is doubtful to be sure whether one-fourth of the zoners of any class ever lived as well before or since. The shovelman's wife, who gives five o'clock teas and keeps two servants, will find life different when the canal is open and she moves back to the smoky little factory cottage and learns again to do her own washing. At work, on the job, there is a genuine American freedom of wear what you please and a general habit of going where you choose in working clothes. That is one of the incomprehensible zone things to the little veneered Panamanian. He cannot rid himself of his racial conviction that a man in an old khaki jacket who is building a canal must be of inferior clay to a hotel loafer in a frock coat and a tall hat. The real Spig could never do any real work for fear of soiling his clothes. He cannot get used to the plain, brusque American type without embroidery, who just does things in his blunt, efficient way without wasting time on little exterior courtesies. None of these childish countries is man enough to see through the rough surface. Even with seven years of American example about him, the Panamanian has not yet grasped the divinity of labor. Perhaps he will eons hence when he has grown nearer true civilization. But among Americans, off-the-job reminiscences of East India flock in again. D, who is a quartermaster at $225, may be on how are you old man terms with G, who is a station agent and draws $175. But Mrs. D never thinks of calling on Mrs. G socially. H and J, who are engineers and cranesmen respectively on the same Steve shovel, are probably Hank and Jim to each other, but Mrs. H would be horrified to find herself at the same dance with Mrs. J. Mrs. X, whose husband is a foreman at $165 and whose dining table is a full six inches longer and whose icebox will hold one more cold storage chicken, would not think of sitting in a bridge with Mrs. Y, whose husband gets $150. As for being black, or any tent but pure white, even an Englishman, though he may eat in the same hotel if his skin is not too tanned, is accepted on staring sufferances. As for the man whose skin is a bit dull, he might sit on the steps of that ICC hotel with dollars dribbling out of his pockets until he starved to death, and he would be duly buried in the particular grave to which his color entitled him. A real American place is the zone, with outward democracy and inward caste, and unenthusiastic and afraid to break the convention's place in play, and the opposite at work. Yet with it all, it is a good place in which to live. There you always have summer, jungled hills to look on by day and moonlight, and to roam in on Sunday, unless you are a policeman seven days a week. It is possible that perpetual summer would soon breed quite a different type of American, The isthmus is nearly always in boyish or girlish good temper. Zone women and girls are noted for plump figures and carefree faces, and there is a contentment that is more than climatic. There are no hard times on the zone, no hurried, worried faces, no famished, wolfish eyes. The zoner has his little troubles, of course. The servant problem, for instance, for the Jamaican housemaid is a thorn in any side. Now and then we hear someone wailing. Oh, it gets so tiresome. Everybody's shoveling dirt or talking about the other fellow. But he knows it isn't strictly true when he says it, and that he is kicking chiefly to keep in practice. Everyone is free from worries as to job, pay, house, provisions, and even hospital fees. And the smoothness of it all, perhaps, gets on his nerves at times. I question whether the colonel himself loses much sleep when a chunk of hill that bears up his resident lets go and pitches into the canal. It sets one to musing at times whether the rock-bound system of the Incas was not best after all, a place for every man and every man in his place, each his allotted work, which he was fully able to do, and getting hail Columbia if he failed to do it. Which brings up the question of results in labor under the pseudo-socialist zone system. Most American employees work steadily and take their work seriously. It is as if each were individually proud of being one of the chosen people and builders of the greatest work of modern times. Yet the far-famed American rush is not especially prevalent. The zone point of view seems to be that no shoveling is so important, even that of digging a ditch half the ships of the world are waiting to cross, that a man should bring upon himself a premature funeral. 
The common laborers, non-Americans, almost dawdle. There are no contractors, Irish straw bosses, to keep them on the move. The answer to the socialist scheme of having the government run all big building enterprises is to go out and watch any city street gang for an hour. The bringing together into close contact of Americans from every section of our broad land is tending to make a new amalgamated type. Even New Englanders grow almost human here among their broader mind fellow countrymen. Any northerner can say nigger as glibly as a Carolinian and growl if one of them steps on a shadow. It is not easy to say just how much effect all this will have when the canal is done and this handful of amalgamated and humanized Americans is sprinkled back all over the states as a leaven to the whole. They tell on the zone of a man from Maine who sat four high school years on the same bench with two Negro boys and returning home after three years on the Isthmus was so horrified to find one of those boys an alderman that he packed his traps and moved to Alabama, where a nigger is a nigger. And if there isn't the makings of a story in that, I'll leave it to the postmaster of Miraflores. End of chapter 7 Read by Mickey Lee Rich Chapter 8, Part 1 of Zone Policeman 88 Read by Mickey Lee Rich This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Zone Policeman 88 A Close-Range Study of the Panama Canal and Its Workers By Harry A. Frank Chapter 8, Part 1 there is much in this police business, said the captain with a slow, deliberate enunciation, that must lead to a blank wall. Out of ten cases to investigate, it is quite possible nine will result in nothing. This percentage could not, of course, be true of a thousand cases, and a man's services still be considered satisfactory. But of ten, it is quite possible. As for knowing how to do detective work, all I bring to the department myself is some ordinary common sense and a little knowledge of human nature, and with these I try to work things out best I can. This peeping through the keyhole police work I know nothing whatever about and don't want to, nor do I expect a man to. I had been discussing with the captain my dissatisfaction at my failure to get results in an important case. A few weeks on the force had changed many a preconceived notion of police life. It had gradually become evident, for instance, that the profession of detective is adventurous, absorbing, heart-stopping, chiefly between the covers of popular fiction. That real detective work, like almost any other vocation, is made up largely of the little unimportant everyday details, with only a rare assignment bulking over the mass. As the captain said, it was just plain, everyday work carried on by the application of ordinary common sense. Such bestseller artifices as disguise were absurd. Not only would disguise in all but the rarest cases be impossible, but useless. The ABC of plain clothes work is to learn to know a man by his face rather than by his clothing, and at the outset, one will be astonished to find out how much he has hitherto been depending on the latter. It must be the same with criminals, too, unless your criminal is an amateur or a fool, in which event you will land him without the trouble of disguising. A detective, furthermore, should not be a handsome man or a man of striking appearance in any way. The ideal plain-clothes man is the little insignificant snipe whom even the ladies will not notice. Since April 10th, I had been settled in Notorious House 111 Ancon, a sort of frontiersman resort or smuggler's retreat, had there been anything to smuggle, where to have fallen through the veranda screening would have been to fall into a foreign land. As payday approached, there came the duty of standing a half hour at the station gate before the departure of each train to watch and discuss with the ponderous, smiling, dark-skinned chief of Panama's plainclothes squad or with the vigilante, the suspicious characters and known crooks of all colors going out along the line. On the 12th, 13th, and 14th, the ICC pay car, that bank on wheels guarded by a squad of ZP, sprinkled its half million a day along the zone. Then, Plainclothes duty was not merely to scan the embarking passengers, but to ride out with each train to one of the busy towns. There, scores upon scores of soil-smeared workmen swarmed over all the landscape with long, paper-wrapped rolls of Panamanian silver in their hands, while flashily dressed touts and crooks of both sexes drifted out from Panama with every train to worm their insidious way into wherever the scent of coin promised another month free from labor. 
To add to those crowded times, the chief dissipation of the West Indian during the few days following payday that his earnings last is to ride aimlessly and joyously back and forth on the trains. There is one advantage, though some policemen call it by quite the opposite name, in being stationed at Incon. When crime takes a holiday and do-nothing threats tropical dementia, or a man tires of his native land and people, a short stroll down the asphalt takes him into the city of Panama. Barely across the street where his badge becomes mere metal and he must take care not to address absent-mindedly the first violator of his own laws, whom he is sure to come upon within the first block, he notes that the English tongue had suddenly almost disappeared. On every hand, lightly sprinkled with many other dialects, sounds Spanish, the slovenly Spanish of Panama in which bueno is bueno and calle is que. As he swings languidly to the right into Avenida Central, he grows gradually aware that there has settled down about him a cold indifference, an atmosphere quite different from that on his own side of the line. Those he addresses in the tongue of the land reply to his questions with their customary gestures and fixed phrases of courtesy, but no more, and a cold, dead silence falls sharply upon the last word. And at times, if the experience be comparatively new, there seems to hover in the air something that reminds him that way back 56 years ago, there was a massacre of Americans in Panama City. For the Panamanian has little love for the United States or its people, which is the customary thanks any man or nation gets for lifting a dirty half-breed gammon from the gutter. Off in the vortex of the city lulls Panama's public market, where Chinamen are the chief sellers and flies the chief consumers. Myriads of fruits in every stage of development and disintegration, haggled bits of meat, the hundred sights and sounds and smells one hurries past, suggests that Panama may even have outdone Central America before Uncle Sam came with his garbage cans and his switch. Further on, down at the old harbor, lingers a hint of picturesqueness of Panama in pre-canal days. Clumsy boats, empty or deep laden with fruit from or freight to the several islands that sprinkle the bay, splash and bump against the little cement wharf. Aged wooden wind jammers doze at their moorings. Everywhere are jabbering natives with that shifty half-cast eye and frequent evidence of deep-rooted disease. Almost every known race mingles in Panama City, even to Chinese coolies in their umbrella hats and rolled-up cotton trousers, delving in rich market gardens on the edges of the town, or dog-trotting through the streets under two baskets dancing on the ends of a bamboo pole, till one fancies oneself at times in Singapore or Shanghai. The black zone laborer, too, often prefers to live in Panama for the greater freedom it affords. There, he doesn't have to clean his sink so often, marry his wife, or banish his chickens from the bedroom. Policemen with their clubs swarm everywhere, for no particular reason than that the little republic is forbidden to play at army, and with the presidential election approaching, political henchmen must be kept good-humored. Not a few of these officers are West Indians, who speak not a word of Spanish, nor any other tongue, strictly speaking. Rubber-tired carriages roll constantly by along Uncle Sam's macadam, amid the jingling of their music bells. Everyone takes a carriage in Panama. Any man can afford 10 cents, even if he has no expense account. Besides, he runs no risk of being overcharged, which is a greater advantage than the cost. All this may be different when Panama's electric line all the way from the Balboa docks to Las Sabanas is open, but that's another year. Meanwhile, the lolling in the carriages comes to be quite second nature. But like any tropical Spanish town, Panama seethes only by night especially Saturday and Sunday nights when the paternal zone government allows its children to spend the evening in town. Then, frequent trains, unknown during the week, begin with the setting of the sun to disgorge Americans of all grades and sizes through the clicking turnstiles into the arms of gesticulating hackmen, some to squirm away a foot between the carriages, all to be swallowed up within ten minutes in the great sea of colored people. So that large as may be each train load, white American faces are so rare on Panama streets that one involuntarily glances at each that passes in the throng. It is the gumshoe's duty to know and be known in as many places as possible. Wherefore, on such nights, whatever his choice, he drifts early down by the Normandy and on into the Panazone to see who is out and why. 
In the latter emporium, he adds a bottle of beer to his expense account, endures for a few moments the bawling above the scream of the piano of two Americans of Palestinian antecedents, admire some local hero, like Baldy, for instance, who is credited with doing what Napoleon could not do, and floats on, perhaps to screw up his courage and venture into the thinly clad Teatro Apollo. He who knows where to look, or was born under a lucky star, may even see on these merry evenings a big marine from Bass Abispo, or a burly soldier of the tenth, howling some joyful song with six or seven little spig policemen climbing about on his frame. At such times, everything but real blood flows in Panama. Her history runs that way. On the day she won her independence from Spain, it is said that the general-in-chief cut his finger on a wine glass. The day she won it from Colombia, there was a Chinaman killed but everyone agrees that was due to the Celestial's criminal carelessness. Down at the quieter end of the city are Las Bovedas, that curving seawall Philip of Spain tried to make out from his palace walls, as many other, regal and otherwise, has strained his eyes in vain to see where his good coin is gone. But the walls are there all right, though Philip never saw them, crumbling a bit, yet still a sturdy barrier to the sea. A broad cement and grass promenade runs atop, wide as an American street. Thirty or forty feet below, the low parapet sounds the deep, time-mellowed voice of the Pacific as there rolls higher and higher up the rock ledges, that great tide so different from the scarcely noticeable one at the colon. The summer breeze never dies down, never grows boisterous. On the landward side, Panama lies mumbling to itself down in the hollow between squat Cheriki prison with its American warden, once his own policeman, while in the round stone watchtowers on the curving parapets lean prison guards with fixed bayonets and incessantly blow the shrill ten whistles that is the universal Latin American artifice for keeping policemen awake. On the way back to the city, the elite, or befriended, may drop in at the university club at the end of the wall for a cooling libation. On Sunday night comes the band concert in the palm-ringed cathedral plaza. There is one on Thursday, too, in Plaza Santa Ana, but that is packed with all colors and considered rather vulgar. In the square by the cathedral, the aggregate color is far lighter. Pure African blood hangs chiefly in the outskirts. Then the haughty aristocrats of Panama, proud of their own individual shade of color, may be seen in the same promenade with American ladies, even a garrison widow or two, from out along the line. Panamanian girls gaudily dressed and suggesting to the nostrils perambulating drugstores shuttle back and forth with their perfumed dandies. Above the throng, past the heads and shoulders of unemotional, self-possessed Americans, erect and soldierly. Sergeant Jack of Ancon Station was sure to be there in his faultless civilian garb, a figure neat but not gaudy, and even busy Lieutenant Long was known to break away from his stacked-up duties and his black stenographer and come to overtop all else in the square save the palm trees, whispering together in the evening breeze between the numbers. There is no favoritism in zone police work. Every crime reported receives full investigation, be it only a Greek laborer losing a pair of trousers or... There was this case that fell to me early in May, for instance. A box billed from New York to Peru had been broken open on Balboa Court and one bottle of cognac stolen. Unfortunately, the matter was turned over to me so long after the perpetration of the dastardly crime that the possible culprits among the dock hands had wholly recovered from the probable consumption of the evidence. But I succeeded in gathering material for a splendid typewritten report of all I had not been able to unearth to file away among the priceless headquarters archives. Not that the ZP has not its big jobs. The force to a man distinctly remembers that absorbing two months between the escape of wild black Felix Paul and the day they dragged him back into the penitentiary. No less fresh in memory are the expeditions against Maurice Pelote or Francois Barduc, the murderers of Miraflores. All Martinique Negroes, be it noted, and of all things on this earth, including greased pigs, the hardest thing to catch is a Martinique criminal. After all, four or five murders on the zone in three years is no startling record in such a swarm of nationalities. Cases large and small, which it would be neither of interest nor politic to detail, poured in during the following weeks. Among them was a counterfeit case unearthed by Shylock Holmes of the Panamanian force that called for a long perspiring hunt for the plant in odd corners of the zone. Then there was 
and XZP, who lost his three-year savings on the train, for which reason I shattered a well-known American, for it is a ZP rule that no one is above suspicion, above Panama, afoot in carriages nearly all night, in true dime novel fashion. There was the day I was given a dangerous convict to deliver at Culebra Penitentiary. The criminal was about three feet long, jet black, his worldly possessions comprising two more or less garments, one reaching as far down as his knees and the other as far up as the base of his neck. He had long been a familiar sight to his owners among the swarms of boot blacks that infest a corner of the PRR station. He claimed to be eleven and looked it. But having already served time for burglary and horse stealing, his conviction for stealing a gold necklace from a Negro washerwoman of San Miguel left the Chief Justice no choice but to send him to mediate a half a year at Culebra. There's no reform school on the zone. The few American miners who have been found guilty of misdoing have been banished to their native land. When the deputy warden had sufficiently recovered from the shock brought upon him by the sight of his new charge to give me a receipt for him, I raced for the noon train back to the city. Thereon, I sat down beside Paul, first-class policeman X, surprised to find him off duty and in civilian clothes. There was a dreamy, faraway look in his eyes, and not until the train was racing past Rio Grande Reservoir did he turn to confide to me the following extraordinary occurrence. Last night, a dreamed old judge had my father and my mother up before him. On the stand, he asked my mother her age. And the funny part of it is that my mother has been dead for over ten years. She turned around and wrote on the wall with a piece of chalk, 1859, the year she was born. And then my father was called and he wrote, 1853. That's all there was to the dream. But take it from me, I know what it means. Just add them together. Multiply them by five because I could see five people in the courtroom, divide by two, father and mother, and I get, he drew out a crumpled arrest form covered with penciled figures, 9280, and there, his voice dropped low, is your winning number for next Sunday. So certain of this, that first class X had bribed another policeman to take his eight hour shift, dressed in his vacation vest, bought a ticket to Panama and return with real money at tourist prices and would spend the blazing afternoon seeking among the scores of vendors in the city for lottery ticket 9280. And if he did not find it there, he certainly paid his fare all the way to Colon and back to continue his search. I believe he at length found and acquired the whole ticket for the customary sum of $2.50, but there must have been a slip in the arithmetic or mother's chalk for the winning number that Sunday was 8895. Frequent as are these melancholy errors, scores of zoners cling faithfully to their arithmetical superstitions. Many a man spends his recreation hours working out the winning numbers by some secret recipe of his own. There are men on the ZP who, if you can get them started on the subject of lottery tickets, will keep it up until you run away, showing you the infallibility of their own various systems, believing the drawing to be honest yet oblivious to the fact that both the one and the other cannot be true. Dreams are held in special favor. It is probably safe to assert that one half the numbers are over 1,000 and under 10,000 that appear in zone dreams are snapped up next day in lottery tickets. Many have systems of figuring out the all-important number from the figures on engines and cars. More than one zone housewife has slipped into the kitchen to find the roast burning and her West Indian cook hiding hastily behind her ample skirt a long fist of the figures on every freight car that has passed that morning from which, by some Antillian miscalculation and the murmuring of certain invocations, she was to find the magic number that would bring her cooking days to an end. Yet, there is sometimes method in their madness. Did not Joe, who slept in the next room to me at Gatoon, hit Duke for two pieces? Which is to say, he had $3,000 to sprinkle along with his police salary. Yet, personally, the only really appealing system was that of Cristobal. Upon his arrival in the Isthmus four years ago, he picked out a number at random, took out a yearly subscription to it, and thought no more about it than one does of a newspaper delivered at the door each morning. Until one morning, during this month of May, after he had squandered something over $500 on worthless bits of paper, he strolled into the lottery office and was handed an inconspicuous little bag containing $7,500 in yellow gold. Like all ZP rookies, recruits, I had been warned early to beware the sympathy dodge, but experience is the only real teacher. One afternoon, I bestraddled a crazy, still-legged Jamaican horse to go out into the bush beyond the Panama line to fetch and deliver a citizen of that sovereign republic who was wanted on the zone for horse stealing. 
at the town of Sabanas, where those Panamanians who have bagged the most loot since American occupation have their summer homes, giddy, brick-painted monstrosities among the great trees, deep green foliage, and brilliant flower beds, Pause a moment and think of brilliant red houses in the tropics. It will make you better acquainted with the spig. I dropped in at the police station for ice water and information. I found it in charge of a Negro policeman who knew nothing and had forgotten that. When, therefore, it also chanced that an officer of the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals stopped before the gate with a coachman of Panama, it fell upon me to assume command. The horse was the usual emaciated rat of an animal indigenous to Panama City. When overhauled, the driver was beating the animal uphill on his way to Old Panama to bring back a party of tourists visiting the ruins. How he expected the decrepit beast to carry four more persons was a mystery. When the harness was lifted, there was disclosed the expected half-dozen large raw sores. We tied the animal in the shade near hay and water and adjourned to the station. The coachman a weary, unshaven Spaniard whose red eyelids showed lack of sleep was weeping copiously. He claimed to be a medrileno, which was evident, that he had been a coachman in Spain and Panama all his life without ever before having been arrested, which was possible. He was merely one of the many drivers for a livery stable owner in Panama. Ordered to go for the tourist, he had called his employer's attention to the danger of crossing his own territory with a horse in that condition, but the owner had ordered him to cover up the sores with pads and harness and drive along. It was a very sad case. Here was a poor, honest coachman struggling to support a wife, and I don't recall how many children, but any number sounds quite reasonable in Panama, who was about to be punished for the fault of another. The paradox of honest and coachman did not strike me until later. He was certainly telling the truth. You come to recognize it readily in all ordinary cases after a few weeks in plain clothes. The real culprit was, of course, the employer. My righteous wrath demanded that he and not his poor serf be punished. I could not release the driver, but I would see that the truth was brought out in court next morning and a warrant sworn out against the owner. With showing tears and rib-shaking sobs, the coachman promised to tell the judge the whole story. I went through him and locking him up with assurances of my deepest sympathy and full assistance stilted on toward the little village of shacks scattered out of sight among the hills and valleys across the border. Coachman, witnesses, and arresting officer, to say nothing of horse, carriage, and sores, were on hand when court opened next morning. As I expected, the judge failed to ask the poor fellow a single question that would bring out the complicity of his employer, did not in fact discover there was an employer. I asked to be sworn and gave the true version of the case. The judge listened earnestly. When I had ended, he recalled the coachman. The latter expressed his astonishment that I should have made any such statements. He denied them in toto. His employer had nothing whatever to do with the case. The fault was entirely his and no one else in the remotest degree connected with the matter. Five dollars, snapped the judge. Coachman paid, hitched up the rat of a horse, and wobbled away into Panama. Police business. Taking me down into the grove that night, I found the driver, clean-shaven and better dressed, waiting for fares before the principal house of that section. What kind of a game, I began. Senor, he cried and tears again seemed on the point of falling. Every word I told you was true, but of course I couldn't testify against the patron. He discharged me and blackmailed me, and you know I have a wife and innumerable children to support. Come on over and have a drink. End of chapter 8, part 1. Recorded by Mickey Lee Rich. Chapter 8, Part 2 of Zone Policeman 88. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Zone Policeman 88, A Close Range Study of the Panama Canal and Its Workers by Harry A. Frank. Chapter 8, Part 2. This justice business, one soon learns, is of the same infallible stuff as the rest of life. After all, it is only the personal opinion of the judge between two persons swearing on oath to diametrically opposed statements. And for all the impressiveness of deep, furrowed brows, I did not find that the average judge had any more power of reading human nature than the average of the rest of us. I well remember the morning when a meek little Panamanian was testifying in his own behalf, 
in Spanish, of course, when the judge broke in without even asking for a translation of the testimony. That'll do. Because of your gestures, I believe you are trying to bunco this court. You are lying. Tell him that. This to the Negro interpreter, and he therewith sentenced the witness to jail. As if any Panamanian could talk earnestly of anything without waving his arms about him. The telephone bell rang one afternoon. It was always doing that, 24 hours a day, but this time it sounded especially sharp and insistent. In the adjoining room, over the blotter, snapped the brusque, stereotyped, nasally reply. I'm calm. Bingham talking. The instrument buzzed a moment, and the deskman looked up to say, Andy, and a nigger just fell over into Pedro Miguel Locks. They're sending in his body. The nigger lit his head and hurt his leg. His body? How uncanny it sounded. Andy, that bunch of muscles who had made such short work of the circus wrestler in Gatun, and whom I had seen not twenty-four hours before bubbling with life, was now a body. Things happen quickly on the zone, and he whom the fates have picked to go generally shows no hesitation in his exit. But at least a man who dies for the ICC has the affairs he left behind him attended to in a thorough manner. In ten minutes to half an hour, one of the ZP is on the ground taking note of every detail of the accident. A special train or engine rushes the body to the morgue in Ancon hospital grounds. A coroner's jury is soon meeting under the chairmanship of a policeman, Long reports of everything concerning the victim or the accident are soon flowing administration word. The police accident report is detailed and in triplicate. There is sure to be in the personal files at Culebra a history of the deceased and the names of his nearest relative or friend, both on the isthmus and in the states, for every employee must make out his biography at the time of his engagement. There are men whose regular duty it is to list and take care of his possessions down to the last lead pencil and to forward them to the legal heirs. A year's pay goes to his family, were as much required of every employer, and his the burden of proving the accident to the fault of the employee, how the safety appliances in factories would multiply. There is a man attached to Ancon Hospital, whose unenviable duty it is to write a letter of condolence to the relatives in the state. And so the kangaroos, or the red men, or whatever his lodge, was filed behind the ICC casket to the church in Ancon, and Andy was laid away under another of the simple white iron crosses that thickly populate many a zone hillside, and he was charged up to the big debit column of the costs of the canal. On the cross is his new number, for officially a zoner is always a number, that of the brass check he wears as a watch charm alive, that at the head of his grave when his canal digging is over. Late one unoccupied afternoon, I picked up the path behind the administration building, and skirting a zone residence, began to climb that famous oblong mound that dominates the Pacific end of the landscape from every direction, Ancon Hill. Four away, a fairly steep and stony path led through thick undergrowth. Then this ceased, and a far steeper trail zigzagged up the face of the bare mountain covered only with thin dead grass. The setting sun cast its shadow obliquely across the summit when I reached it, a long ridge with groves of trees running off abruptly toward the sea. On the opposite side, Uncle Sam was cutting away a whole side of the hill. But the five o'clock whistle had blown, and whole armies of little workmen swarmed across all the landscape far below, and silence soon settled down save for the dredges at Balboa that chug on through the night. But for myself, the hill was wholly unpeopled. A sturdy ocean breeze swept steadily across it. The sinking sun set the jungle afire in a spot that would have startled those who do not know that it rises in the Pacific at Panama, Crude, glaring colors glowed, fading to gentler and more delicate tints. Then the evening shadow that had climbed the hill with me spread like a great black veil over all the world. But the moon nearing its full followed almost on the heels of the setting sun, and, casting its half-day over a scene rich in nature and history, invited the eye to swing clear round the hazy circle. Below lay Panama, dully rumbling with night traffic. Silent and cone, still better lighted, cuddled up on the lower skirts of the hill itself. Then beyond, the curving bay, half seen, half guessed, with its long promontory dying away into the hazy, moonlit distance, lighted up here and there by bushfires in the jungled hills. Some way out winked the cluster of lights that marked Las Sabanas. In front, the placid Pacific, the South Sea of the Spaniards, spread dimly away into the void of night, its several islands seen only by the darker darkness that marked where they lay. 
On the other side of the hill, the rumble of cranes and night labor came up from Balboa Dock. There began the canal, which the eye could follow away into the dim, hilly inland distance, and come upon a great cluster of lights that was Corozal, then another group that was Miraflores, close followed by those of Pedro Miguel, and yet further, rising to such a height as to be almost indistinguishable from the lower stars, the lights of the negro cabins of Upper Paraiso twinkled dimly above a broad glow that was Paraiso itself. There the vista ended, for at Paraiso the canal turns to the left for its plunge through Culebra Hill, and all that follows, Empire, Cascadas, and Fargatun, was visible only in the imagination. If only the film of time might roll back, and there pass again before our eyes all that has come to pass within sight of Ancon Hilltop. Across the bay there, where now are only jungle-tangled ruins, Pizarro set out with his handful of vagabonds to conquer South America. There old buccaneer Morgan laid his bloody hand. Back in the hills, their men died by scores, trying to carry a ship across the isthmus. The Spanish viceroys passed with their rich trains. There, on some unknown knoll, Balboa reached four hundred years ago the climax of a career that began with stowing away in a cask and ended under the headsman's axe. No end of it, down to the forty-niners, going hopefully out and returning filled with gold or disease, or leaving their bones here in the jungle before they really were forty-niners. On down to the railroad days with men wading in swamps with survey kits, and frequently lying down to die. Then, if a bit of the future, too, could for a moment be unveiled, and one might watch the first ship glide majestically and silently into the canal, and away into the jungle like some amphibious monster. It was along in those days that we were looking for a murderous assaulter. At a Saturday night dance in a native shack back in Miraflores Bush, the usual riot had broken out about midnight, and a revolver had come into play. As a result, there was a Peruvian mulatto up in Ancon Hospital, who had been shot through the mouth, the bullet being somewhere in his neck. It became my frequent duty, among other ZPs, to take suspects up the hill for possible identification. One morning I strolled into the station and fell to laughing. The early train had brought in on suspicion a Spanish laborer of 21 or 22, a pretty girlish chap with huge blue eyes over which hung long black lashes, like those painted on Nuremberg dolls. No one with a shadow of faith in human nature left would believe him capable of any crime. Anyone at all acquainted with Spaniards must have known he could not shoot a hare, would in fact be afraid to fire off a gun. The fear in his big blue eyes struggled with his ingenuous girlish smile as I marched him through the long hall full of white beds and darker inmates. The Peruvian sat bolstered up in his cot, a stoical, revengeful glare on his reddish-brown, swollen face. He gazed a long minute at the boy's face, across which flitted the flush of fear and embarrassment, at the big doll's eyes, then shook a raised forefinger slowly back and forth before his nose, the negative of Spanish-speaking peoples. Then he groaned, spat in a tin can beside him, and called for paper and pencil. In the notebook I handed him, he wrote in atrociously spelled Spanish, that man came to the dance with this man, is the man that shot me with a bullet. The blue-eyed boy promised to point out his companion of that night. We took the 1055 and reached Pedro Miguel during the noon hour. Down in a boxcar camp between the railroad and the canal, the boy called for Jose, and there presented himself immediately a tall, studious, solemn-faced Spaniard of spare frame, about 40, dressed in overalls and working shirt. Here was even a less criminal type than the boy. Signor, I asked, did you go to the dance in Miraflores last Saturday night with this youth? Si, sí, senor. Then I place you under arrest. We will take the one o'clock train. He opened his mouth to protest, but closed it again without having uttered a sound. He opened it a second time, then sat suddenly down on the low edge of the box car porch. A more genuinely astonished man have I never seen. No actor could have approached it. Still, whatever my own conviction, it was my business to bring him before his accuser. After a time, he recovered sufficiently to ask permission to change his clothes and disappeared in one of the resident boxcars. The boy was already being fed in another. Had my prisoners been of almost any one of the other 71 nationalities, I should not have thought of letting them out of my sight. But the zone Spaniard's respect for law is proverbial. Jose! Pinched Jose! cried his American boss when I explained that he would find himself a man short that afternoon. 
You people are sure barking up the wrong tree this time. Why, Jose has been my engineer for over two years and the steadiest man on the zone. He writes for some Spanish paper and tells them the truth over there so straight that the rest of them down here, the anarchists and all that bunch, are aching to get him into trouble. But they'll never get anything on Jose. Have him tell you about it in Spanish if you sabe the lingo. But Jose was a gallego, whence instead of the voluble flood of protesting words one expects from a Spaniard on such an occasion, he wrapped himself in a stoical silence. Not until we were on our way to the railroad station did I get him to talk. Then he explained in quiet, unflowery, gestureless language. He had come to the canal zone chiefly to gather literary material. Not being a man of wealth, however, nor one satisfied with superficial observation, he had sought employment at his trade as a stationary engineer. Besides laying in a stock for more important writing he hoped to do in the future, he was the zone correspondent of El Liberal of Madrid and other Spanish cities. In the social life of his fellow countrymen on the isthmus he had taken no part, whatever. He was too busy. He did not drink. He could not dance. He was no sense in squandering time in such frivolities. But ever since his arrival he had been promising himself to attend one of these wild Saturday night debauches in the edge of the jungle that he might use a description of it in some later work. So he had coaxed his one personal friend, the boy, to go with him. It was virtually the one thing besides work he had ever done on the zone. They had stayed two hours and had left the moment the trouble began. Yet here he was, arrested. I bade him cheer up to consider the trip to Ancon merely an afternoon excursion on a government pass. He remained downcast. But think of the experience, I cried. Now you could tell exactly how it feels to be arrested. First-hand literary material. But he was not philosopher enough to look at it from that point of view. To his Spanish mind, arrest, even in innocence, was a disgrace for which no amount of material could compensate. It is a common failing. How many of us set out into the world for experience, yet growl with rage or sit downcast and silent all the way from Pedro Miguel to Panama, if one such experience gives us a rough half hour or robs us of ten minutes of sleep? At the hospital, the Peruvian gurgled and spat, beckoned for paper and wrote, This is the man. What man? The man who came with that man, he scribbled, nodding his heavy face toward the blue-eyed boy. But is this the man who shot you? I demanded. The man who came with that man is the one, he scrawled. Well then, this is the man that shot you? I cried. But he would not answer definitely to that, but sat a long time, glaring out of his swollen, vindictive countenance, propped up in his pillows at the tall, solemn correspondence. By and by, he motioned again for the paper. I think so. I am not sure. He miswrote. I did not think so, and as the sum total of his descriptions of his assailant during the past several days amounted to a tall man, rather short, with a face and two eyes, he's very insistent about the eyes, which is the reason the dull-eyed boy had fallen into the dragnet, I permitted myself to accept my own opinion as evidence. The Peruvian was, in all likelihood, in no condition to recognize a man from a loop guru by the time the fracas started. Much ardent water had flowed that night. I took the suspects down to Ancon Station and let them cool off in porch rocking chairs. Then I gave them passes back to Pedro Miguel for the evening train. The dull-eyed boy smiled girlishly upon me as he descended the steps, but the correspondent strode slowly away with the downcast, cheerless countenance of a man who has been hurt beyond recovery. There were strangely contrasted days in the gumshoe's calendar. Two examples taken almost at random will give the idea. On May 20th, I lolled all day in a porch rocker at Ancon Station, reading a novel. Along in the afternoon, Corporal Castillo drifted in. For a time, he stood leaning against the desk rail, his felt hat pushed far back on his head, his eyes fixed on some point in the interior of China. Then suddenly, he snatched up a sheet of ICC stationery, dropped down at a typewriter, and wrote at express speed a letter in Spanish. Next, he grasped a telephone and, in the words of the desk man, spit spig into the foam for several minutes. That over, he caught up an envelope, sealed the letter, and addressed it. An instant later, the station was in an uproar looking for a stamp. One was found, the corporal stuck it on the letter, fell suddenly motionless, and stared for a long time at vacancy. Then a new thought struck him. He jerked open the drawer of the gum shoe desk, flung the letter inside, where I found it accidentally one day, some weeks afterward, and dropping into the swivel chair, laid his feet on the gumshoe blotter, and a moment later seemed to have fallen asleep. By all of which signs, those of us knew him began to suspect that the corporal had something on his mind. 
Not a few considered him the best detective on the force. At least he was different enough from a printer's ink detective to be a real one. But naturally, the strain of heading a detective bureau for weeks was beginning to wear upon him. Damn it, said the corporal suddenly, opening his eyes. I can't be in six places at once. You'll have to handle these cases. And he drew from a pocket and handed me three typewritten sheets, then drifted away into the dusk. I looked them over and returned to the porch rocker and the last chapters of the novel. A meek touch on the leg awoke me at four next morning. I looked up to see dimly a black face under a khaki helmet bent over me whispering, It de time, sa, and fade noiselessly away. It was the frontier policeman carrying out his orders of the night before. For once there was not a carriage in sight. I stumbled sleepily down into Panama and for some distance along Avenida Central before I was able to hail an all-night hawk chasing a worn little wreck of a horse along the maticum. I spread my lanky form over the worn cushions, and we spavined along the graveled boundary line, past the Chinese cemetery where John can preserve and burn Joss to his ancestors to the end of time, out through East Balboa, just awakening to life, and reached Balboa docks as day was breaking. I was not long there, and the equine caricature ambled the three miles back to town in what seemed reasonable time considering. As we turned again into Avenida Central, my watch told me there was time and to spare to catch the morning passenger. I was not a little surprised, therefore, to hear just then the two sharp rings on the station gong. I dived headlong into the station and brought up against a locked gate, caught a glimpse of two or three ladies weeping and the tail of the passenger disappearing under the bridge. Americans have introduced the untropical idea of starting their trains on time to the disgust of the spig in general and the occasional discomfiture of Americans. I dashed wildly out through the station, across Panama's main street, down a rugged lane to the first steps descending to the track, and tumbled joyously onto a slowly moving train, to discover that it was the Balboa labor train, and that the Cologne passenger was already halfway to Diablo Hill. A Panama policeman of dusky hue leaning against a gatepost eyed me drowsily as I slowly climbed the steps, mopping my brow and staring at my watch. What time does that 6.35 train leave, I demanded. Yo, senor, he said with ministerial dignity, shifting slowly to the other shoulder. No tengo conocimiento de esas cosas. I have no knowledge of those things. He probably did not know there is a railroad from Panama to Cologne. It has only been in operation since 1855. Later, I found the fault lay with my brass watch. With a perspiration up for all day, I set out along the track, Hounding Diablo Hill, the realization that I was hungry came upon me, simultaneously with the thought that unless I got through the door of Corazol by 7.30, I was likely to remain so. Breakfast over, I caught the morning supply train to Miraflores, there to dash through the locks for a five-minute interview. I walked to Pedro Miguel and, descending from the embankment of the main line, nailed a dirt train returning empty and stood up for a breezy ride down through the cut. It was the same old smoky, toilsome place, a perceptible bit lower. As in the case of a small boy, only those can see its growth who have been away for a time. The train stopped with a jerk at the foot of Culebra. I walked a half a mile, caught a loaded dirt train to Cascadas. The matter there to be investigated required ten minutes. That over, I got in touch at the nearest telephone, and the corporal's voice called for my immediate presence at headquarters. Their chance to be passing through Cascadas at that moment a Panama-bound freight, the caboose of which caught me up on the fly, and forty minutes later I was racing up the long stairs. There I learned that, among other things, that a man I was anxious to have a word with was coming in on the noon train, but would be unavailable after arrival. I sprang into a cab and was soon rolling away again past the Chinese cemetery. At the commissary crossing in East Balboa, we were held up by an empty dirt train returning from the dump. I tossed a coin at the cabman and scrambled aboard. The train raced through Corozal, down the grade and around the curve at unslacking speed. I dropped off in front of Miraflores police station, keeping my feet, thanks to practicing good luck, and dashing up through the village, dragged myself breathlessly aboard the passenger train as its head and shoulders had already disappeared in the tunnel. The ticket collector pointed out my man to me in the first passenger coach, the ladies' car. He is a schoolteacher and tobacco smoke distresses him. And by the time we pulled into Panama, I had the desired information. Dinner was not to be thought of. I had barely time to dash through the second-class gate and back along the track to Balboa Labor Train. From the docks, a sand train carried me to Pedro Miguel. 
There was a craneman in Vasabispo cut whose testimony was wanted. I reached him by two short walks and a ride. His statement suggested the advisability of questioning his roommate, a towerman in Miraflores freight yard. Luck would have it that my chauffeur friend, blank, was just then passing with an ICC motor car and only a photographer for a New York weekly aboard. I found room to squeeze in. The car raced away through the cut, up the declivity, and dropped me at the foot of the tower. The roommate referred me to a locomotive engineer and, being a towerman, gave me the exact location of his engine. I found it at the foot of the Cucaracha slide with a train nearly loaded. By the time the engineer had added his wit of information, we were swinging around toward the Pacific dump. I dropped off and, climbing up the flank of Ancon Hill, descended through the hospital grounds. Where the royal palms are finest and there opens out the broadest view of Panama, Ancon, and the bay, I gave myself five minutes pause, after which a carriage bore me to a shop near Cathedral Plaza where second-hand goods are bought, and no questions asked. On the way back to Ancon Station, I visited two similar establishments. I had been lolling in the swivel chair a full ten minutes, perhaps, when the telephone rang. It was the captain calling for me. When I reached the third story back, he handed me extradition papers to the Secretary of Foreign Affairs in Panama. A half hour later, wholly outstripping the manana idea, I had signed a receipt for the Jap in question and transferred him from Panama to Ancon Gel. Whereupon, I descended to the evening passenger and rode to Pedro Miguel for five minutes' conversation and caught the labor train Panama word. At Corozal, I stepped off for a word with the officer on the platform and the labor train plunged on again, after the fashion of labor trains, spilling the last half of its disembarking passengers on the way. Ten minutes later, the headlight of the last passenger train swung around the curve and carried me away to Panama. That might have done for the day, but I had gathered momentum it was hard to check. Not long after returning from the police mess to the swivel chair, a slight omission in the day's program occurred to me. I called up Corozal Police Station. What? said a mashed potato voice at the other end of the wire. Who's talking? Policeman Green, sir. Station commander there? No, sir. Station commander, he gone just over to the YM to play billiards, sir. Day one big match on tonight. Of course I could have got him there, but on second thoughts, it would be better to see him in person and clear up at the same time a little matter in one of the labor camps, and not run the risk of causing the loss of billiard championships. Besides, Corazal is cooler to sleep in than Ancon. In a black starry night, I set out along the invisible railroad for the first station. An hour later, everything settled to my satisfaction. I had discovered a vacant bed in Corazal bachelor quarters and was pulling off my coat preparatory to the shower bath and a well-earned night's repose. Suddenly, I heard a peculiar noise in the adjoining room, much like that of a seal coming to the surface after being long underwater. My curiosity awakened. I sauntered a few feet along the veranda. Beside one of the cots stood a short, roly-poly little man, the lower third of whom showed rosy pink below his bell-shaped white nighty. As he turned his face toward the light to switch it off, I swallowed the roof of my mouth and clawed at the clapboarding for support. It was the sloth. He had been transferred. I slipped hastily into my coat and, turning up the collar, plunged out into the rain and the night and stumbled blindly away on weary legs toward Panama. End of chapter 8, part 2 Chapter 9, Part 1 of Zone Policeman 88. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Zone Policeman 88. A Close Range Study of the Panama Canal and Its Workers by Harry A. Frank Chapter 9, Part 1 There were four of us that Sunday. Bish and I always went for an afternoon swim unless police or mess duties forbade. Then there was Bridgely, who had also once displayed his swelt form in a zapi uniform to admiring tourists but was now a pursuer of soldiering hindus on naus island i wish i could describe bridgely for you but if you never knew him ten pages would give you no clearer idea and if you ever did 
the mere mention of the name Bridgely would be full and ample description. Still, if you must have some sort of a lay figure to hang your imaginings on, think of a man who always reminds you of a slender, delicate porcelain vase of great antiquity that you know a strong wind would smash to fragments yet when you accidentally swat it off the mantelpiece to the floor it bobs up without a crack then you grow bolder and more curious and jump on it with both feet in your hobnailed boots and to your astonishment it not only does not break but well bridgely was one of us that sunday afternoon and then there was the admiral well dressed as always who turned up at the last moment for which we were glad as any one would be to have the admiral along so we descended into panama by the train guard shortcut and across the bridge that humps its back over the p r r like a cat in unsocial mood and on through caledonia out along the beach sands past the old iron halls about which panamanian laborers are always tinkering under the impression that they are working this time we walked i don't recall now whether it was quarter cracks or the lieutenant hadn't slept well no it couldn't have been that for the lieutenant never let his personal mishaps trample on his good nature or whether bish had decided to reduce weight at any rate we were afoot and thereby hangs the tale or as much of a tale as there is to tell we tramped resolutely on along the hard curving beach past the disheveled bath houses before which ladies from the zone gather in some force of a sunday afternoon for this time we were really out for a swim rather than to display our figures on past the light brown bathers and the chocolate colored bathers and the jet black bathers who seemed to consider that color covering enough till we came to the big silent sawmill at the edge of the coconut grove that we had been invited long since to make a z p dressing room before us spread the reposing powerful sun shimmering pacific along the bay clear as an etching lay panama backed by ancon hill in regular cadence the ocean swept in with a hoarse resistless roll on the sands we dived in keeping an eye out for the sharks we knew never come so far in and probably won't bite if they did the sun blazed down white hot from the cloudless sky this time the lieutenant and sergeant jack had not been able to come but we arranged the races and jumps on the sand for all that and went into them with a will and a raindrop fell nor was it long lonesome before we had finished the hundred yard dash we were in the midst of it was undeniably raining half a moment later buckets full would have been a weak simile all the pent-up four months of an extra long razy season seemed to have been loosed without warning the blanket of water blotted out panama and ancon hill across the bay blotted out the distant american bathers then the light brown ones then the chocolate tinted then even the jet black ones close at hand we remained under water for a time to keep dry but the rain whipped our faces as with thousands of stinging lashes we crawled out and dashed blindly up the bank toward the sawmill the rain beating on our all but bare skins feeling as it might to stand naked in Melliflory's locks and let the sand pour down upon us from sixty feet above 
when at last we stumbled under cover and up the stairs to where our clothing hung it was as if a weight of many tons had been lifted from our shoulders the sawmill was without side walls consisted only of a sheet iron roof and floors on the former of which the storm pounded with a roar that made only the sign language feasible it was now as if we were surrounded on all sides by solid walls of water and forever shut off from the outer world if indeed that had survived sheets of water slashed in further and further across the floor we took to huddling behind beams and under saw benches the militant storm hunted us out and wetted us bit by bit the admiral and i tucked ourselves away on the forty-five degree eye beams up under the roaring roof the angry water gathered together in columns and swept in and up to soak us at the end of an hour the downpour had increased some hundred percent it was as if an express train going at full speed had gradually doubled its rapidity that was the day when the little harmless streams tore themselves apart into great gorges and left their pathetic little bridges alone and deserted out in the middle of the gulf that was the famous may twelfth nineteen twelve when Anne Conn recorded the greatest rainfall in her history, 7.23 inches, virtually all within three hours. Three of us were ready to surrender and swim home through it, but there was the admiral to consider. He was dressed clear to his scarf pin, and Panama tailors tear horrible holes in a police salary so we waded and dodged and squirmed into closer holes for another hour and grew steadily wetter then at length dusk began to fall and instead of slacking with the day the fury of the storm increased it was then that the admiral capitulated seeing fate plainly in league with his tailor and wigwagging the decision to us beside him he led the way down the stairs and dived into the world awash wet we had not taken the third step before we were streaming like fire hose there was nearly an hour of it splashing knee-deep through what had been when we came out little dry sandy hollows steering by guess for the eye could make out nothing fifty yards ahead even before the cheese thick darkness fell bowed like nonogarians under the burden of water staggering back and forth as the storm caught us crosswise or the earth gave way under us the admiral's patent leather shoes but why go into painful details those who were in panama on that memorable afternoon can picture it all for themselves and the others will never know the wall of water was as thick as ever when we fought our bowed and weary way up over the railroad bridge and summoning up the last strength splurge tottering into angelini's when our streaming had so far subsided that they recognized us for solvent human beings encouraging concoctions were set before us bridgely fearing the after effects acquired a further quart bottle of protection and when we had gathered force for the last dash we plunged out one more toward our several goals as the door of one 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 slammed behind me the downpour suddenly slackened as i paused before my room to drain it stopped raining i supped on bread beer and cheese from over the frontier we had arrived thirty seconds too late for ancon police mess then when i saved what was salvable 
from the wreckage and reclad in such wardrobe as had luckily remained at home i strolled over toward the police station to put in a serene and quiet evening but it has long since been established that troubles flocked together as i crunched up the gravel walk between the hedge rows wild riot broke on my ear ancon police station was in eruption from the lieutenant to the newest uniformless rookie every member of the force was swarming in and out of the building the zone and panama telephones were ringing in their two opposing dialects the deskman was shouting his own peculiar brand of spanish into one receiver and bawling english at the other all hands were diving into old clothes the most apathetic of the force were girding up their loins with the adventurous fire of the old moro hunting days in their eyes and all some a horse more afoot were dashing one by one out into the night and the jungle it was several minutes before i could catch the news at last it was shouted at me over a telephone murder a white greek who ever heard of a colored greek with a white shirt on had shot a man at pedro miguel at six thirty five every road and bypath of escape to panama was already blocked our men would meet the assassin whatever way he might take i went down to meet the evening train resolved after that to strike out into the night in the random hope of having my share in the chase it had begun to rain again but only moderately as if it realized it could never again equal the afternoon record then suddenly the excitement exploded it was only a near murder two colombians had been shot but would in all probability recover the news reached me as i stood at the second-class gate scanning the faces of the great multicolored river of passengers that poured out into the city for two hours one by one with crestfallen mien the man-hunters leaked back into ancon station and the case having dwindled to one of regular daily routine by eleven we were all abed in the morning the greek chase fell to me more detailed description of the culprit had come in during the night including the bit of information that he was a bad man from the isle of crete the belt straining number thirty eight oiled and loaded i set off on an assignment that was at least a relief after pursuing stolen necklaces for negro women or crowbars lost by the i c c by nine i was climbing to pedro miguel police station on its knoll with the young greek who had exchanged hats with the assassin after the crime that afternoon a volunteer joined me he was a friend of the wounded men a peruvian black as jade but without a suggestion of the negro in anything but his outward appearance he was of the size and build of a samson in his prime spoke a spanish so clear-cut it seemed to belie his african blood and had the restless vigor acquired in a youth of tramping over the andine ranges i plied him into a cab and we rolled away to east balboa to climb upon an empty dirt train and drop off as it raced through miraflores the sturdy legs of the peruvian saving him where his practice would not have up in the bush between pedro miguel and parisio we found a hut where the greek had stopped for water and gone on up a gully we set out to follow mounting partly on hands and knees 
partly dragging ourselves by grass and bushes up what had been and would soon be again a torrential mountain stream for hours we tore through the jungle up hills steeper than the path of righteousness following now a few faint footprints or trampled bushes now a hint from some native bush dweller the rain outside vied with the sweat within as to which would first soak us through to make things merrier i had not only to wear an arsenal but a coat atop to conceal it from the general public to mention the holes i crawled into and the clues i followed during the next few days would be more tiresome than a puritan prayer by day i was dashing back and forth through all ancon district by night prowling about the grimier sections of panama city almost daily i got near enough to sniff the prey now it was a greek confectioner on avenida central who admitted that the fugitive had called on him during the night now a panamanian pesquia whose stool pigeon had sent him out in the bush then the information that he had stopped to shave and otherwise alter his appearance in some shack halfway across the zone and afterwards struck off for panama by an unused route the clues were pendulum like they took me half a dozen times at least out of the winding highway to corozal on to miraflores and even further the rainy season and the rain of umbrellas had come it had been formally opened on that memorial sunday afternoon there was still sunshine at times but always a wet season heaviness to the atmosphere and the rains were already giving the rolling jungle hills a tinge of new green there was nothing to be gained by hurrying the fugitive was as likely to crawl forth from one place as another along the rambling road here i paused to kill a lizard or to watch the clumsy march of one of the huge purple and many-colored land crabs there to gaze away across a jungled valley soft and fuzzy in the humid air like some caro painting i even sailed for san francisco in the quest for of course each outgoing ship must be searched one day i had word that a windjammer was about to sail and racing out to balboa i was soon set on board the fore and aft schooner meteor far out in the bay when i plunged down into the cabin the peeled headed german captain was seated at a table before a heap of spig dollars paying off his black shore hands he solemnly asserted he had no greek aboard and still more solemnly swore that if he found one stowed away he would turn him over to the police in san francisco which was kind of him but would not have helped matters there are several men running gaily about san francisco streets who would be very welcome in certain quarters of the zone and sure of lodging and food for a long time to come end of chapter nine part one recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter nine part two of the zone policeman eighty eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c zone policeman eighty eight a close range study of the panama canal and its workers by harry a frank chapter nine 
Part Two. By this time, the tug Bolivar had us in tow. The captain went racing over his ship like any of his crew, tugging at the ropes, and we were gliding out across Panama Bay, past the little greening islands, the curving panorama of the city, and Ancon Hill growing smaller and smaller behind, bound for Frisco. What ho! The merry windjammer, with her stowed sails and smell of tar, awakened within me old memories, hungry and grimy for the most part. But this was no independent, self-respecting member of the wind-wafted sisterhood. Far out in the offing lay a steamer of the same line that was to tow the meteor to the Golden Gate. How is the breed of sailors fallen? The few laborers aboard would take an occasional wheel, pick oakum, and yarn their unadventurous yarns. As we drew near, a boat was lowered to set me aboard the steamer, to the rail-crowding surprise of her passengers, who fancied they had hours since seen the last of zone and zoners. The captain asserted he had nothing aboard grown nearer Greece than three Irishmen, any one of whom fetishiousness seemed to be one of the captain's characteristics. I might have and welcome. A few moments later, I was back aboard the tug waving farewell to steamer and windjammer as they pushed away into the twilight sea and the bolivar turned shoreward. I received a straight tip one evening that the fugitive Greek was hiding in a hovel on the Crucia's trail. What part of the Crucia's trail the informant did not hint, but he described the hut in some detail. So next morning, as the thick gray dawn of this tropical land was melting into day, I descended at Bass Opiso, through the canal to gamboa and struck off into the dense dripping jungle the rainy season had greened things up and gone temporarily of course for in a day or two it would be on us again in all tropical fury in the few days since the first rain the landscape had changed like a theater decoration a green not even to be imagined in the temperate zone. It turned out that the ancient village of Cruces was a mere two-mile stroll from the canal, a thatch-roofed native town of some thirty dwellings on the rocky shore of an inner curve of the Chagres, where travelers from Balboa to the last forty-niner disembarked from their thirty-six mile ride up the river and struck on along the ten-mile road through the jungle to panama the famous crucia's trail except for its associations the village was without interest except some personal greek interest sour looks were chiefly my portion for the villagers have never taken kindly to americans I soon sought out the trail, here a mere path undulating through rank, wet-hot, locust-singing jungle. Here in the tangled, somber mystery of the wilderness grew every tropical thing. Countless giant ferns, draping tangles of vines, the mango tree with its rounded dome of leaves like the mosque of Omar done in greenery, the humble pineapple with its unproportionate fruit everywhere the banana king of vegetables clothed in its own immense leaves the frondy zapote now and then in a hollow a clump of yellowish green bamboo though not numerous or nearly so large as in many other tropical land above all else the symmetrical gothic fronds of the palm nodding in a breeze the more humble vegetation could not know 
the constant music of insect life sounded in my ears everywhere were flowers of brilliant hue masses of bush blossoms not unlike the lilac in appearance but like all down on the isthmus odorless or rather with a pungent scent like strong catsup four months earlier i should have been chary of diving back into the panamanian bush alone above all on a criminal hunt but it needs only a little time on the zone to make one laugh at the absurd stories of danger from the bush native that are even yet appearing in many u s papers they are not over friendly to whites it is true but they were all of that familiar languid central american type blinking at me apathetically out of the shade of their huts crowding to one edge of the trail as i passed eyeing me silently a bit more osly somewhat frightened because their experience of americans is of a discourteous creature who shouts at them in a strange tongue and swears at them because they do not understand it the moment they heard their own customary greetings they changed to children delighted to do anything to oblige even to the extent of dragging their indolent forms erect to lead the way a quarter mile through the bush to some isolated shack far from contemplating any injury all these wayward children of the jungle ask is to be left alone to drift through life in their own way still more absurd is the notion of danger from wild beasts other than the tiny wild beast that burrows its painful way under the skin so i pushed on halting at many huts to make covert inquiries it was a joyous brilliant day overhead down in the dense rampant singing jungle i sweated profusely and enjoyed it choking for a drink in a hutless section i took one of the crooked tunnel-like trails to the left in the direction of the shags but it squirmed off through thick jungle through banana groves and untended pineapple gardens to come out at last at an astonished hut on a knoll from which was not to be seen a sign of the river i crawled through another struggling side trail further on and this time reached the stream but at a bank too sheer and bush matted to descend the third attempt brought me to where the river made a graceful bend at my feet and i descended an abrupt jungle bank to drink and stroll a bit along the stony shore then plunged in for a swim it was just the right temperature with dense jungle banks on either side like great green unscalable walls the water clear and a bit over waist deep in the middle of the stream now and then around the one or the other bend came a kaiua the native dugout made of the hollow trunk of a tree usually the cedro though to a jungle native any tree is a cedro if he does not happen to think of its right name twenty to thirty feet long sometimes piled high with vegetables sometimes with several natives seated indian file in the bottom the gunwales a bare two or three inches above the water they needed nice management especially in the rapids below cruches the locomotive power generally naked to the waist stood up in the craft and climbed his pole anchor or long pike pole hand over hand every naked brown muscle in play moving in perfect rhythm and apparent ease even upstream against the powerful current soon after chagras and trail parted company the former to wind up 
through the jungle hills to its birthplace in the land of darien and wild indians the latter to strike for the pacific over a mildly rough country it led down into tangled ravines up over dense forest hillocks where the jungle had been fought back by uncle sam and on the brows of which i halted to drink of the fresh breeze sweeping across from the atlantic at this time not a suggestion of anything greek though i managed by some simple strategy to cast a sweeping glance into every hovel along the way then came the real crucius trail the rest only follows the general direction i fell upon it unexpectedly it is still there as it was when the peruvian viceroys and their glittering trains clattered along it surprisingly well preserved a cobbled way some three feet wide of that rough and bumpy variety the spaniard even today fancies a real road broken in places but still well marked leading away southward through the wilderness overhead were tall spreading trees laden with blossomous orchids under some of them was broad grassy shade but the surrounding wall of vegetation cut off all breeze the way was intersected by many roads of leaf-cutting ants at level wide and well built in their proportion as the old roman highways with such an industrious throng going and coming upon them as one could find nowhere equalled unless it be on the grand trunk road of india then suddenly there appeared the hut that had been described to me i surrounded it and hand upon the butt of my number thirty eight closed in upon the place then rushed it with all forces there was not a sign of human life in the vicinity the door was tied shut with a single strand of old rope but there was no question that the fugitive might have been hiding inside for the reed walls had holes in them large enough to drive a sheep through and there was nothing within to hide behind i thrust an arm through an opening and dragged the large and heavy earthenware water jar to me for a drink and pushed on squatters cabins were now appearing as contrasted with the native bushman's peat hut sleeping places thrown together of tin cans boxes and jungle rubbish many negro shanties built of i c c scraps all of which announced the vicinity of the canal any hut might be a hiding place i made ostensibly casual inquiries interlarded between stories at several of them and at length established that the greek had been there not long before but was elsewhere now then about four of the afternoon i burst out suddenly in sight of a broad modern highway and leaving the ancient route as it headed away toward old panama i turned aside to the modern city then i was called off the greek chase and a couple of evenings later along with the evening train and the evening fog the inspector blew in from his forty-two days vacation in the states like a breath from far off broadway buffalo bill had been duly opened and started on his season's way the absent returned and corporal castillo suddenly dwindled again to a mere corporal as everything must have its flaws perhaps the chief one that might be charged against the z p is red tape strictly speaking it is no z p fault at all but a weakness of all government one example will suffice during the month of may i was assigned the investigation of a certain alleged conditions in panama's restricted district 
the then head of the plain clothes division gave me carte blanche but suggested that i need not spare my expense account in libating the various establishments until i got acquainted sufficiently with the inmates to pick up indirectly the information desired which general line i followed and the information having been gathered and the report made up i proceeded to make out my expenditures of forty five dollars for the month to forward to empire for reimbursement now it needs no deep detective experience to know that in such cases you naturally begin with well what you going to drink girls and end by paying the bill in a lump sum a large lump sum and go your way in peace what more then could i do than set down such items as may twelfth liquor investigation panama six fifty but here i began to feel the tangling strands was it not stated that all applications for reimbursement require an exact itemized account of each separate expenditure with the price of each it did but in the first place i did not know half the beverages consumed in the investigation by sight smell or name in the second place i came ostensibly as a rounder it would perhaps have been advisable at the close of each evening's entertainment to draw out notebook and pencil and starting the round of the table announce now girls i'm a detective no keep your places i ain't going to pinch nobody anyhow i'm only a zone detective but i just want to ask you a few questions now mammy what's that you're drinking ah gin ricky and just how much does that cost here and you flossy an absinthe frappy ah very good and what is the retail price of that particular drink and so on ad nauseum very true replied authority that would of course be impossible but to be reimbursed you must set down in detail every item of expenditure and its price reason and government red tape move in two parallel lines with the usual meeting place nor was that all while the black peruvian was on my staff i gave him money for food it was not merely expected it was definitely so ordered yet when i sat down may twenty seventh two peruvian for food fifty cents authority threw up its hands in horror did i not know that reimbursements were only for liquor and cigars cab or boat hire and meals away from home i did but i also knew that superiors had ordered me to feed the peruvian to be sure cried astounded authority but you set down such an expenditure as follows may twenty seventh two bottles of beer panama investigation fifty cents and as you are allowed cab fare only for yourself when you take the peruvian or any one else out to baboa in a cab you set down the item may twenty six cab and con to baboa and return investigation one dollar the upshot of all which was not feeling able with all my patronism to set up forty five dollars worth of mixed drinks for uncle sam i was forced to open another investigation and gather from all the z p authorities on the subject from naus island to parisio the name and price of every known beverage then when i had fitted together a picture puzzle of these that summed up to the amount i had actually spent i was called upon to sign a statement thereunder that 
this is a true and exact account of expenditures during the month of may so help me god but then as i have said before these things are not zp faults they are the faults of government since government began it had become evident soon after the inspector's return that unless crime began to pick up down at the pacific end of the zone i should find myself again banished to the foreign land of gatun for there had been a distinct rise in the criminal commodity at that end during the past weeks the premonition soon fell true take the ten fifty five to gatun said the inspector one morning without looking up from his filing case corporal macy will tell you about it when you get there end of chapter nine part two recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter number ten of zone policeman eighty eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c zone policeman eighty eight a close range study of the panama canal and its workers by harry a frank chapter ten why the fact is said corporal macy lighting his mercham pipe under the match burned down to his fingers several little burglary stunts have been pulling themselves off since the sergeant went on vacation but the most aggravating is this new one of twenty-two quarts of good canadian club being maliciously extracted from st martin's saloon last night from which important beginning i fell quickly back into the old life again derelicting about gatun and vincidity by day wandering the nights away in black noisy new gatun and along the winding back road under the cloud scudding sky yet it was a different life gatun had changed even her concrete lighthouse was winking all night now up among the i c c dwellings the breeze from off the caribbean was heavy and lifeless the landscape looked wet and lush and rampant of a deep seeded green and instead of the china blue skies the dull leaden gray heavens seemed to hang low and heavy overhead like a portending fate on the winding back road the jungle trees still stood out against the night sky at times too there was a moon but only a pale sliver one that peered weakly here and there through the scudding gray clouds the air grew more thick and sultry day by day the heat was sticky the weather dripping with the sun only as an irregular whitish blotch in the sky through the open windows the heavy damp night came miasmatically floating in the very cigarettes mildewed in my pockets earth and air seemed heavy and toil bowed by comparison with other days the jungle still hummed busily yet it seemed a bit mournfully as if preparing for production and unhilarious with the task before it like a woman first learning of her pregnancy life seemed to hang more heavily even on humanity zoners looked less gay and carefree than in the sunny dry season though still far more than in the north one could not shake off premonition of impending disaster in i know not what form like that of tefelnstruck 
before he entered the center of indifference. Dr. O of the sanitary department had gone up into the interior along the Trinidad River to hunt mosquitoes. Why he went so far away for them in this season was hard to understand. There he was, however, and the order had come to bring him back to civilization. The execution thereof fell, of course, to my friend B, who, to the world at large, is merely policeman number, to the force, admiral of the inland fleet, and in the general scheme of things is a luckier man than Vanderchild to have for his task in life the patrolling of Gatun Lake B invited me to go along. There was nothing particular doing in the criminal line around Gatun just then. Moreover, the doctor was known to be well armed, and there was no telling just how much resistance he might offer a single policeman. I accepted. I was at the appointed rendezvous promptly at seven, a pocket filled with commissary cigars strict truthfulness demands the admission that it was really eight however when b came wandering down the muddy steps behind the railroad station followed by a black prisoner with a ten-gallon can of gasoline on his head when that had been poured into the tank we were off across the ever-rising waters of Gatun Lake, for Gatun Police Launch is one of those peculiar motor boats that starts the same day you had planned to. It was such a day as could not have been bettered had it been made to order, with a week to think out the details. A dry season day even to the Atlantic breeze that goes with it, a sort of Indian summer of the rainy season, though the heavy battalions of grey clouds that hung all around the horizon as if awaiting the order to charge warned the zone to make merry while it might, for tomorrow it would surely rain in deluges. The lake much higher now than in my former Gatun days, was licking at the 27-foot level that morning. Under the brilliant blue sky it looked like some vast unruffled mirror, which is no figure of speech but plain fact. Through a forest in a motor boat, we might have dubbed the trip. We had soon crossed the unbroken expanse of the lake, and were moving through a submerged forest. Splendid raw palms stood up to their necks in the water. Corpulent, century-old giants of the jungle stood on tiptoe with their jagged noses just above the surface, gasping their last. Great mango trees laden with fruit were descending into the flood. The lake was so mirror-like we could see the heads of drowning palm trees and the blue sky with its wisps of snow-white feathery clouds as plainly below as above so mirror-like the protruding stump of a palm looked like a piece of just double that length and exactly equal ends floating upright like a water thermometer so reflective that the broken end of a branch showing above the surface appeared to be an acute angle of wood floating exactly at the angle in impossible equilibrium our prisoner and crew were from bahabaidos only you can pronounce it as he did nor make the a broad enough nor show the inside of your red throat clear back to the soft palate to contrast with the glistening black skin of your carefree, grinning face. Theoretically, he was being punished for assault and battery, but if this is punishment to be sentenced to cruise around on Gatun Lake, 
I wonder crime on the zone is so rare and unusual. This much I am sure. If I were in that particular Batty Gun's shoes, no, he had none, but his tracks. Say, the day my time ran out, I should pick a quarrel with a Jamaican and leave his countenance in such a condition that the judge could find no grounds for a reasonable doubt in the matter. We were mounting the river Trinidad. River, yes, but we followed it only because it had kept back the jungle and left a way free of tree tops. Not because there was not water enough anywhere, in any direction, to float a boat of many times our draught, turned so sharp we rocked in our own wake. Once we passed acres upon acres of big, cod-like fish floating dead upon the water among the branches and the forest rubbish. It seems the lake in rising spread over some poisonous mineral in the soil. But life there was none except the rampant green dying plant life in every direction to the horizon. There were not even birds other than now and then a stray snow-white slender one of the heron species that fled majestically away across the face of the nurtureless waters as we steamed. No, gasolined down upon it. Soon after leaving Gatun, we had passed a couple of jungle families on their way to market in their kayakas, laden with mounds of produce, plump mangoes with a maidenly blush on either cheek, fat yellow bananas, grass-green plantains, a duck or a chicken standing tied by one leg on top of it all, and gazing complacently around at the scene with the air of an experienced tourist. It was two hours later that we sighted the next human being. He was a solitary, old native, paddling about at the entrance to the grass bird region, in a huge dugout as time-scarred as himself. It was near here that weeks before I had turned with Admirable B up a little stream now forever gone to a knoll on which sat the thatched shelter of a negro who had taken to the bush and refused to move given when notified that he was living on U.S. public domain. When we had knocked from the trees a box of mangoes and turkey-red marinones, B touched a match to the thatch roof, and almost before we could regain the launch, the shack was pouring skyward in a column of smoke. Even the squatter's old table and chair and a barrel of tumbled odds and ends entirely outside the hut, it had no walls, caught fire, and when we lost sight of the knoll, only the blazing stumps of the four poles that had supported the roof remained. B had burned whole villages in this lake territory after the owners with legal claims had been paid condemnation damages. Long ago the natives had been warned to move and the banks of the lake to be specified, but many of these skeptical children of nature had taken this as a vain Yankee boast and either refused to move until burned out or had rebuilt their hovels on land that in a few months more would also be flooded the rescue expedition proceeded once we got caught in the topmost branches of a tree release from which we pushed on along the sinuous river that had no banks it was not hot even at noonday. We sweated a bit in pulling a thirty-foot boat out of a tree top, but cooled again directly we were off. My Kodiak was far away at the other end of the zone, but then, on second thought, it was better for once to enjoy nature 
as it was without trying to carry it away kodiaking is a species of covetousness anyway an attempt to bear away home with us and hoard for our own the best we come upon in our travels whereas here of course it was impossible the greatest of artists could not have carried away a tenth of that scene a scene so fascinating that though we had tossed into the bottom of the boat at the start a bundle of fresh new york papers and fresh new york papers are not often scorned down on the zone they still lay in the bottom of the boat when the trip ended at length little thatched cottages began to appear on knolls along the way and as we chugged our way around the treetops upon them the inhabitants slipped quickly into some clothes that were evidently kept for just such emergencies then we began nearing higher land so that the upper and then the lower branches of the forest stood out of water then only the ends of the lower limbs dipped in the rising flood downcast as if they knew the sentence of death was upon them also for though there was sunk already beneath the flood a forest greater than ten fountain blows the lake was steadily rising a full two inches a day where it touched that morning the twenty-seven foot level in a few months more says the colonel it will reach the eighty-seven foot level and spread over one hundred and sixty-four square miles of territory and when the colonel makes an assertion wise men hesitate to put their money on the other horse then will all this vast area with more green than in all the state of missouri disappear forever beneath the flood and man may dive down down into the forest and see what the world was like in noah's time and fancy the sunken cities of holland for many a famous route and villages older than the days of pizarro will be forever wiped out by the rising waters a scene to be held to-day nowhere else and in a few years not even here at last we were really in a river an overflowed river to be sure where it would have been hard to find a landing place or a bank among those tree trunks knee-deep in water we had long since crossed the zone line but our badges were still valid for it has pleased the republic of panama at a whispered word from teo sam to code to the z p command over all gatun lake and for three miles around it as far as ever it may spread then all at once we were startled by a hearty hail from among the trees and i looked up to see why of the smithsonian fully dressed standing waist deep in the water at the edge of the forest waving an insect trap in one hand what the devil are you doing there i gasped doing i'm taking a walk along the old gatun korea trail and i fancy i'll be about the last man to travel it come on up to camp on a mango-shaped knoll thirty miles from gatun that will also soon be lake bottom we found a native shack transformed into the headquarters of a scientific expedition we sat down to a frontier lunch which called for none of the excuses made for it by why when he appeared in his dripping full dress and joined us without even bothering to change his water spurting shoes in his boxes he had carefully stuck away side by side an untold number of members of the mosquito family queer vocation but then any vocation is good that gives an excuse to live out in this wild tropical world 
by one we had dr o aboard and were waving farewell to the camp the return of course was not the equal of the outward trip even nature cannot duplicate so perfect a thing but two raging showers gave us views of the drowning jungle under another aspect and between them we awakened vast rolling echoes across the silent flooded world by shooting at flocks of little birds with an army rifle that would have killed an elephant it is not hard to realize why the bush native does not love the american put yourself in his breech clout suppose a throng of unsympathetic foreigners suddenly appeared resolved to turn all the world you knew into a lake just because that absurd outside world wanted to float steamers you never knew the use of from somewhere you never heard of to somewhere you did not know suppose a representative of that unsympathetic government came snorting down upon you one day in a wild fearful invention they called a motor boat as you were lolling under the thatch roof your grandfather built and cried come on get out of there we're going to burn your house and turn this country into a lake flood the land which was your great-grandfather's the spot where you used to play leapfrog under the banana trees the jungle lane where your mother's courtship days were passed and the sega tree under which she was wedded if matters were ever carried to the ceremonious length what though this foreign nation gave you a bag of peculiar pieces of metal for your trouble when you had never seen a score of such coins in your life and barely knew the use of them being acquainted with life only as it is picked from a mango tree the foreigners had cried take this money and go buy a farm somewhere else and you looked around you and saw all the world you had ever really known the existence of sinking beneath the rising waters where would you go think you to buy that new farm even if you fled and found another unknown high land and dry or a town what could you do having not the remotest idea how to live in a town with only pieces of metal to get food out instead of the mango tree that had stood behind the house your grandfather built ever since you were born and dropped mangoes whenever you were hungry to say the least you would be some peeved it was mid-afternoon when the white bulk of gatun locks rose on the horizon then the lake opened out the great dam that is rather a connecting link between the two ranges of hills spread across all the landscape and at four i raced up the muddy steps behind the station to a telephone five minutes later i was hurrying away across locks and dam to the mainland beyond the spillway to inquire who and wherefore had attempted to burn up the icc launch attached to dredge number my canal zone days were drawing rapidly to a close i could have remained longer without regret but the world is wide and life is short soon came the day june seventeenth when i must go back across the isthmus to clear up the last threads of my existence as a zoner chiefly for old time's sake i dropped off at empire but it was not the same empire of the census almost all the old crowd was gone one by one they had kissed the zone good-bye the boss of those days had never returned smiling johnny had been transferred even ben had done quit and gone back to Barbados 
the zone is like a small section of life as in other places where generations are short one catches there a hint of what old age will be it was like wandering over the old campus when those who were freshmen in our day had hawked their gowns and mortar boards and gone their way i felt like a man in his dotage with only the new unknown and indifferent generation about him i went down to the old suspension bridge far down below was the same struggling energy the same gangs of upright human ants the cut with its jangle and jar of steam shovels and trains still stretching away endless in either direction here as in the world at large generations of us may come and pass away but the tearing of the shovels of the rocky earth the racing of dirt-laden trains for the pacific goes unbrokenly on as the world and its work will continue without pause when we are gone indeed soon the water will be turned in and nine-tenths of all this labor will be submerged and forever hidden from view the swift growth of the tropics will quickly heal the scars of the steam shovels and palm trees will wave the steamer on its way through what will seem almost a natural channel then blaze travelers lolling in their deck chairs will gaze about them and snort ha huh, is that all we got for nine years work and half a billion dollars they will have forgotten the scrubbing of panama and cologne forgotten the vast hospitals with great surgeons and graduate nurses the building of hundreds of houses and the furnishing of them down to the last center table they will not recall the rebuilding of the entire p r r nor scores of little items like forty three thousand dollars a year merely for oil and negroes to pump it on the pestilent mosquito the thousand and one little things so essential to the success of the enterprise yet that leave not a trace behind greater perhaps than the building of the canal is the accomplishment of the united states in showing the natives how life can be lived safely and healthily in tropical jungles yet the lesson will not be learned and on the heels of the last canal builder will return all the old slovenliness and disease and the native will sink back into just what he would have been had we never come i caught a dirt train to balboa there the very town at which i had landed on the zone five months before was being raised to give place to the permanent reinforced concrete city that is to be the canal headquarters balboa police station was only a pile of lumber with a band of negroes drilling away the very rock on which it had stood i took a last view of the pacific and her islands to far taboga where uncle sam sends his recuperating children to enjoy the sea baths hill climbs and unrivaled pine apples it was never my good fortune to get to taboga with thirty days sick leave a year and countless ailments of which i might have been cured free of charge and with the best of care i could not catch a thing i had not even the luck of my friend who by dint of cross-country runs in the jungle at noonday and similar industrious efforts worked up at last a temperature of ninety-nine degrees and got his week at taboga i stuck immovable at ninety eight point six degrees soon after five i had bidden and con farewell and set off on the last ride across the isthmus 
there was a memory tucked away in every corner corozal hotel was still rattling with dishes Parizzo peeped out from its lap of hills colibra with its penitentiary where burglarizing negroes go sunk away into the past railroad avenue in empire was still lined with my enumerated tags through an open door i caught a glimpse of a familiar short figure one foot resting lightly and familiarly on a misapplied gas pipe the elbow crooked as if something were held between the fingers at bass opiso i strained my eyes in vain to make out a familiar face in the familiar uniform there was a glimpse of old fritz water gauge as we rumbled across the shags and the train churned away into the heavy green uninhabited night only once more was i aroused as the lights of gatun flashed up then we rolled past the noisy glaring corner of new gatun and on to cologne in crystal ball police station i put badge and passes into a heavy envelope and dropped them into the train guard's box then turned in for my last night on the zone for the steamer already had her fires up that would bear me and him who was the studious corporal of mill of floors away in the morning to south america my police days were ended then a last hand to you all oh z p may you live long and continue to do your duty frankly and unafraid i found you men when i expected only policemen i reckon my days among you time well spent and i left you regretting that i could stay no longer with you and when i leave any place with regret i must be possessed of some exceeding subtle charm but though the world is large it is also small so i'll meet you later on in the place where you have gone where well say at san francisco in 1915 anyway hasta luego the end end of chapter 10 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc end of the zone policeman 88 a close range study of the panama canal and its workers by harry a frank